and welcome, I'm your code monkey. Welcome to the free beginner section of my C-Sharp Mastery course. By going through this course, you won't be able to make games, websites, apps, robotics, and literally anything. C-Sharp is an extremely versatile language. Starting from the absolute basics, like how code executes line by line and what is a variable, then covering the intermediate topics, like what are interfaces, generics, and events, and how you can use them to build some really awesome things. You will also learn the theory behind how to choose good naming rules, clean code guidelines, and learn about design patterns. And finally, the advanced section, which will be coming in a feature-free update, will cover lots of very advanced topics. Now, this free YouTube video, this one contains all of the video lectures from the beginner section. In the previous video, I spoke about my goals to make the video lectures free over here on YouTube. If the premium version course sells 100 copies, then one month after this video, I'll publish the intermediate section for free here on YouTube. And same thing for the advanced section one month after that. And yep, since the last video, there's already been 100 people who picked up the premium version. So one month from now, stay tuned for the intermediate section. Or if you're watching this in the future, then check the pinned comment down below. The premium version of the course has the video lectures just like this video, plus all of the intermediate lectures and the advanced section coming soon, as well as all of these really nice bonuses. So speaking of that, here are the bonuses for the premium version. I came up with some that I think are really awesome and definitely worth it if you can't afford them, while at the same time not putting any knowledge behind the paywall, so even people who can't afford it, they can still learn from the free video lectures. They really just need to do a little bit of extra work themselves. The premium version is really just selling convenience, making it really easy for you to truly gain the knowledge. The premium version comes with a companion project. This is a Unity project that contains a bunch of extra content. Basically, the video lectures, while being pre-mastered themselves, they're still really only half the course. The other half of it is inside of this project. It has a bunch of custom edited windows to guide you through each lecture. And each lecture has a section on frequently asked questions. These are common questions that have some really detailed answers that provide even more details on what is covered in the lecture. Then there are some quizzes. These are multiple choice questions. Again, all with very detailed answers. It's really not just correct or incorrect. If you pay close attention to each lecture, you should be able to get most of these right. But whether you do or don't, by reading the extra explanation that will help you truly learn that topic. Then the interactive exercises, I'm really happy with this feature. I think this will really help you learn. Learning by doing is always much better. And these exercises encourage you to put what you learned into practice instead of just blindly watching the video lectures. I designed a ton of handcraft exercises for all the lectures to help you put into practice and truly learn the contents of each lecture. There are all kinds of exercises. Some are about spotting and fixing errors. Others are about asking you to define some function or class or implement some kind of logic. There are some where you just write code and some where you write code and then play the code in Unity in order to complete the exercise. Then each exercise also contains a hint just in case you get stuck or a solution in case you get really stuck as well as a video walkthrough of me going through that exercise and completing it while explaining everything in detail. So if you're the kind of person who gets stuck in tutorial hell, then I truly believe that this will really help you escape it. In order to learn, you need to actually do things, and these exercises encourage you to do that. They encourage you to do it as opposed to just blindly watching the video lectures. Then the companion project also has a companion window. Basically, this window is also listening to a bunch of errors, and if it finds one, it will help guide you in the right direction. I manually wrote a ton of text for when it detects lots of errors, all of them based on common errors that I see people ask about in comments in my own videos. So this should help prevent you from getting stuck in your learning journey and allow you to get help instantly. Then the course also has an AI to help you answer questions. This one was trained on the contents of the course and my own knowledge, so it should be very accurate and helpful. But more than that, it's simply the fact that it is extremely fast. You post a question in the course comments and within a few minutes, the AI will respond with probably a very good answer. Although of course, I myself will also still be answering all the questions manually. The goal with this AI is really speed, so you get a response almost instantly. And then within the next few hours, I will manually answer myself. Then a simple bonus is how the premium version has the course split into lectures, as opposed to here on YouTube where it will be one giant video. It has to be that way due to how the YouTube algorithm works. This is a small thing, but it can be helpful, especially if you take your time to slowly go through the course just like you should do. Remember that the only goal is really that you are actually learning yourself. It does not matter how quickly you go through it. So separate lectures help with that so that you can pause and actually try out your knowledge before going further and you don't have to memorize specific timestamps. And over here on YouTube, the videos have the normal YouTube ads as usual, whereas the premium version has no ads, so there's nothing to interrupt you while you're learning. Another really nice bonus of the premium version is something that I'm going to try out for the first time, which is a live study group. Basically, once or twice per week, I will go live and post a link to the live stream so people can join. In there, I will watch the lectures alongside of you, then we're all going to read the frequently asked questions together, do all the quizzes, and go through all the exercises. Naturally, I won't be reading the chat, so I won't be able to answer any specific questions you have. I've really never done anything like this, so I'm really curious to hear what you all think. Some people like to learn more as part of a group, so hopefully this should be quite fun. The first live study group is happening next Saturday, March 9th. 
And if you can't attend live, then as always, they will be recorded so you can watch the recordings later. And the final bonus is really just by knowing that by buying the premium version, you will be helping hit the goal to make the free video version available for everyone. So you will be helping to make knowledge available to anyone who wants to learn. So these are the nice bonuses that I came up with that I think are really nice and really awesome while not taking away anything or putting any knowledge behind the paywall. If you can't afford it, then I highly recommend the premium version. These bonuses will help you truly learn and learn much, much faster than the 10 years that it took me. But if you can't afford them, that's okay. Like I said, there's no hidden knowledge hidden behind the paywall. You really just need to put more effort in yourself in order to actually apply the knowledge that you gain. And if you want, you can go ahead and pick up the premium version right now. There's a link in the description. I added a nice launch discount so you can get it before the first live study group next Saturday. So whether you get the premium version or watch the free lectures, I really hope you'll learn a lot. Also, just in case you're new to my channel, so a bit about me and my credentials or why you should listen to what I have to teach. For me, I've been programming for over 25 years and specifically using c -sharp for over 10 years. I'm a professional indie game developer with several successful games published on Steam covering a wide range of genres. My games are usually focused on complex systems since I am primarily a programmer. It's what I really love to do and what I love to teach. Also, a couple of years ago, I started over here this YouTube channel making free video tutorials to basically share my knowledge to help you learn how to make your own games. There's already over 800 free videos over here on this channel if you want to continue learning beyond this course. Also, let me make one very important note for beginners, which is simply take your time. Remember, this is your learning journey, no one else's. The only thing that matters is that you're learning. It does not matter how long it takes you, so it does not matter if someone learns all of this much faster than you. You are really not in competition with anyone but yourself. Also, you are not expected to go through this course in one day, one week, or even one month. Basically, all of the content inside of this course, this contains knowledge that took me 10 years to learn. So really, just take it slow, take your time, and really just focus on learning. And one final request, if you find this video helpful, if so, go ahead and hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. It's a tiny thing, but it really does help. All right, so let's get to the first lecture. Starting from the very beginning, first we're going to learn what is C Sharp and what are the many use cases for it. Then on the getting started lecture, we're going to install Visual Studio, which is where we're going to run our code. Then we're also going to install Unity and learn the Unity basics. This is an optional step, but it's important since the interactive exercise and quizzes, those exist in a Unity project. After that, we're going to load up that project to see how the interactive exercise work. And then is a really useful lecture covering some very common errors. You should refer back to this one whenever you encounter some issues. After that one, we can finally start writing some code, beginning with the absolute basics, learning how the code is written, how it executes, what is a code block, and how code is case sensitive. Then we're going to learn about variables. These are containers for data. The data needs to have a specific type, so then we're going to learn about the various built-in data types, things like int, bool, string, and so on. Next, we're going to learn about if statements. This is a core pillar of any programming. These are conditions which affect how your code will execute. After that, we'll learn a different way of handling conditions using a switch statement. Next, we'll learn about another core pillar, functions. This is how we can place logic in separate functions and call them when needed. After learning about functions, which involves different code blocks, then we are going to learn about variable scope, which is basically from where that variable can be accessed. Next, we'll learn about comments. The syntax for this one is actually really simple, but it does bring up a lot of interesting questions regarding writing good, clean code. Then we're going to learn how to store multiple pieces of data in one container using arrays and lists. Afterwards, we're going to learn all about loops. This is how we can run certain logic multiple times, like for example, looping through through all members of a list. Then another crucial pillar of object-oriented programming. We're going to learn the basics of classes, how to define one and construct it. Next, we will be ready to learn about static. What is the difference between making something static and non-static? Then learn about access modifiers. This is another one that is super simple in terms of syntax and extremely important in terms of learning to write good clean code. After that comes one of the most important lectures in this whole entire course. It's a lecture on naming rules and how you should be very careful and very deliberate about the names that you use in your code. And after that, is yet another extremely important lecture, this one covering the theory behind why you should write good clean code, as well as some nice simple guidelines that you should follow. With all that done, we will have learned the absolute basics, so we will be ready to inspect a nice beginner project that involves everything we learned in this section. All of that makes up the beginner section, and afterwards comes the intermediate section. We're going to take things up one level and learn some more complex stuff, beginning with something very important that I debated whether I should put in the beginner section, it's going to be Visual Studio Shortcuts. I end up putting it here because for beginners, technically it's more important to learn how to write the code, and it's not as important to be extremely efficient with how fast you use your IDE, but for intermediates, this is a must-have. So we're going to learn about a ton of shortcuts to help you write code and navigate your environment much better. Then comes one of the most important lectures in this whole intermediate section. It's all about refactoring. This is the process of rewriting your code to make sure it is as readable and understandable as possible. 
As an intermediate, you absolutely need to know that this is a natural part of the code writing process and something you should not skip. Next is a lecture on enums. Pretty simple and very useful. It's how you can define a specific list of values that you can use in many ways. After that, we'll learn about properties, which are kind of like a mix between variables and functions. Then we're going to learn about multidimensional arrays, meaning arrays that can hold multiple dimensions of data. After that, we're going to learn about nested loops, which is especially important in order to cycle through multidimensional arrays. Next, we're going to learn another method for doing some looping logic. We're going to learn about recursion. This is something that for people with a math background, it might actually be similar to understand than regular loops. Then we're going to learn about an extremely useful data type, the dictionary. This is a key value pair that has tons of really awesome use cases. After that, we're going to learn about some more collections like queue and stack. Then we're going to learn about the params keyword and what exactly does it do in a function. Next, we'll learn about optional parameters, how to define them and how to call them from a function. Then another crucial lecture for intermediates. This one is on learning the differences between value and reference types. This is extremely important. If you don't know this difference, then you will go crazy at some point in the future, wondering why something isn't changing. And it's usually going to be because you don't know you're working with a copy and not a reference. Related to that is the lecture on structs. These are similar to classes, but importantly, they are a value type. Next, we're going to learn some more intermediate use cases for classes. We're going to learn about inheritance, polymorphism, and a bunch more. Then learn about interfaces. This is one of my favorite features of C-sharp. It allows you to write some really nice modular code. Related to that, we're going to see various ways of testing for types and converting to and from various types. Also related is the lecture on switch pattern matching. This is a really simple way to do a switch, not just on value, but also on type. Then we're going to learn all about delegates, lambdas, and anonymous functions. This is how we can store a function itself inside a field. Next, we're going to learn the differences between lambdas and local functions. After that, we'll learn about events, which is how we can have one class be notified when something happens. Then the next lecture, that one is going to be all about generics. This is another super powerful C-sharp feature that makes your code work with multiple types. Next is a simple lecture on constants and read-only, what they are and what are the differences between those two. After that is a lecture on exceptions and how to handle them with a try-catch. Then a lecture on implementing I enumerable, so we can add support for something like a for each for some custom types. Next, we're going to learn about namespaces, what they are and how to make your own. Then a really important lecture on one of the most important design patterns, the singleton pattern. And after that is a general overview of a bunch more design patterns. And finally, after doing all of that, we're going to check out the intermediate project that uses all of this to make something really interesting. So that makes up the intermediate section. And then comes the advanced section. For this one, like I said in the beginning, I'm still actively working on it, so this will be coming later as a free update. Here are the topics that I'm planning to cover. Alright, so that's everything we're going to learn in this complete C-sharp course. Like I've said many times, you are not expected to go through all of this in just one day, or one week, or even one month. It took me 10 years to learn all of this, so always remember that and take your time and really just focus on actually learning. This is your learning journey, so that's really all that matters. Take it slow, really pay attention, do all the content in the companion project, and I guarantee that if you do that, then by the end, you will have gained a massive amount of knowledge. Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. In this lecture, we're going to learn what exactly is C-sharp and what it's used for. Okay, so C-sharp is a programming language. It was created by Microsoft in the year 2000. It is an object-oriented, general, multi-purpose language with tons of use cases. For me specifically, the main way that I use it is for game development with Unity, but you can also use it to make websites with ASP.NET or Blazor. You can use it to make native mobile apps with Xamarin. You can do tons of stuff in the cloud. It's especially easy to use with Azure, which is Microsoft's cloud service. You can develop on Internet of Things devices, or you can use it to make some simple desktop apps to help you in your daily life. You can make console programs or visual desktop applications. So it has tons of use cases. It is multi-platform, meaning you write C-sharp and you can run it on Windows, Mac, Linux, and other platforms. The language is constantly evolving. Despite being 24 years old, it is still actively being developed with new versions coming out on a regular basis. It is also one of the most popular and in-demand languages, so it's a great one to learn. Personally, I also believe that it's a great first language to learn. I especially like how it's type safe, meaning it has very specific types, and if you write some code incorrectly, you will get a compiler warning instead of having an error suddenly show up while the code is running. And if you're not a complete beginner, if you already know Java or C++, then chances are you will pick up pretty easily since it is relatively similar to those languages. So yeah, personally, I'm a huge fan of c -sharp. I've been using it pretty much every single day since I started game development with Unity over 10 years ago. I've made tons of games with it, and I've also used it to make some personal desktop apps, and I also use it when I explore the cloud. So it is a great, very valuable language to learn, 
And if you pay close attention to this course, then by the end, you will have gained a massively valuable skill. Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. In this lecture, we're going to go over how you can get help when you need to and how to get the most out of this course. Okay, so learning programming can be a little bit tricky at first, especially if you are a complete beginner. Right away, let me say that is perfectly normal. If you are a beginner and some things seem quite confusing, that is perfectly okay. That's all part of the regular learning process, so there's really no point in getting frustrated. Just take your time and really just focus on trying to learn. In order to help you learn, this course has a bunch of things. For every lecture, the Unity project contains a bunch of helpful, common, frequently asked questions. I highly encourage you to always read through those as you go through each lecture and whenever you have any question. Then I also highly encourage you to go answer all the quizzes for every lecture and do all of the interactive exercises. You will learn so much more if you're being active in your learning as opposed to just passively watching a video. So definitely make sure you do those. After watching every lecture, pause, go to the Unity project and do all of those. Also on that Unity project, if you write some code that has some error, the companion can provide some extra clarification on what exactly that error means. So if you're having some issues and you're writing code in the c -sharp console, try writing that same code inside Unity to see what the companion says. Then there is a really important lecture covering a bunch of common errors. If you have errors in your code, chances are the error has an explainer in this lecture. Also, when you have some issues, the first step is to actually identify what exactly is the issue. And for that, the best way to find it is to add tons of logs in your code at various places to see exactly what the code is doing line by line. There are many cases when beginners think the code is doing something, but in reality it's doing something completely different. Adding logs is a super easy way to help you visualize exactly what the code is doing. And of course, you can simply post questions in the comments of that lecture. One bonus of this course is the automatic bot response. You can ask something and within two to three minutes, the bot will reply. I trained the bot on the contents of the course and my own knowledge, so the answer should be pretty good. The main benefit of the bot is the near instant reply, so you don't have to wait for me to reply and you can continue learning quickly. But also, after the bot replies, within the next 24 hours, I will manually answer your question and confirm or provide some extra clarification on whatever the bot said. Then here's also a quick guide on how to ask a good question. For example, do not just say it's not working. Just saying this is really not helpful. Technically, not working can mean a million different things. For example, do you have a compile error? If so, what exactly does it say? Specifically, what line of code is throwing that error? Or if it's not some kind of compile error, how exactly is it not working? So did you expect one result but got another? Did the code seemingly not run? Are you getting some different results from what you see in the video? In order for me to be able to help you, I need as much information as possible. There's really not much I can do to help if the only message I have is it's not working. So when posting some question, be very, very specific about what exactly is the issue so I can do my best to help. All right, so that's the many ways you can get help throughout this course. Just keep in mind what I said in the beginning. If you are a beginner, it's perfectly normal that some things seem quite tricky to understand. That's all part of the regular learning process, so don't get stressed about it. All that matters is that you learn. It really does not matter if it's easy or hard, if it's fast or slow. As long as you're learning, then you're doing great. Remember that I've been programming for over 25 years, so if you manage to get through this entire course and fully learn everything in it in just a few months, then you're doing so much better than me. So really, just take your time, use all these tools at your disposal to really learn, and let's get started in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. In this lecture, we're going to install and set up Visual Studio, which is where we're going to be writing our code. Okay, so let's see where we're going to write our code. You can use whatever IDE you want. IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. Some common examples for C Sharp are Visual Studio Code, JetBrains Writer, or normal Visual Studio. You can follow this course using whatever IDE you want, but if you're a beginner, then it's probably best to use the exact same as me. Here, I will be using Visual Studio 22, the community version. This one is free. Also an important distinction, it is Visual Studio, not Visual Studio Code. It's a bit confusing how the names are very similar, but those are two completely different programs. Here, I will be using the regular Visual Studio, so let's download it. Go to visualstudio.microsoft.com, then click on Downloads and download the free community version. Then go ahead and open up the executable file. After installing, right away it opens up the Visual Studio installer. This is the main program that manages all of your installed versions of Visual Studio. And right away we can install Visual Studio Community alongside a bunch of modules. Like I mentioned in the previous lecture, C Sharp can be used for a lot of stuff. And in Visual Studio you can also develop on other languages. So here you can see tons and tons of modules. The ones that we're going to need in this course are the .NET Desktop Development. This will let us make console apps, which is the main template that we're going to use to learn C Sharp. So make sure to include that one. And then since the interactive exercises, since those are built in Unity, also make sure to include game development with Unity. Okay, so these are the two main ones that we need. So let's go ahead and install. This will download all of the modules and install them. 
Okay, it's done and launches Visual Studio right away. Now it's asking for a sign in. This can be useful to transfer your settings across devices. So if you want, go ahead and sign in or just click on skip for now. Then for the theme, again, you can choose whatever you want. Personally, I'm going to go with the light theme, which is what I like, but you can use whatever you prefer. And right away, let me answer the question that I inevitably get every time I say that I prefer the light theme when so many people seem to prefer dark theme. For me, my eyes simply get really messed up in dark mode. If I try focusing on white letters on a black background, I get a massive headache really quickly. So personally for me, I use light mode, but this is really just a visual change, so choose whatever you prefer. Okay, with that, let's start using Visual Studio. And yep, right away we can see the project list, although it's empty right now. We can open a project or create a brand new one, so let's do that. Then here we can choose the templates. Let's go ahead and make a simple console app, which is the most basic thing possible. So you can search for a console up here. And now, yep, it is this one right here. The one that has the C-sharp icon in the corner. It is not this one with VB, that's for Visual Basic. And also not this one for F-sharp, this is for F-sharp. And it is also not this one that says C-sharp, but also says .NET Framework. It's a bit confusing, but .NET and .NET Framework, those are two completely different things. Right now in here we want .NET and not .NET Framework. So yep, it's this template. Also, if you don't see it, then go back into the Visual Studio Installer, click on Modify and Install some modules, and then make sure .NET Development is checked. Okay, so this is the template that we want, the console application, so let's use this one. Okay, now let's give it a name. You can name it whatever we want. Here I'm going to go with the basic hello world, then go ahead, pick a location to spawn your project, and leave the solution the same name as default. Okay, so like this, let's go on next. Then over here we can choose the framework. So for this, let's go with .NET 8. And now there's a pretty important option here, which is whether or not to use top level statements. Basically, if you leave this unticked, so like this, then the project won't be created and look pretty much empty. Whereas if you tick this, then the project will be created and look like this with a namespace program and a main function. The option for this difference, this was added relatively recently. So if you watch older C Sharp tutorials, they might show this template. But for complete beginners, this completely empty option is actually easier to follow, so we're going to use this one. Later on, after we learn the absolute basics, we will make another project with the more complex template. But really, the main takeaway that I want you to learn from here is really just code is code, meaning that for everything we're going to learn in the absolute basics part using this simpler template, all of that can also be done in this more complex template. The difference is simply in how in the basic template you just write code here, but in the more complex template you need to write that same code inside the main function. If you write code in a different place you can get some strange errors, so that is why for beginners the simpler template is much easier. So over here to keep things simple let's first use that basic template, so make sure to leave this one unticked, so example like this, and let's create. Alright, yep, so here is our empty template. And by default it already has a standard hello world print. You don't need to understand this line of code just yet, I will only explain all of this in detail soon. Right now now we can just run this test. So on the top, right on the middle, you can see this nice little play button. Or alternatively, the default shortcut is F5. So go ahead and press either one of those. And up here is the window. Our program ran, it did indeed say hello world, and everything finished. All right, awesome. Okay, so we can already start writing some C -sharp code and run it. Now let's change some things in Visual Studio. There's a really nice extension that I really like, which adds a bit more colors to the code, which I find that it makes it much easier to read and write. So up here on top, let's go into extensions and then manage extensions. Then go ahead and find Viasphora. You can go to the online tab and search for it. Now I believe that this one is actually only available on Windows, so if you're on Mac you might not be able to find it. Maybe there is an alternative but I'm not sure. Either way this is just an optional extension just to add some visual, so technically you don't absolutely need it. But if you are on Windows then I highly encourage you to install it. Let's go ahead close Visual Studio to let it install. Okay great, so done. Let's open up the same project again. Alright, so now for some more settings. You can go into tools and options, and over here let's scroll down to find VS Photo, and here are the settings. Now for the most part I believe the ones that I have here are the defaults. You can pause the video and compare my settings with your own. I believe I really only changed some colors over here on the rainbow braces. Right away if we look at our default hello world code it should already have some colors that make it a bit easier to read. Again this is not a requirement, you don't need this extension, but I do find it quite useful. I find it helps to make the code more readable than having almost everything as grey. Next for some text formatting rules, let's go up here into tools and then go into options. Then over here let's scroll down and find the text editor. And again, pause the video if you want. I think over here, I think I have everything as defaults. Then let's expand upon this one and look specifically at the C Sharp options. And over here again, pretty much the same defaults. I think the only thing different is over here, I disabled the automatic brace completion just because personally I don't like it. And let's expand upon it, see a few more things. So the scroll bars, then over here the tabs, pretty normal. Then on advanced, again, I think all of this is pretty much defaults. On IntelliSense, right like this. And then inside the code style. On general, I think over here I didn't touch any of this, so I think 
think the only thing I touched was over here on formatting. And the main thing that I changed was over here on the new lines. Basically the default is to have all of the curly braces, all of them on new line. And over here I switched this ones in order to make them spawn on the same line, which personally I prefer. But again, this is very much personal preference. The code really doesn't care whether the braces are in the same line or new line. So you can use whatever format you prefer. Personally, I prefer it like this. I've been using this code style for 25 years now. So this is what I will be using in the course, but it's just a visual thing. So if you really prefer it on new line, then go ahead and place it on new line. Okay, so after all that, Visual Studio is set up and ready to go. Now let's continue on to the next lecture. Where we're going to install Unity and learn the absolute basics. Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. In this lecture, we're going to learn the basics of Unity. Now, like I said, this part is technically optional. If you're just looking to learn C Sharp, then technically you don't need to learn Unity. But since I won't be using Unity to build the interactive exercises and also using it to showcase some example code with some fun visuals to help you learn better, because of that, even if you don't specifically want to learn Unity, still make sure to watch this lecture just so you're not confused when any Unity code shows up. First, we need to get Unity Hub. Now, since we selected Unity Game Development when we installed Visual Studio, it already automatically installed Unity Hub. In your case, if you accidentally did not tick that box, you can just manually go to unity.com and download it, then open up Unity Hub. This is the program that manages all of the various Unity versions. In case you see something that looks like this, this is actually the older version of the hub. So like it says here, there's a button to update, so let's do that. And yep, here we are in the updated Unity Hub. It asks you to sign in, so go ahead and do that. If you don't have an account, you can create one, it's free. Unity itself has a free personal version, so you don't have to pay anything. Go ahead, create an account and log in, and right away it selects a version to install. Here you can install this version right away, but we're actually going to install a specific version that might or might not be the same as the pre-selected version, depending on when you're watching this. So over here, either way, you can either install or skip this. Then here we have Unity Hub open. On the left side, we have some buttons. We can manage our account, we can install various Unity versions, or check out the projects. So over here on the Projects tab, we can add a project. But before doing that, let's go ahead and download the Interactive Exercises project. Go onto the course website on this lecture, then scroll down and find the downloadable project files. Yep, it's this one. So go ahead and download that. It's a simple zip file. Just open it and extract it somewhere. And now back here in Unity Hub, let's go in the Projects tab. And then up here, let's add a project. Select the one we just downloaded and let's open. Okay, yep, so here it is. And over here, it says the version that this project was built with. If you don't have this version, you can click this button to download it. And yep, it will download the correct Unity version. Now, technically, I should say you can load the project with a later Unity version. Doesn't specifically have to be this one. But in order to avoid any confusion with menus being in different places, in order to avoid any of that, I highly encourage you to use the exact same version. So there it is, everything is installed, everything is ready. So now we can click to open up this project. And yep, here is the project open. Now let's just do a little bit more setup. For example, let's go up top over here and let's go into edit and then let's open up the preferences. Then over here on this window on the left side, let's scroll down into external tools. And over here for the external script editor, make sure you select your Visual Studio installation. Or if you prefer, you can obviously use a different ID. But if you're following everything along with this course, make sure you select Visual Studio, okay? Then for the extra options, you can leave everything like this. And here's a screenshot of my general options. I believe all of this is the default. So now we can close this window. And now if we have correctly set the external editor. If we go up here into assets and then click on open C Sharp project. Yep, this one should open your Visual Studio. Okay, great. So far, so good. Now, just one thing, you should already see the code kind of like this, meaning with a bunch of colors. So for example, if I place the mouse over here on top of mono behavior, it should correctly identify this as a class inside Unity Engine. This is a Unity specific class. If you don't see it, if you mouse over this and doesn't recognize this type, or if you see this as written in Kamali Gray, if so, then perhaps something went wrong during installation, so you might need to manually install the Visual Studio Tools for Unity. You can just Google Visual Studio Tools for Unity, you'll be able to find this page and you can download it. But if you followed everything, then everything should be working correctly. Okay, great. Okay, so here we have the default Unity layout. Now, first things first, let's just familiarize ourselves with the various Unity windows and create our custom layout. You can see there's a lot of tabs everywhere, like for example, the scene tab, the game tab, and so on. You can click and drag and move these tabs anywhere. You can make them into separate places or you can dock them into various kinds of places. So you can basically set up the editor in any way you want, but it will be easier to follow this course if you're following the same layout as me. So let's see the layout that I normally use. First is over here, the inspector on the right side. This way we always have a nice view of the selected object and whatever scripts it has. Then for the hierarchy, personally, I prefer that instead of here, I click and drag and I put it right here next to this one. I like having the hierarchy over here on this lower left corner. We're going to make sure our scene is always organized so we don't need the hierarchy to take up tons of space. 
then with the project files next to it and with the console tab on the next tab next over here in the center here we have the scene view and right next to it the game view this way we can easily view all of our objects the console project everything is nicely accessible so this is the basic layout that I normally use now for just a couple more options over here when the project files window is selected on these three dots on the top right corner on these personally I like to select the one column layout it showcases all the project files in a nice compact view then on the console next to it once again on the three dots over here we have some options for example over here on the log entry i like to set it to one this makes the console nice and compact which personally i prefer you can see a bunch more logs without taking up too much space then the timestamp are either enable or disable doesn't really matter one very important thing are these three buttons over here these are the type of messages that are going to appear on the console so the left one this one is for regular messages we're going to use this quite a lot the second one is for warnings and finally for errors basically if you want to toggle any of these then those types of messages will not show up over here on the console so if you ever come across an issue where nothing is showing up on the console make sure these three buttons are ticked then over here on the left side for the clear we have some options so on this little arrow i like to set it to clear on play which means the console will be cleared every time we start playing our game then for the collapse this one basically collapses messages that are exactly the same into just one entry personally i do not like this i think this is very confusing i want to be able to see every single message as it comes out even if it's identical to a previous one i've also seen this lead to a lot of confusion for a lot of beginners they think their code is just firing one message when in reality it's actually firing hundreds so to avoid any confusion leave collapse apps untoggle and then for the error pause this will automatically pause the game when some kind of error occurs so for this one you should definitely have this toggle if there is an error you want to know about it you want to know when it happens so you can actually fix it okay so that's it for the console and now on the game view up here and over here on the button that says free aspect let's select full hd 1920 by 1080 this is the standard 16 by 9 aspect ratio then on that same button you can also enable vsync this can be helpful because some of these demos are really simple so if you disable it they might run at like a thousand frames per second which is going to put a ton of unneeded stress on your graphics card so just leave it as vsync and then just one thing if you see your game view is looking a little bit too pixelated make sure on this here on this letter you are not fully zoomed in if i fully zoom in i can see this becomes a little bit pixelated it's basically just increasing the size of this window so on this one on the scale make sure it's pushed all the way to the left okay so that's the game view setup then for the scene view for this one pretty much on default should work just fine just one thing to know some demos are in 2d so for that up here on the top right corner there's a button to swap between 2d or 3d this just changes the scene camera and then one important thing is on the top left corner over here there's these two buttons this impacts where the handles are actually going to show up usually you want to keep them just like this meaning this one on pivot and this one on local if you ever see your handles on some weird places always come back to this you almost always want it to be on pivot and local okay so here we have our basic layout it will be easier to follow the course if you're using the exact same layout as me so ideally you should be using this but again all the windows are customizable so if there's something you absolutely prefer differently then go ahead you can drag your windows and place them anywhere once you have a layout you're happy with you can go on the top right corner and over here where it says default you can click on it and we can basically save the layout so you can go ahead save it to something and then if you ever find any issues you can reload a previous layout so here we're back into default and if i click it yep now back into this one Okay, so now that the layout is all set up, let's go through the basics of the Unity Editor. So first, just some basic controls over here with the scene view selected. This is where we can move around and view the entire game world. You can hold the right mouse button in order to look around. Then if you're holding the right mouse button, you can press W, A, S, and D in order to move around. If you press on shift, it increases the speed. While holding the mouse button, if you use the scroll wheel, you can either increase or decrease the speed. Alternatively, you can stop holding the right mouse button and just press the middle mouse button in order to pan around or hold Alt and left click in order to rotate around any kind of object. And if you have some kind of object over here on the hierarchy, if you get lost, like for example, you're moving way far away and you have no idea where the object is, you can just select it and then press the F key and it's automatically going to focus that object. Then here on the hierarchy window, this shows all the game objects that exist in this scene. A game object is really just a name for an object in Unity. So each one of these, each one is a separate game object. To create a game object, we can simply click on the plus icon and over here we got a bunch of presets like for example inside the 3d object let's create the 3d cube let's press f in order to zoom in onto it yep there you go there's the basic cube when an object is selected we can see the various gizmos the various handles that we can move our object so over here by clicking and dragging on these arrows we can move our object in any way then on the left side we see the various tools so the first one is just for panning around the second one is the move tool so we can use it to move our object third one is for rotating in any way then we've got the scale tool we can scale in any direction then the rec tool this one is mostly used for 2d and ui stuff but yeah pretty much also does some scaling and then the multi-tool which contains pretty much everything 
Another similar one for editing the bounce volume. Although this one only affects the collider and not the actual visual mesh, so you should probably not be using this one. Okay, so with the game object selected, over here on the inspector, we can see a bunch of stats for this game object. Unity is really based on components. So here we can see all of the various components attached to this game object. Each component does all kinds of things. For example, this cube game object. First of all, this one has a transform component. All game objects are going to have this component. This is basically what gives it a position, rotation, and scale. Then specifically for this game object, this one, as we can see, it has a cube visual. So that visual is composed of the cube mesh filter component. This is what holds the actual mesh that is being rendered. And the mesh render component, this is what actually renders that mesh. And finally, by default, this one also has a box and letter, which is used in physics. So in general, the main thing to remember is that Unity is made up of scenes. Then each scene is made up of game objects. And each game object is made up of components. Let's see an example from the interactive exercise. They're all split into different scenes. They're organized by folders. So for example, let's go inside the lecture teaching all about if conditions. And let's open up this one for the distance. The way we open a scene is just with a double click. And we can see this is a scene because it has a nice Unity logo. So let's go. In this case, I don't want to save the sample scene. And here is the scene. And like I said, most of the demos, these are actually in 2D. So we can click the 2D button in order to visualize it in 2D. In order to play the game, you simply click on the play button right up here on the middle. And you appear the game view now is playing on whatever logic is in this particular scene. This one is on the lecture talking about ifs. And if I click to move and showcase how doing a simple if in order to test the distance. So in this case, for example, let's inspect the player component. So select the player game object on the hierarchy. And over here on the inspector, we can see it as the player script. So we can double click in order to open it. And yep, it opens up Visual Studio and opens up to the player script. So here we can see a bunch of code. Again, don't worry too much about what exactly this is saying, what exactly this is doing. This course will teach you everything about C-sharp, so everything that we're seeing here we're going to learn about through the entirety of this course. Right now, the only thing that I want you to learn with regards to Unity and C-sharp is that Unity scripts have some default functions. They've got an awake function and an update function. Again, I will cover what exactly are functions in detail in a little bit. So just know that the awake or also the start function, those only run once, whereas the update is going to run on every frame. So if our Unity window is running on 60 frames per second, then this code will execute 60 times per second. Then for some Unity specific things, in order for a script to be attached as a component, it needs to extend this mono behavior class. In the Unity scripts, many times we are going to access the transform component. So this refers to the transform component attached to whatever game object this script is attached to. And finally, debug.log. This is just a way that we can write any messages to the console. So pretty much the same thing as the console write line that we're going to see in a little bit. Okay, so that's the absolute basics of Unity. Like I said, you can use C Sharp without Unity. I'm only using it to make the interactive exercises and to make the lectures a bit more visual, which should help you learn better. Also, by the way, after you watch this whole course, if you want to learn how to make games in Unity, then check out my entire course on making the game Kitchen Chaos. It's a beginner course starting from the absolute basis of Unity and game development, and it takes you step by step until we have a nice, complete, fun game. If you fully understand everything in this course, you won't be able to easily understand everything in that one. Okay, so in this lecture, we installed Unity and learned the basics. Now we are ready to learn how the interactive exercises work, which we're going to see in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. In this lecture, we're going to learn how the companion project works. Okay, so the companion project is something that I work really hard on to help you truly learn the contents in this course. If you do what I say, if you make an effort to go through everything, all the content inside of this companion project, if you do that, then by the end, you will have definitely mastered C Sharp. If you're following along, you already downloaded and installed the project. If not, go ahead and download it from the link under this lecture. So the companion project contains a ton of stuff. First of all, everything is over here on the project files, all separated by lectures. So all the demos that I showcase in the videos, you can come here and inspect them in order to see all the code that makes up those demos. But also the main way to interact with this project is through a bunch of custom editor windows. The main one is the main window, so it should be open already if you import the project. If not, you can go up here onto the CodeMonkey menu and let's open up the main window. And yep, it is this window. Now, the first thing this window actually has is an update checker that runs automatically. As I add more exercise or quiz or questions to the project, as I do that, I will update the project. So when that happens, you will see a nice pop-up where you can click, which will take you to this very lecture where you can always find the latest project version. Then over here, you've got some nice stats. So basically it tracks your completion. As you go through all the content in the course, it will keep track of all of it. The goal is for you to get to 100% completion by the end. Then we have a button that takes us to the lecture list. So over here, you can select what lecture you're on. Like for example, let's say we are inspecting the variables lecture. And now we can browse the three parts for each lecture. There are frequently asked questions, quizzes, and exercises. Each of these has a separate Unity window. By clicking on it, it should open that window. So for example, here's the one for frequently asked questions. This one shows some common questions, and if you click through it, you get a very detailed answer. So these provide even more clarification on the topic covered in the lecture. Next, we have the quizzes. So these are multiple choice questions. You get a question and various options. Again, these are related to the contents of that specific lecture. 
So if you fully understood everything, you should be able to get all of these questions correctly. But whether you get them right or wrong, either way, you get an answer with a nice explanation with some extra clarification. And then the exercise window. These are exercises that rather than just answering questions, you have to actually write code. For example, here's a basic one from the variables lecture. It asks you to define a certain speed variable. So here on the text, you need to edit some script, declare a variable of type int with the name speed and assign the value five to it. Right away, we can click on start exercise. This is basically going to load up all the files for that exercise. Now this one is pretty simple. We just need to follow the instructions. So in this case, we just need to define a speed variable. So we can open up the exercise.cs file. It should open up automatically. And over here, we see some more instructions in the comments. So now here, all we have to do is just complete whatever the exercise is. And if you get stuck in any exercise, all of them, they all have hints, which should help point you in the right direction. Then if you get really, really stuck, you can also just view the solution. So this will tell you exactly what you need to do in order to manually complete the exercise. Or alternatively, there's a button to apply a solution. This one is basically going to overwrite the exercise files with the correct solution. Then once you complete the exercise, you can see a nice completion message. And something very important is the button here for the video walkthrough. This one is exactly what it says. It's basically me going through the exercise, explaining how to complete it and what exactly the exercise is teaching. Then when you're done, you can click the button to complete the exercise. This will basically clean up all the exercise files so you can go back and go on to the next one. Also, some exercises have a unity scene like this one. So you need to complete the exercise, you need to write the code, and then you need to hit play over here inside of Unity in order to test your code and see if you have actually successfully completed the exercise. If so, then again, same thing, just stop playing, complete the exercise and go on to the next one. Also related to the exercise window is a separate companion window, which you should also open. It should be open by default in this corner. If not, again, go into CodeMonkey and open up the companion window. So if this is a really nice companion window that listens to a bunch of compiler errors and gives you some guidance, this one is separate from the exercises. So this is constantly reading for errors, whether there's an exercise active or not. So this can be helpful even if you're trying to write some regular code, if you're trying to test out how something in some lecture actually works. This provides a bunch of useful guidance for tons and tons of compiler errors. So you should keep this window open and visible at all times. I've said many times that the way that you truly learn is by writing code, not just by blindly watching the videos. You need to actually do something. You need to apply your knowledge in order to truly learn. So I'm really happy with this companion project that I built, especially these exercises. They really encourage you to write code related to the concept of each lecture. And in doing so, you will actually solidify the knowledge you gained. There are many exercises for every lecture. This is something that took a ton of work to make, so I really hope you make the effort to go through everything in this companion project to help you truly understand all the contents inside of this course. So as you're going through the course, first watch and listen to the entire video lecture. Make sure you're paying attention and really learning. Pause the video and rewind if you need to. Then after watching that lecture, go on to the companion to project. Then over here, load up the lecture list and go on to whatever lecture you're currently on. Then read all of the frequently asked questions and the detailed answers. Then go through all the quizzes and try to answer them all correctly. And then go through all the exercises and really put into practice what you learned in that lecture. You can see there's a bunch of content already for all the lectures up until this point. So take this time right now to pause the video and go through all of this to ensure you are fully understanding everything up until this point. By the end of this course, you should have all of your totals at 100% completion. If you do that, then you will truly have learned C-sharp, which will then allow you to build anything you can imagine. All right, so we're almost ready to start learning C-sharp. But before we do, let's go through a bunch of really common errors in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your CodeMonkey. In this lecture, we're going to learn about a bunch of common errors that you might encounter. So here's a list of the many common errors that we're going to cover in this lecture. This lecture is really mainly meant to act as a sort of reference. Whenever you have an error, come back to this one to get some guidance on what exactly it means and how you can fix it. I had this lecture right here on the beginning of the course before we get into writing any code, just so you are aware of these various errors. But if you are a complete beginner, then don't worry about fully understanding everything in this lecture right now. For most lectures, I highly encourage you to stick with it and rewatch the lecture if you don't fully understand the contents. But for this one, this one is special. This one is really intended as a reference. If you are a complete beginner, then watch this lecture just so you are aware of the various possible errors that you might encounter. But don't worry too much about understanding all the individual details in the code that we're going to see. Everything mentioned here, variables, classes, types, scope, and so on. These are all things that I will cover in detail in future lectures. So just remember that this lecture exists and refer back to it if you encounter any of these errors. Starting with the most common errors of all, some variation of these three. Usually these mean some kind of symbol is missing or it's in the wrong place. One of the most crucial things about any kind of programming is how code has to be written absolutely exact. 
If you miss just one symbol, then everything breaks. This is really something that a lot of complete beginners have a lot of trouble with. For example, here this code has an error. And thankfully, this one is actually a very helpful error. It is correctly telling us that a parenthesis is expected. Here we have an opening, but we have no close. You always need to match the same number of opening and closing parentheses. So the solution here is pretty simple. Just close it. Yep. Then here's another similar error. This one is saying there's an ending curly braces expected. And again, same thing, different numbers. So we've got one, two, three openings, but only one, two closings. So we're missing one here. And here is another really common error. This one is because we have a missing semicolon. The semicolon is what actually defines the end of an instruction. Without it, the compiler doesn't know that this instruction has ended. In C sharp, new lines don't really matter. So I can paste another line down here. And hope these are still errors. Having one line of code on each line does not matter. What matters is the semicolon. So always need to add it to this one and to this one. Then on these same mistakes, if you make something slightly different, so if instead of the ending one, you get rid of the first one. Now there's a whole ton of errors. In this case, they're not quite as helpful. So that is why you always got to keep in mind you have to write the code perfectly. And here we have tons of errors, so this is quite messy. The one that truly matters over here is this one. It's that the main function must declare a body. So the missing here is once again has to do with the currently braces. We've got three closing, but only two openings. So we're missing an opening on this one. And again, same thing if, for example, we forget to add this one. Then again, tons of errors. So again, this one is really tricky to figure out what is going on. The issue here is our missing opening parentheses. So these are really the most common syntax errors. If you see any of these, pay very, very close attention to how your code is written. Remember, it has to be written perfectly. So don't write some messy text. Write it properly with all of the required parentheses, all of the curly braces and semicolons. Next really important common error is simply this one. The type for namespace could not be found. So here I am trying to define a variable. But as we can see, we have this error in the code. This is yet another way as to how code must be written perfectly. It is not just the words that matter. Code is case sensitive. This is something that I see a lot of beginners having trouble with. They think, for example, this and this. They think these two are the exact same thing, but they are not. In terms of English, sure, they sound the same. They look similar. But in terms of the code, these are two completely separate things. The code really doesn't understand meaning, doesn't understand English. It really just understands syntax. So always, always remember how code is case sensitive. Changing something from uppercase to lowercase, just doing that one tiny change, all of that suddenly refers to something completely separate. Again, this is something that I see a lot of beginners struggle with, so this is something that I will repeat quite a lot throughout the beginner section of this course. If you have some error like this one, the type or namespace could not be found, the first thing you should do is always double check the capitalization, double check that you wrote actually perfect. So in this case, it is lowercase int, and yep, that works. Also, since we're here, one thing that is not an error, but rather a warning, sometimes you might see these green squiggle lines. These are warnings or suggestions for how you can improve your code. In this case, it just says the variable is assigned, but it's never used. Again, that's because this is just some testing code. In general, just know warnings are not errors. So for example, I can compile this code and it works perfectly. The warning is simply a message that tells you that you're probably doing something that you probably don't mean to. Now, here's a similar error. It says the name age does not exist in this context. And again, same thing, capitalization problem. H on lowercase and H with uppercase on the A. These are two completely different symbols. Same thing over here, which is saying type or namespace player cannot be found. And again, some beginners might see, but it is defined, it's right here. Except, no it isn't. Once again, same problem. Over here, player is on lowercase and that one is capitalized. So over here, it needs to be written exactly perfectly and yep, now it works. And up here, also perfectly and yep, now it works. So as a beginner, the first question you should always ask yourself is, did I write the code correctly? And specifically in terms of case sensitivity, is everything written perfectly exactly as it should be or not? That should be your very first question. Another common error is this one. It says use of unassigned local variable. This one is pretty self-explanatory. Basically, you need to initialize a variable in order to use it. So in this case, we really just need to give it some value. And yep, the error is gone. Related to variables and data types, a common error is some variation of this one. Cannot implicitly convert one type into another one. Like it says, this has to do with trying to convert one type into another for which there is no implicit conversion. This is a common problem over here, defining something as a float and then assigning that float onto something that stores an int. Ints can really only store whole numbers, so that is why this does not work. Floats can store decimal points, but ints cannot. If you absolutely need to do this, then one thing you can do is simply cast the value. So over here, put int. So you cast it like that and there's no error anymore. However, if you do it, then this will lose some data. For example, if over here for the number I store 5.6, if I do this and then I cast it, the value stored over here in age, this one is going to be just five. If you force the conversion, then basically anything after the decimal is going to be ignored. 
or the same error can be due to the data type that you're trying to store. The long data type, this one represents a 64-bit int, whereas the int, this one is only a 32-bit int, meaning that a long can store everything inside an int and more. You can define an int and then assign that int onto a long. This does work, there's no error on this line. However, there is an error on this line. That is because an int cannot hold all the values of a long, so you cannot implicitly convert a long onto an int. Again, if you really, really want to do it, you can simply cast it onto an int. Or alternatively, trying to do this. Again, same thing, cannot convert a string onto an int. If you want to basically parse a string, then you can do it like this. So access the convert class and convert it onto an int32. Related to data types is doing some math. So a common error is doing something like this. So basically you got one divided by 10 and you expect the result to be 0 0.1, but nope, the result is actually zero. That is because when doing math between two ints, the result is going to be an int. And in an int, we cannot store the number 0 0.1. So again, it ignores everything after the decimal point and returns just zero. The solution here is to cast one of the numbers included in the compilation onto a float, and if not, the result is correct. Always keep in mind what data type you're using and make sure you're assigning the right data for the right type. Then another common mistake is when doing some conditions. You might write an n like this, so one condition and another one, but this is not correct. With just one ampersand, this is actually a completely different operation. This is a bitwise and and not a logical and. So once again, it goes back to how you have to write the code perfectly. For a logical and, you need two ampersands, or for a logical or, it's also not just one pipe, it's actually two. Also for equating values, it is two equals. If you use just one equals, that actually is the assignment operator. So that is something completely different. If you want equality, you need two equals. Then after we learn about functions, a common error is going to be this one. The name H does not exist in the current context. Now in this case, the capitalization is correct. These are both written perfectly exactly. The problem here is that this one up here, this one is a local variable. And by being local, it means that this variable only exists over here inside the main function. And down here inside this other function, down here does not exist at all. This is a problem to do with variable scope. And later on, there is a detailed lecture on that specific topic. Also, after we learn about functions and parameters, one common error is this kind of error. This is not a compile error, it's just some behavior difference. Here, a beginner might think that if you define this, then you add this, and this one in turn is going to add two. You might think that over here is going to add two onto that number. But the answer is nope. When we run this line, this one still says 35. So the value inside the age variable, that one is still 35. This has to do with difference between working with something as a copy versus a reference. There's a dedicated lecture on the topic of value types versus reference types in the intermediate section. Int is a value type, which means that it is passed in as a copy. So when we call this function, what this one receives is a copy of the original data, meaning it's just a copy. It has absolutely no connection to the original variable. So when we modify this one, we're just modifying the copy and not the original value. That is why over here, when we call this, the original value still stays exactly the same. So always remember whether you're working with a copy or the original data. Then when we start using classes, this is a common error. It says an object reference is required for the non-static field method or property to be called. In the class lecture and in the static lecture, I talk a lot about the difference between the class definition and an instance of that class. And that is exactly the problem here. This function over here, this one is not marked as static, but we are trying to access it through the class name itself as if it were static. Like the error says, we need an object reference, meaning we need to create an object of this type in order to create an instance of that class. So we can define a player equals a new player. And now using this object, this instance of that class, now we can call it and yep, everything works. Or alternatively, we can keep the same thing we had previously and simply mark this one as static. So always be very, very careful. Are you intentionally trying to access something through the class itself or through some instance of that class? Another common error that we're going to run into once we start learning about classes is this one. It says something is inaccessible due to its protection level. This has to do with the access modifiers. There's also a dedicated lecture on this topic near the end of the beginner section. By default, if you omit the access modifier, then it's going to default to making it private. And private means that only this class over here, only this one can access this function. So if you want to access it from elsewhere, like for example, from this function up here, if so, then we need to mark this as public. And yep, now it does work. Then when writing some more intermediate code, you might encounter something that does something like this, like requires some encoding in order to save some bytes onto some text. But if you just try using the encoding type, if you do, then it says like this. Once again, the same thing, the type or namespace could not be found. Now, this one is not a capitalization problem. The class is indeed called encoding. However, this one exists inside the system.txt namespace. So before we can actually use it, we need to be using that namespace. So on top of all, we need to add using system.txt in this case. And yep, the errors go away and this now works. Alternatively, you can place the mouse over the error, then click on this little light bulb icon and this tells you a bunch of things, like for example, it needs using text, and if there you go, it does and it works. 
All right, so those are a bunch of common errors. Again, like I said, if you're a complete beginner and you didn't understand anything in this lecture, that's perfectly fine. All of these concepts, variables, functions, classes, and so on, all of this will be explained in detail in future lectures. Just keep in mind that this lecture exists. If you ever get stuck, chances are you're going to encounter one of these errors. If so, come back here for an explanation on what might be going wrong and how you might fix it. So remember this lecture and use it as a reference throughout the entire course. Now that we've covered this, we are ready to begin learning the absolute basis of programming, so let's learn that in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. In this lecture, we're going to learn the absolute basics of programming. So how the computer executes code, how code is case sensitive, matching parentheses, and a bunch more. Okay, so in the getting started lecture, we built this default console app project. Here we have a bunch of code. Again, I will explain all of this in detail in a little bit. This one over here is a comment, and here we've got something running a function in order to print some text onto the console. We can run this code, so again, we can go up here, or press F5, and yep, it runs the console, and right away, it does say our message. Now, the first thing to learn is how the code actually runs, and that is how the code runs from top to bottom. Meaning, if we have four instructions, it is going to first run this line of code, then it's going to run this line of code, then this one, and finally this one. It is always going to execute one after the other, always from top to bottom. Now, later on, when we learn more about functions, we will see how the code execution jumps a little bit. But in the end, it's really all just sequentially running from one to the other, from top to bottom. So up here, if I copy this line and I run this function twice, and on the second time I say something else, again, code runs from top to bottom, so it is going to first execute this one and print this line onto the console, and then it's going to execute this one. And if that it is, exactly like that. Also, one very important thing is in C Sharp, the end of an instruction is denoted by a semicolon. If we do not have it, if I erase this, then the code basically assumes that the instruction is not over. Another thing is how new lines don't really matter to the compiler. So I can add a bunch of new lines and then the semicolon, and now this is perfectly valid code. All same thing when accessing a function. So over here, I can add a ton of new lines. Right after the dot, I can add a ton of new lines. Now you can't add it in the middle of something, like in the middle of this function name. If I split it, then it does cause an error. But otherwise, new lines generally do not matter. In terms of running the code, all that really matters is the semicolon. That is what actually defines the end of an instruction. A lot of beginners make the mistake of forgetting about that. They usually forget about the semicolon and they get a whole bunch of errors. Which, by the way, if you see a red squiggly line and you just put the mouse over it, it won't tell you the error. In this case, the error is simple and and our helper function actually helps us see what the error is. So in here, there's just an expect semicolon. If we add it, everything's fine. To find any strange issues, always make sure to remember that you need a semicolon in order to end an instruction. And also speaking of things that don't matter, so new lines generally don't matter. Another thing that does not matter is indentation. So right now I can indent this line just like this and it's going to run and I can have another one indented a bunch more. So I can have code written like this and if I run it, if everything still runs exactly the same, if you've done some Python programming, then in that language indentation does matter Matter, but over here in C Sharp it does not. This is perfectly valid code. Although, of course, bad indentation like this one can make the code hard to read. So even though technically it does not matter for the compiler, it definitely matters to you in order to make the code easy to read. So always make sure you indent your code properly. Another extremely, extremely important thing is how code is case sensitive. Meaning, for example, over here we've got an instruction, a console.write line. If I instead write right line with a lowercase l, nope, there is an error. There is no such thing called right line with a lowercase l. There only exists one with an uppercase l. So you need to always pay very, very close attention to how you write your code. This is one of the main things that I see a lot of beginners make their mistake. They write code like this and they don't know why it's not working. They assume that as long as the words are correct, so for example, if I write it like this, they assume since this is technically the same thing as over here, in terms of English, they both say the same thing. They assume that because of that, it should work, but in reality, no, this does not work. And the answer is always because they did not write the code exactly as it needs to be. It needs to be 100% exact, including capitalization. So it cannot be in lowercase c, it has to be in uppercase c, only that actually matches the console. And right line cannot be written like this, the w needs to be uppercase and the l also needs to be uppercase. So if you have issues in your code, the first thing you should check is see if you are writing the capitalization correctly. It is not just the words that matter, it's everything, it's the capitalization, it's the place where you put the dot, the place where you open and close parentheses, the semicolon, all of that, all of that matters. So always make sure you write your code very carefully because every single detail matters. And of course, you can always rely on code autocompletion to help you write. Usually after writing a dot, you see the autocompletion. And if you start writing right line over here, it shows you exactly as it should be. You can just press enter and everything will be written properly. Now, the next important thing is knowing where to write the code. Now over here in the new template, over here, it's easy. You can just write code and all of this will execute without problems. But now here on the previous standard template, on this one, note there's a bunch of curly braces. These curly braces 
traces form what is known as a code block. Code is grouped between blocks. For example, everything inside of this code block, everything here belongs to this namespace, then everything inside this code block belongs to this class, and everything inside this code block belongs to this function. Again, don't worry what is a namespace, class, or function right now. I will cover all of those in detail later on. For now, all I want you to learn is what is a code block, which is everything inside a curly braces, and that impacts what kind of code you can write within each code block. So for example, in this old template, in this one, here we need to write the code inside the main function. This is where the program actually starts executing. Like I said, the code executes from top to bottom, and as soon as we run this program, it is going to start right here. From inside the main function, it starts running from this first line. If we run just like this, if there you go, it still works as exactly the same thing. However, if I take this code and I remove it from the function, and let's say I paste it just over here, so just inside the class code block, if I do, then obviously I get a whole bunch of errors. This is because we are writing code inside a class block, and inside a class block, you cannot execute a normal instruction. You can only define fields, functions, and so on. Now, in this case, the error isn't very helpful, so really just remember where you are writing your code. If you're writing a regular instruction that you want to execute, then chances are you want to write it inside a function. In this case, chances are you want to write it inside the main function. So always keep this in mind. Like I said, it's very important how you actually write your code, but it's also extremely important where you write it. If you're writing code inside of this own template, then make sure to not write the code out here or directly inside namespace or directly inside the class. If you're writing some kind of regular instruction, make sure you write inside main. Although in the beginning portion of this course, we're really just going to be writing our code in the simpler newer template just to avoid any confusion. Over here, we have no curly braces, so there's no issues like that. We can just write all of our instructions over here sequentially and everything will execute once again, top to bottom. And finally, very important is to always make sure you have matching opening and closing symbols. That refers to, for example, code block, Every opening curly brace needs to have an ending one. And same thing over here for parentheses. Every time there's one beginning, there has to be a matching ending one. If I go ahead and I erase one of these, like for example, over here, opening namespace, we've got one. Then inside the class, we've got two. And inside the main, we've got three. And over here, we have three closing ones. But if I get rid of one of these, if there you go, now we have an error. And this one is a nice helpful error. So it tells us that one more is expected. So always double check that you have the exact same number of both opening and closing braces and parentheses. Over here, same thing. If I erase one of these parentheses. Yep, that's also an error because we did not finish the parentheses that are calling the function. So always make sure the same number of matching, opening, and closing. If you put the cursor inside of it, it should highlight the opening and the closing braces. So if I put the cursor here, it highlights both those. If I put it here, it highlights both those and so on. And in general, whenever you make some sort of error, like let's say you forgot to write that, you forgot to terminate the instruction, you see the red squiggling line. So always remember you can place your mouse over it and it gives you a bit more information. Sometimes here is super helpful like this one, but sometimes it might be a little bit more confusing. So also remember you can refer back to the common errors lecture to see some common issues. Or of course, remember you can always post questions in the comments and I'll do my best to help. Okay, so here we learn how code executes from top to bottom. We learn how it's extremely important that code is case sensitive and you should always double check that you wrote the code exactly as it should be. And we learned what is a code block and where we should write code, as well as the importance on making sure we always have a matching number of opening and closing symbols. Now with this basic knowledge, we are now ready to learn one of the basic building blocks of programming, which are variables. So let's learn that in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. In this lecture, we're going to learn all about variables, what they are and what we can do with them. Okay, so variables are one of the most important parts about programming in literally any language. They are basically containers for data. So we can define a variable, which is going to be our container, and then we can take some data and put it inside that container. Now, variables also have data types, which means different containers can hold different things. So if a variable is meant to store a whole number, I cannot place a text string inside of it. There are some containers that can only hold numbers, some containers can only hold text, others can hold true or false, and a bunch more. Those are the data types, which we're going to cover in detail in the next lecture. And then we can also have some code that uses a variable. And basically, when the code is executing that line of code, in there, when it reaches this point, it is going to access this variable and grab the value from that variable. So basically, it goes inside that container in order to grab the value that is stored. So on the same line of code, if we modify the value that is actually stored inside the variable, basically, we modify the behavior of our code. So by writing code that uses variables instead of values directly, by doing that, we have a lot more control over exactly what our code is doing. For example, the exact same code to move a player can make it move fast or make it move slow, depending on what value we store inside that variable. Okay, so that's the theory. Now let's see how to make variables in code. And the way we define a variable in C-sharp is first we write the data type. Now there are various data types depending on what type of data we want to store. Like I said, some store strings of text, others store whole numbers, others decimals, and so on. I'm going to cover a bunch of data types in detail in the next lecture. For example, over here, let's store the simplest data type, just whole numbers. And for that, we write int for the int data type. 
type. This is an integer, so basically whole numbers. And also again, like I mentioned in the last lecture, it is extremely important that you write the code exact. Always remember how it's case sensitive. So for defining the int data type, it is exactly like this. So int all lowercase. If I make this an uppercase i, then the code no longer knows what this refers to. If I put the whole thing in caps, then nope, this is not recognized as data type. So once again, always remember, always write the code properly and perfectly. So in this case, all lowercase int. So first we define the data type and then we write the name for the variable. The name can be pretty much anything you want. There are only a handful of limitations, like for example, it cannot start with a number. So this is not a valid name, but for the most part, picking a proper name, like for example, let's say age. Yep, there you go, just like this. Basically over here, we are defining a variable called age, which is of type int. And now after defining the age variable, we can do an equal sign. And basically we can assign a value to this variable. So let's say 35. With this, we are assigning the value 35 onto the age variable. So basically picking the value 35 and placing it inside the age container. Also, it's very important that the value matches the type expected by the variable. So over here, I cannot write, for example, 35.2. This does not work. This is an error because again, int can only store whole numbers. So I cannot store a decimal here. So over here, let's make sure to write a whole number, let's say 35. And also as you write code, you might see some symbols appear in kind of a faded gray, as well as having this green squiggly line underneath. These are not errors. These are pretty much as code suggestions. So in this case, it is saying that we are assigning this variable, but the value is never used. Again, that's because I'm writing the code slowly as I teach what it's doing. So basically just don't get concerned with these green squiggle lines. These won't go away as we actually use this variable. So just remember these are not errors, so don't worry about them. Okay, so yep, here we have defined the variable age and the variable is basically a container which is currently holding the value 35. If we want to inspect the value inside a variable, for example, one way we can do it is with the very helpful console.write line that we've seen up here. So let's write the exact same thing. And once again, always make sure to write the code exactly perfectly. So you can just do write line age and this is basically going to print the age onto the console. So if you go ahead and run this, and if there it is, it printed the value 35. So basically as the code goes to execute this line of code, when it reaches this point, it then looks inside this variable and pretty much just replace over here with what is the contents inside that variable. So yep, great, it's this simple. Here I have a demo in Unity with this player character. It is being moved using this move speed variable and basically it is currently moving at this speed. And now if I take and I modify the value inside this variable, there you go, now it moves much faster or much slower. So basically every time the movement function is running, it is always grabbing the value inside this move speed. So if we modify this, then it modifies the actual behavior. So back in our simple console here, here we have set the age to a value. Then we can also modify variables. So for example, let's print the current age so that it should print 35 then let's go inside the age and do something to it for example let's assign it to a brand new value and let's print the age exactly the same and let's see and if there you go now it prints both values both the original value and the updated value now instead of assigning to modify the entire value we can also do some math to it and we can also use the variable in whatever math we want to do so for example let's say age equals age plus one so this should increase by one so it should say 36 and if there you go 35 and 36 also another way of doing exactly this so incrementing by one is you just do plus plus plus. So both these lines of code are doing exactly the same thing. Both are incrementing age by one. And yet another method of doing this is plus equals and then one. So what we have here is exactly the same thing as we have up here. So basically it takes the age and equals age plus one. So over here age plus equals this does the exact same thing as up here. So all of these are really just different ways of writing the exact same operation. Although on this one on the plus plus we can only do this once. So this one only increments by one. Whereas these we can modify and put any value. And of course here we are doing addition but we can do the same thing with subtract so minus minus in order to decrement by one. So all these also work. And then on these two, we can also do multiplication or division. Yep, so over here we are taking the age and multiplying it by two. And over here we are taking the age and dividing it by two. However, this shorthand, this one only works for incrementing and decrementing. If we try doing slash slash, nope, this one becomes a comment. Doesn't actually make a division. So there's lots of math operations you can do with variables. And also up here, when you define a variable, you don't necessarily need to assign a value right away. So this over here is perfectly valid code. However, like the red squiggly line says over here, use of unassigned local variable, meaning we need to actually assign a value before we actually use it. So this is valid code, but before we use it, we need to assign it to something. So for example, like this, and yep, this does work. Also, another thing is how you can define multiple variables at once. So you define the type and then define the variable and then a comma and then any other variable you want. So for example, an int for age, int for health, int for power, something like that. So we have defined three variables and then we can just assign values to them. Yep, this works. Or alternatively, we can also also just define and assign multiple of them right here. Yep, this is also valid code. Then I should also point out that you can do math directly on the variables like this, or you can also do it directly inside a function call. So for example, over here, age plus two, let's just erase 
both of these. So that one should say first 25 and then 25 plus two. And if there you go, 25 and 27. But for example, let's say you want to print out the age and then the health. If you do age plus health, if you do this, the NIP that actually prints 125 instead of actually printing out both values, both as separate things. That's because both of these, these are both numeric values. So it basically ends up doing math with both these. If you want to print out both values, then you basically just need to convert these into a string. That way they won't do any mathematical operations. So the easiest way is up here, we just had a quotation marks. This basically marks the beginning of a string and then another one to mark the end of it again remember always to have matching ones so inside the string we can add anything like for example a comma and then we add a plus and like this basically an int value plus a string is going to convert the whole thing into a string then add another int which is also going to be a string so this should now print a string that will both print the age and the health and if there it is just like this okay so here we learn how variables are really basically just containers for some data and then you can do some operations to modify that data and speaking of data importantly is how each variable has a specific data type, so let's learn about those in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. So here let's do a walkthrough of everything in the variables lecture. So basically I'm going to manually do everything that you should do after every single lecture. So we just saw the variables lecture, so let's open up over here the main window. Let's go inside the lecture list. In this case we were following the variables lecture, so let's go inside of that one. And let's do them one by one, so let's begin with the frequently asked questions. These usually provide some extra clarifications on the topic on the lecture. So in this case, starting off with the basics, so what exactly is a variable? A variable is a container for data, so think of it as a box, and inside that box you can place some kind of value. Then you can write code that uses a variable instead of a value, and by doing so, when the code executes, it will go inside that variable, grab the current sort value, and continue running the logic using that value. This also means you can have different behavior depending on the value stored inside the variable. The simplest example is just a player object with some movement code. Instead of writing the movement speed directly, you can define a variable and by modifying the value stored inside that variable, you modify how fast or slow the player moves. So yep, variables are basically just containers to contain some value. Next, why are data types important? So each variable needs to have a certain data type and that data type defines what type of data we can store inside that variable. There are data types for storing numbers and if you define a variable of that type, then you cannot store a string of text inside that variable. You always need to use the correct data type for whatever that you're trying to store, and the next lecture covers data types in detail. So yep, every variable needs to have a certain data type, and based on what type you choose, that defines what type of data you can store within that variable. Next, what is a good name for a variable? This is a great question. So a good name is something that describes exactly what that variable represents. Ideally, just by reading the variable name, you should be able to understand what it represents and how it might be used. For example, a move speed variable, this is a good variable name. It clearly communicates that this is a variable that is used as some kind of movement speed. Whereas a bad name would be x. Just by reading it, you have no idea what it represents. Unless, of course, you're making some kind of math equation and x really is the correct name for that element. So you should avoid abbreviations and acronyms. Those might be perfectly clear to one person and very confusing to someone else. There is a very, very important lecture later on in the course all about naming rules and how to choose good names. Next question, what happens if I write int with capital I instead of int? And the answer is you get an error because there is no such type named int with a capital I. So always remember that code is case sensitive. The compiler does not know English. So as far as the compiler is concerned, int with uppercase and int lowercase, these are two completely separate types with no relation between them. Whenever you get an error, the first thing you should check is if you're writing the code absolutely perfectly, pay very close attention to capitalization. This is something that a lot of beginners mistake. And yep, this is something that I will continue repeating many times throughout this course. Code is case sensitive. I see many beginners make this mistake on the many comments that I receive, so I'm repeating it nonstop because I want to make sure that you don't make the same mistake. Next question, what is console.writeLine? So this is a function that writes to the c -sharp console. The console this is actually a class and writeLine is a function within that class. But like it says here, don't worry about functions in the classes right now, those are only explained in detail in future lectures. For now, just know that it prints something to the console, and the alternative in Unity is this, it is a simple debug.log. Basically, if you're working in a console app, use console.writeLine, and if you're writing some code inside a Unity script, for that, the related one is debug.log, and in doing so, it will print some kind of message down here on the console. Next question, what are the various ways to increment a variable? And yep, all of these lines of code are doing the exact same thing, incrementing a variable by one. So you can do age equals age plus one, that will increment by one. You can do age plus equals one, that will do the exact same thing, so grab age and increment by one. Or age plus plus, which again, same thing, increments age by one. All three of these lines of code, these all do the exact same thing. Like it says here, these are just shorthands. The last one is especially useful when working with loops, which we're going to learn in a future lecture. Next and final frequently asked question, what if I define a variable but don't give it a value? If you don't give it a value, then the variable is uninitialized and cannot be used until you give it a value. 
So if you do something like this, you get an error. So defining int age, and then trying to do a console.write line using age. If you do this, you get an error because it says that the variable age is uninitialized. Although later on in the course, we are going to cover classes and class variables. And if you don't define a value for those, it will default to a zero value. So the zero value, that means something like zero for an int field, means false for a bool field, or null for a string field. Again, classes are covered in detail in a future lecture. All right, so yep, those are all the frequently asked questions. As you can see, they contain a bit more detail, a bit more specifics on what was covered in the lecture. Going back in the main window, we can see we have completed all seven frequently asked questions. Now let's go through all the quizzes. Starting off with the first one right here, what is the primary purpose of a variable in C-sharp? So is it to name a function, to store data, to execute commands, or to create new data types? Hopefully, if you fully paid attention to the contents of the lecture, you should be able to answer all of these quizzes correctly. So in this case, the primary purpose of a variable in C-sharp, the primary purpose is to store data. And yep, that is indeed correct. Here is the answer with some more details. Variables are containers for data. You define the variable and then put inside whatever value you want based on the data type. Then you can write code that uses that variable in some way. And when that code executes, it goes inside the variable container, grabs the value that is stored inside it and uses that value to continue running the code. Next question, which of the following is a correct way to declare an integer variable? So is it integer age equals 35? Is it int age, int with uppercase i or all uppercase int? Again, yet another example of how important case sensitivity is. For example, if you were to incorrectly choose, let's say this one with capital I, nope, this one is not correct. The correct one is that, all lowercase. Answer, always be very careful with how code is case sensitive. Int and uppercase int might look similar, but they are two completely different things. The biggest mistake that beginners make is writing code carelessly and then have no idea why it isn't working. So always pay very, very close attention to capitalization, write the code exactly as it should be. Next quiz, how can you modify the value of a variable? Is it by assigning a new value to the variable? by using the modify keyword or by redeclaring the variable with a new value. So if you redeclare, you're going to get an error because you cannot declare two variables of the exact same name and there's no such thing as a modify keyword. So the correct answer is by assigning a new value. The answer here, you can define a variable and then assign a new value to replace the previous value. So define int age equals 35 and then replace it with 25. Well, like it says here, you don't redeclare it. If you do, you get an error since you cannot define two variables in the same scope with the exact same name. So over here, if you do this, yep, you get an error, age is already defined. However, you can also have multiple variables of the same name, as long as they are on completely different scopes. For example, you can have a local variable named age inside one function and a different local variable on a different function also named age. There is a detailed lecture on scope later on in the course. Next quiz, what does the statement age plus plus do? So does it reset the value of age to zero? Does it divide the value of age by itself? Does it increase the value of age by one or multiply the value of age by two? This one is the shorthand for increasing by one. So yep, it increased the value of age by one. Like it says here, the shorthand for increasing the value stored in the variable by one. This is a really super useful shorthand, especially when working with loops, which we're going to cover in a future lecture. These are the two main shorthands. So H plus plus and H minus minus. Although these two do not work. You cannot do age multiply multiply. This doesn't work or divide divide also doesn't work. So this shorthand only works for these two. But if you want to do this kind of math, so multiplication and division, if so, you can use these other shorthands. So plus equals two, minus equals two, times equals, divide equals. Next quiz question, what math operations can you do on a variable? So is it only addition? Is it addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division? Or is it only assignment of values? And yep, with variables, you can do pretty much all kinds of math. So the answer is this one. You can add, plus, subtract with minus, multiply, and you can divide. Although, of course, this assumes that the data type being used in the variable is a number type. Naturally, you cannot multiply a string or divide an object. Next multiple choice question, is it possible to declare multiple variables in one line? So yes, by separating them with a comma or no, each variable must be declared in a separate line. And yep, if you use a comma, you can indeed define multiple variables in one line. So yep, you can do this, it's a perfectly valid code. So int age, comma, int health, and so on, this works. Although at the same time, while this is valid code, personally, I tend to avoid doing this because I feel like it makes the code a bit more confusing. So while you can do this, personally, I would always define each variable in a separate line just to keep the code nice and readable. Next quiz question, how do you print the value of a variable to the console? Is it with console.write line then the variable name? Is it console.print or just write line? And this is something that you're going to do tons and tons of times. So even if you get it wrong right now, you will certainly get this right soon enough. The answer is this one, console.write line, a very common function. You use console.write line whenever you want to print anything onto the C-sharp console. And by the way, if you don't understand this syntax, then don't worry, this is a function and a set of class. All of that is explained in detail in future lectures. Or alternatively, when working with Unity, the similar function that prints to the Unity console, that one is called debug.log, and then you print whatever you want. Okay, so final quiz question. 
what does the statement age star equals two do? Does it divide value of age by two? Does it increment by two or multiplies by two? And yep, I'm pretty sure that the star is the universal symbol for multiplication. So yep, this one is the multiplication. The asterisk means multiplication. And this syntax is a shorthand for doing some math function on the left side. So these two lines of code are doing the exact same thing. So h star equals two or h equals h times two. Yep, both these are doing the exact same thing. All right, so that's the questions and we have eight out of eight done. Now let's go into the exercise and let's go through all of these one by one. This one is the really, really important part. After you go through every lecture, definitely make sure you do all of the exercise. So let's do them beginning with this one. Okay, so lecture variables exercise title define speed variable. The goal is to edit the script exercise.ts. We need to declare a variable of type int with the name speed and assign the value five to it. So pay close attention to where you write the code. So here's a quick hint right inside the main function. So let's open up exercise.ts. Okay, here is the file. And right away, there's just a quick explainer about what are these things in green. These are comments. These are just text. The compiler completely ignores this. So none of this is treated as code. Comments are going to be covered in detail in a future lecture. So the goal is to write some code after this line. But again, very important, like I mentioned in the lecture on programming basics, we need to write it inside the main function. So right here, the goal is to declare a variable of type int with the name speed and the value five. So like we learned in the lecture, first we write the type name. So in this case, we want an int. And again, always keep in mind code is case sensitive. So it's int all lowercase, it is not uppercase. If you do it like this, we got a red squiggle line. Int is not being recognized. So the type name is int. Then after the type, we write the name. So in this case, we want it to be named speed. And then in order to assign a value, we need to use the equal sign and then whatever value. So in this case, let's assign it to the value five. And yep, this is int. Now, since this is the first exercise, let me just show a few things. So for example, if we make a mistake here, so if we write int with uppercase, again, very important before you go back into Unity, you have to save. So either go up here into file and then save or just press control S. So as soon as you save, Unity should see the changes and it should start the compile. Or in this case, we have a compiler error, so it doesn't actually compile. And like I mentioned on the lecture on how the exercises work, always make sure you have the companion window open. That way, if you make some kind of mistake that leads to some kind of error, here you can see a little bit more text that might help clarify exactly what the issue is. So over here, the issue is pretty simple. It's because we wrote int incorrectly. So as always, remember how code is case sensitive. So over here, we need to make sure to type int. And again, if we also make another mistake here, like we name it sped instead of speed, right now the code is compelling because we have no syntax errors. Any of the exercise is still in progress because we didn't actually complete it perfectly. And again, down here on the companion window, we can see some nice helpful message. So did you accidentally write something different? Again, the goal with this exercise is to teach you how to write things absolutely perfectly. So now let's probably construct our exercise. So just like this. So define a variable of type int named speed with the value five. And if we save and just let the code compile. And if there it is, we have the exercise completed. Then we can also show the hint. Like the hint says here, remember the syntax for how variables are declared. So first the type and then the name and then optionally assign some value. Always remember how code is case sensitive. So define a variable named exactly speed, not uppercase speed or anything else. And if we were to get really stuck, we can just show the solution. And up here we see the goal is to define a variable of type int named speed with the value five. So the solution is exactly this. So int speed equals five. And if we want, we could click on apply solution. And if that overrides the file with the one with the solution, which is exactly what we wrote. So yep, just like this. So like it says here, congrats. In this exercise, you applied what you learned about how variables are defined, how they have a type, a name, and a value. So if that's it, now click the complete exercise button in order to finish the exercise. All right, here is the lecture on variables. Let's see the exercise titled fix error int. So like it says here, edit the script exercise.cs and fix all of the compile errors. And by the way, as soon as you start the exercise or click on this button to open the file, and if you do, and if you see Unity kind of breaking like this, if so, then go into your Visual Studio. And over here, you might see this window telling you that some file has been changed externally. That's because the whole setup for starting the exercises. So whenever you see this window, just go ahead, click on yes to all. And yep, it should reload everything. And yep, here is the exercise file. Again, the goal is to fix this error. And here's a quick tip. Place the mouse over the red line in order to see the actual error. So if we place the mouse over here directly on top of the int red squiggle line, if so, we can see this error, the type or namespace int could not be found. And like it says here, alternatively, we can check the Unity console or check the companion window. So here in Unity, if we look at the console, yep, we see exactly that error, type or namespace int could not be found. And over here on the companion window, over here, we can see a nice little hint on what exactly the issue might be. And if in this case, this teaches us exactly what is the solution, what is the problem that we have here. As always, remember how code is case sensitive. Then we can also show the hint. 
So in this case, the hint is pretty simple. So remember how code is case sensitive. And we can also see the show solution. So there's an error that says int uppercase i does not exist. And that is because code is consensitive and the proper name is int all lowercase. So the compile error here is pretty simple. Remember how you have to write code perfectly. So in this case, it is not int uppercase, but int all lowercase. So yep, that's really it. Let's go ahead and save. The code is compiling. And if there it is, exercise completed. Okay, so congrats. In this exercise, you'll learn how to solve the most common error that beginners encounter, which is issues with capitalization. Always remember how code is case sensitive. So int, all lowercase, and int with an uppercase i, those are two completely different things. One exists and one does not. Same thing for all the other types, so float versus float, bool, bool, true, true, and so on. So once again, another exercise to really make sure you fully understand code is case sensitive. The reason why I'm repeating this so often is really because this is the main error that beginners encounter. Okay, so we can now complete the exercise. All right, so lecture on variables. Here is the exercise change unit speed. So the goal with this one is to modify the speed variable to make the player reach the target in time. This exercise has a Unity scene. It should be unloaded automatically, so click on play in Unity to test your code. And just a quick tip, just in case the scene doesn't load automatically, it should do that, but in case it doesn't, just go into your project files, and if you scroll down, you go into whatever lecture you're currently on, so currently we're on the variables lecture. And over here, if we go inside the exercise folder, we should be able to see all the files for this exercise. So over here, we have the exercise scene, and yep, it is this one. So like it says here, the goal is to modify the speed variable. Now, before we check the code, let's try running this code and see what happens. So the player is moving, some kind of player character, it is moving, and nope, it did not reach the target in time. Okay, so we need to modify the speed in order to make sure it gets there on time. So here's the code. And again, you can ignore these lines that start with two forward slashes. These are comments, and the code ignores all of these lines. Comments are covered in detail in a future lecture. So here we have a line of code that is setting some kind of player speed variable. So all we need to modify is this value, and then we can press play in Unity to test our code. And again, something that is going to happen more and more as we see some more complex exercises is some of them have some testing code, so just make sure you don't modify these lines of code, otherwise the exercise breaks. So in this case, all we want to modify is this one, and if we get stuck, we can always show the hint. And like it says here, variables are containers for data. So when the code runs, it gets to the variable and it grabs whatever value is stored in that variable and uses that. So in this case, if we want the player to move faster, then we just need to modify the value that is stored inside the player speed variable. Or as always, you can click on show solution in order to see it. So in this case, the player speed variable just needs a value that is big enough in order to get to the target on time. So for example, float player speed equals six. So let's say, let's put it on 3F. So let's go ahead, save. And over here, back into Unity, let's make sure it compiles. And let's hit on play. And it is moving forward. And nope, it still did not reach it in time. So let's increase it by a little bit. So instead of three, let's go with six. Okay, let's run the code. And it is moving forward really fast. And yep, there you go, success. We didn't get there in time. All right, awesome. So in this exercise, you'll learn how variables are used in the actual code, meaning how their value actually affects how the code behaves. So over here, by just modifying the value that we stored inside a variable, we managed to see how that actually impacted the behavior for the code, which in turn allowed us to achieve our results. Okay, so let's go ahead, stop playing, and let's complete our exercise. All right, let's see the lecture on variables with the exercise titled Fix the Error Uninitialized. So like it says here, fix the error in the console, a variable is being used while unassigned. So here is our exercise file. And as usual, let's place the mouse over the red line in order to see the error. And our error here, thankfully, this one is pretty descriptive. So it says use of unassigned local variable age. This is teaching us that before we can use a variable, we need to actually assign some kind of value to it. So this exercise is pretty simple. And the way that we assign a value, like we saw in the lecture, is by using the equal sign and then using some kind of value. But again, remember how the value is also dependent on the type that we're using. So since this is an int variable, we cannot put some kind of string of text. This does not work. We also cannot put some kind of decimal value. Nope, here it has to be an integer. So let's put just a whole number. And yep, just like this, and we no longer have any errors. The variable is correctly being assigned with some kind of value, so then we can indeed use it. So let's save our code and see, and let it compile. And if there it is, our exercise has been completed. So good job, here you'll learn another common error using variables before assigning a value to them. So always, always make sure a variable has a value. And the best way to avoid this error is to always give it a default value whenever you define a variable. So yep, always keep that in mind. Remember how before you can use a variable, it needs to have some kind of value. Okay, let's complete the exercise. All right, so here is the lecture on variables and let's do the exercise titled double variable. So the goal with this one is double the value inside the age variable. 
do not modify the code defining the variable or calling the function result. So we should really just double the value inside the age variable. So we should only double the value inside the age variable. And then we can play the scene in Unity in order to test our code. All right, so here's the script. And again, we've got some comments that again are ignored by the compiler. These are just text, just to guide us. Then over here, first thing we have is an int variable named age, and it is being initialized with the value 20. And then like it says here, modify this line down here, set it to double the value stored inside of age. And as a quick hint, remember how you can use math with variables. Now, one obvious thing is you can just do math within your own head. So you can just set it to 40, which is indeed double of 20. And if we hit play in Unity, and technically we got a success, we did get the double. However, while the result is accurate, there doesn't seem to be any multiplication. So the goal with this exercise is to teach you how you can use mathematical operations within your variables. So setting it to a fixed value, that doesn't make much sense. So let's complete this exercise properly. Let's set it to double by using actual math by actually multiplying by two. So over here, instead of the direct value, we can use math so we can take our age variable. So that is the one that we defined up here. So it is currently with the value 20. We can take this and then we can do multiplications using an asterisk and then we can multiply it by something. So in order to double it, pretty simple, just multiply it by two. So if this is going to assign the age double variable, it is going to be assigned to the value of age multiplied by two and the value of age contains the value 20. So in this case, 20 times two and age double won't be set to 40. Okay, so that's it. Always remember to save your file. Just let Unity compile the changes and let's hit on play. And if there it is, we have our success and our exercise has been completed. So good job. In this exercise, you'll learn how you can do math with variables. Yep, this is definitely something that is very valuable. Always remember how you can take your variables and do math with them. Now we can complete the exercise. And yep, we have five out of five exercises completed. So everything is fully completed. There it is, the variables lecture all fully on green. So what we did here, basically what I want you to do after every single lecture, so watch a video lecture, then come here and do all of that. Go onto the main window, select the lecture that you want, go through all the frequently asked questions, all the quizzes, do all the exercises, and make sure that everything is nice and green. If you truly want to learn C Sharp, then this is really what you need to do. Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. In this lecture, we're going to learn all about the various built-in data types that exist. Okay, so in the previous lecture, we learned about variables, which are essentially just data containers. And those containers, they need to have a specific type. There's a bunch of built-in types we can use. For example, some containers can only store whole numbers. Other containers can store strings of text. Then other ones can store the value either true or false. And some can store decimal numbers. So there's a bunch of interesting built-in types we can use. Here is the same demo that we saw in the previous lecture with the sprite just bouncing up and down. And this one has a parameter for a movement speed. This one is defined as an int variable. So that means that over here, we can only write whole numbers. If I try writing some text, nope, that does not work. If I try adding a decimal point, nope, I can't put it. Over here, since this type is of type int, it can only hold whole numbers. Here is the code that we wrote in the previous lecture. So I've got an int for an age. And over here, if I try assigning a decimal number, like let's say 35.5, and nope, this one has an error. Like I said, ints can only store whole numbers. If you want to store a decimal value, then one of the types we can use is a double. So we literally just swap int for double. And now this variable, this one is now of type double. And with this, yep, we have no error. So we can indeed write a value with a decimal point and everything works. Now there are actually three types that we can use for decimals. We can use float, double, or decimal. There's a nice table directly over here on the C-sharp docs that shows the maximum numbers and precision, which is what affects all of those types. As you can see, they've got different sizes and different precision. The smallest one is a float, which is stored in just four bytes. Then a double is stored in eight bytes and a decimal in 16 bytes. And over here, we can see the precision. So basically, if you're dealing with something where precision is paramount, like for example, when dealing with money, for that, you really want to use the decimal type. But for all other use cases, you can either use a double or a float. In regular C-sharp applications, I believe doubles are actually used most often, since in order to a double you really just put a decimal point and yep this one is a double whereas the other type the float type for this one if you just define something with a decimal nope it does not work this one shows an error and the error is because if we just put a dot then this one simply becomes a double in order to make it an actual float we need to append the f onto it so like i said in regular c sharp applications i believe doubles are mostly used since you don't even need to append anything you just write the number whereas for floats you need to append f and in unity game development which is the thing that i do most most of logic is usually done with floats so personally that's 
fancy decimal type that I normally tend to use. Now for Unity beginners, one of the things that trips them up is forgetting to place the F at the end. Like we saw, if we don't do it, yep, we get an error because this is a double and double is not automatically convertible into a float. So if you ever see an error like this, always remember that if you're defining a float, make sure to add F at the end. Okay, so these are the main types for holding decimals. And then there's also a bunch more types for holding whole numbers beyond int. Again, the documentation has a really nice table over here. So int is the one that you're probably going to use most often. This is a signed 32-bit integer. You can store values between minus 2.1 billion to plus 2.1 billion, but there are use cases where you don't need that much precision. There are some cases where you are memory limited, so you want to use as fewer bits as possible. So in those cases, you've got all of these values. And on the other hand, if you want to store a real large number, like for example, the age of the universe, for that, you would normally use either the long or yung long. But for the most part, you will really just be using ints. So don't worry about the rest, just know that those also exist. And also, since we're talking about maximum and minimum, let me just show you what happens if you go above the maximum. So for example, here we've got age defined as an int. Now here we can give it the maximum value for an int. For that, we can access the int class and pass in a dot. This one lets us access a bunch of constants or functions inside the int class. Again, I will cover classes in detail in a future lecture. For now, over here, we can just check the max value. And this one is basically going to represent the largest possible value that we can store inside an int, which like we saw a while ago, the maximum is 2.1 billion. So let's do a console.write line on this one and see what the maximum is. And then let's do something interesting. So let's take the age and increment it by just one. And let's print again and see what this one prints. And yep, that's the result. So basically first we've got the maximum. So 214, yep, this is the maximum value for an int. And then if we have that value and we increment it by just one, then we get what is called an overflow. And essentially it really just loops back the value to the absolute minimum. So if you go past the maximum, you really just end up on the minimum. When working with data types, always make sure you define some type that is enough to store whatever value you need to store. Okay, so here we have ints and floats for most of our number needs. Then we can also do operations on them. So on a float, you can do a float times two, something like this. You can do division, you can do addition, you can do subtraction, so all the usual things. Now, there are some quirks if you do some mathematical operation using different types, like for example, floats and ints. I won't cover type conversions in a little bit, but in terms of numbers, usually you're going to work with mostly with ints and floats. And then another very important data type are strings. These are strings of text. So you define a string by typing in string, so just like the same as any other variable. Then let's call this one name, and let's assign a string value onto it. Now, when making a string, you do it using double quotation marks, and remember to add both the beginning and the ending quotation mark. And as usual, every instruction needs to end with a semicolon. So over here, do not make the mistake of putting the semicolon inside the quotation marks. This one is an error because over here, we just have a string with a semicolon instead of adding a semicolon to end the instruction. So don't make that mistake. And also it's very important how these are double quotation marks. These are not the single quotation marks. These are completely different things. Those are used for another type that I'm going to cover in a little bit. So it's double quotation marks. We have the start, we have the end, and then inside we can write whatever text screen we want. So for example, writing code monkey and then we can do a console.write line and let's print out our name variable. And if there it is, it prints exactly as intended. As for making some operations with strings, the most basic one is just appending or concatenating a string. For that, you just take a string and then do plus and then another string. Like for example, my name is and then plus and then the name. This is basically going to add this string onto the end of this string. If we run this, and if there you go, my name is CodeMonkey. Okay, great. Now also important over here are the spaces inside the quotation marks. These spaces do matter. If we don't put a space here, if there you go, it says is and then CodeMonkey with no space between them. And on the other hand, if we add a ton of spaces, if there you go, now it adds a ton of spaces. So basically just be aware that spaces do matter. These are not just empty. And then when concatenating strings, you can also use it to mix multiple types. So for example, our age up here. So we can do my name is then plus and add the name onto it. Then we can add some more. Again, let's start by adding a space and I'm another space and then let's print the age plus years old. Okay, let's see this. And if there's our final string putting together all the values from all of our variables. So this is one way to do it. You basically just make one string, then plus add another string and so on. This is one way to do it. Or alternatively, you can use the string interpolation method. To use that one, you basically just put everything inside one string. So let's get rid of all the pluses and all of the things creating brand new strings. So let's write it just like this. Except of course, just like this. This is just going to print my name is name and I'm eight years old. So this is not what we want. For string interpolation, we have an entire string. And then before it, we add a dollar sign. And now inside it, whenever we have something that is a variable, we can add some curly braces, open and close them. Again, don't forget to open and close. Let's add on both these variables. And now if we print, if there it is, now it says the same thing. So these two are basically doing the exact same thing. They achieve the exact same output. You can either construct a long string by building different pieces and adding them onto one another, or you can just make an entire one and use string interpolation in order to define what is a value and what is a string. 
Also, here's yet another more advanced tip on strings. Let's say, for example, you want to store a string that contains quotation marks. So let's do a right line and let's print my name is code monkey. But now let's say that I want to print some quotation marks directly in there. Now, if we do it like this, obviously there's an error. Basically over here, we are starting and finishing one string. Then over here, starting and finishing another one. And over here, we've got some symbols that C sharp does not understand. So this does not work. Basically, we do not want this quotation mark to end this first quotation mark. Instead, we want this one to be seen as just a character. So if you need to put quotation marks directly inside a string. For that, you can just go before it and add a backslash. And this is basically going to escape this character, which means it is going to consider it as text instead of interpreting as a string quotation mark. So we can just add that one to that one and to that one. And if there you go, exactly like this. And if there's a text and the string does print with all the quotation marks. Okay, great. So another thing that I mentioned is how it's important that you use double quotation marks. The reason for that is because there is another type that is specific to single quotation marks. And that type is char, that stands for some kind of character. And for that, you use the single quotation marks. And inside, you can place a single character, like for example, the letter A. Again, this type only stores a character. So if I try putting a bunch more stuff, nope, does not work. This one only represents one character. So that's the only thing that I can store inside it. Now, another very important type is Boolean or bool. So for that, you write bool, then give it some name, like let's say is player. And then for this one, there are only two values we can store inside a bool. It can be either true or for example, let's say is enemy and can be false. So the Boolean type can only have these two values, nothing else. And again, it's extremely important that you write the code exactly. So it's true like this, only in lowercase. It is not capital T true. Nope, this does not exist. It is not everything in true. Nope, does not exist. So it's all in lowercase. Now this type only in this one is extremely important in if statements and conditions, which we're going to see in detail in the next lecture. And there is one more special sort of type that you should know, although it's not really a type. And that is how simply instead of defining a specific type like bool, char, string, and so on, instead of that, you can just write var, then give it some kind of name, my variable, and then give it some kind of value. And basically with this, the compiler will essentially look at the value that is assigned and infer some type of type for this variable. So for example, for this one, since we assigned the value 10, this one correctly defined this variable as an int. Whereas if I put 10.2 for this one, now, yep, now it correctly identifies it as a double. If I put an F, yep, now it correctly identifies as a float. If I put false, and yep, this one is now a bool. And if I put false in quotation marks, and yep, this one is now a string. So rather than explicitly defining the type, if you want, you can just define it as var and let the compiler and for the type for you. Some people like this because it tends to make the code a little bit more compact, especially when we're working with complex names, when we're working with types like lists and so on. However, personally, I am not a fan of R. Personally, I like being as explicit as possible so that I know exactly what type I'm working with. So personally, I never use var. I always very explicitly write the type that I'm using, but there is nothing wrong with var. It's really just personal preference. So if you like using it, then yep, by all means use it. Here is a demo that I built included in the interactive exercises. So we've got a bunch of values up here and a bunch of containers down here of various types. Now this value, the value 56, this one is selected and we need to place it in the correct container. Now, if we try putting this in a boolean, nope, that does not work because this is not a boolean. This one is a whole number. So for whole numbers, we can place them inside the int container. Then over here, we've got a string. So this one cannot be a float, cannot be a bool. Nope, this one is a string. Then we've got false. This one is a boolean value. Seven, this is a whole number. So let's put it inside the int. Iron Man, this is another string. Let's put it on string. Black Widow, same thing. It's a string. 35, this one is a whole number. So it goes into int. 33.3F, this one is a float. So go inside the floats. True, this is a boolean. So go in there. This one is a float. And this one is also a float. All right, yep, all done. Go ahead and give it a try yourself and see if you get them all right. Now let's just see one more thing on types, which is type conversion. And we actually already saw that. If we do a console.writeLine, line, and on this one, let's print out the age. If we do this and run, yep, there you go, it did print out the age. So the code is automatically converting our int age into a string that is printed onto the console. Basically, all types can be automatically converted into a string. Then you can also mix types together. For example, let's say the number five plus, and then a string saying number. And yep, this code works. However, like I mentioned in the programming basics lecture, code runs from top to bottom, but also left to right. Meaning over here, let's see what happens if we place first the string number, then let's add the number five, and then let's add the number six. So let's see what this evaluates to. And if there it is, a string number five, six. Okay, great. However, now let's reverse the order. So let's put five plus six, and then the string number. Now let's see what this one evaluates to. And if there it is, now it says 11 number. So this is the difference between how the code runs from left to right. Basically over here, the code is going to see 
see, okay, this is a string and this is an int. And the result from adding a string onto an int, the result from that is going to be a string. So this one is going to concatenate into the string number five. And then it's going to have another string against another int. So it's going to add the six onto it. However, on this one, first left to right, it is going to check an int plus another int. That is a simple mathematical operation. So it is going to add these two numbers together. And then the result is an int, which then adds onto a string. So it is going to do string concatenation. So the second one ends up with an 11 number, whereas the first one is number 56. So remember, code executes from top to bottom and left to right. Always keep that in mind. Now in terms of converting to a string, anything can be converted onto a string. However, for other ones, sometimes can be converted into others automatically. Some have to be done explicitly and some can't be done at all. When it comes to numeric types, these can be automatically converted if the target type can hold that data. For example, over here, let's define a long. And over here, the value that we put doesn't really matter. So it doesn't have to be a massive value. And then if we define an int and we try assigning this int onto the one that we had inside the long, and nope, this does not work. If we look at it, we see the error, which is you cannot implicitly convert the long onto an int. The reason for that once again goes back into this chart. The long type, this one can store a lot more values than the int can store. So because of that, the compiler does not let us automatically convert this because the conversion might imply some loss of data and the compiler protects you from that. However, we can do the opposite since over here, the long, this one can store these many values, whereas the int can store this many. So basically a long can store everything inside an int and a bunch more. So because of that, we can do the opposite. So we can define age universe inside an int. And then for the long, we can put it age universe int. And yep, this one does work. Again, that is because long can store more values than just the int. So we have a guarantee that whatever we define inside the int can be stored inside the long. And then same thing for doubles and floats. Doubles have more precision, so we can store a float inside a double, but we cannot do the opposite. And also like we saw, we cannot have an int and assign it some kind of decimal value. This does not work. However, like the error says here, these are implicit conversions. However, we can be explicit and it will force a conversion, even though it might end up with a loss of data. And the way we do that is we just cast it onto a type. So we open parentheses, we put the target type and then close it. So this is a cast. I'm actually going to cover casting in more detail later on in this course. If we do it, nope, we no longer have an error. However, like I said, you might end up with a loss of data. For example, over here, we are forcing the 35.5 to be placed inside an int. So let's see what this actually returns. So let's do a console.write line. Let's see what this prints. And if there you go, it prints 35. Since ints can only store whole numbers, basically when it gets to the decimal point, it just ignores everything out of it. Importantly, it does not round the value. So even if I put this 35.9, nope, it still says just 35. So basically when we are forcing the conversion onto an int, it is basically going to ignore everything after the decimal point. Now on this topic, one of the most common mistakes that beginners make is actually when dividing ints. So for example, let's say the player has some kind of health and it's stored in an int. Let's say they currently have one health. And then let's say they've got a health max and the health max is 10. And then you're trying to normalize this value. So you do health divided by health max. So now what do you think this will actually output? In theory, the mathematical answer would be 0.1. So we've got one divided by 10, that should be 0.1. But nope, here the result is zero. Again, it's the exact same reason. It's because of type limitations. We are dividing an int by another int. So the result of that calculation will also be an int. And inside an int, we cannot store the value 0.1. So it does the same thing that we saw a while ago. It ignores the decimals and just stores the whole number, which in this case just ends up storing zero. Now in solution, this problem is really simple. We just need to convert one of these values into a float. So we can just cast it onto a float. So now here we have some math doing between a float and an int. So the final result will be a float. And if we test, yep, now it does return the correct result 0.1. So if you ever have any strange results when doing calculations, always double check that you're using the correct type so you're not losing any data. And like I said, there are some types you can convert even with a cast. For example, you cannot forcefully cast a false onto an int. This does not work. And same thing for a string onto a number. Nope, this does not work. If you do want to convert a string onto a number, for that you have two methods. One method is using a class called convert. And then inside it converts a whole bunch of functions in order to convert from all kinds of types. Like for example, convert to in 32, which is going to be the regular int. The in 64, this one is going to be the long and the in 16, this one is a short. If you're wondering what those numbers are, it's over here, it's the size of the actual value. So the int, that is a 32 bit int, whereas the long is a 64 bit and so on. And on the right side, we can actually see the full name for the types. What we see on the left type is usually what we use, but these are really just aliases. The actual types are the ones over here. So an int is really a system.in32. The long is really a system.in64 and so on. So anyways, yep, here we have a whole bunch of functions. And again, don't worry about what are functions for now. I'll cover them in detail in future lectures. But if we were to use this function, then we can indeed convert the value 56 into the health. 
any of this does work. Although of course it only works if the string actually has number. If you write something, you're actually going to get an error. All right, so that's a lot of info on variables, data types, and type conversion. This is one of the most important part of the basis of programming. So definitely make sure you fully understand this topic before going further. If you need, go ahead and rewatch this lecture to really solidify this knowledge. It is really important that you fully understand variables and types before going any further. Next, we're going to learn another extremely important part of programming, if statements and conditions. So let's learn that in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. In this lecture, we're going to learn about if-else statements and conditions. We're going to learn how conditions are evaluated, how to do mathematical tests and logical operations. So let's learn about ifs and conditions. This has to do with one type that we already saw in the previous lecture, Boolean. This is a type that can only be either true or false. Those are the only two possible values. Basically, we write a condition and then the code evaluates that condition to either true or false. Now, the simplest condition is just equality. So for example, is one equal to one? The answer is yep. So when the code evaluates this one, it evaluates it to true. And if we check is one equals to two, that is obviously false. One is not equal to two. So this one evaluates to false. Then we can use these conditions inside an if. The if has a condition and then a code block. And if the condition is true, then it is going to execute this code block. And if it is false, then it does not execute this code block. And again, going back to what I mentioned in the programming basics lecture, the code executes from top to bottom. So first it executes this if, then checks the condition and the condition is true. So it goes inside and executes the code inside, then goes back out outside, then executes this if, checks the condition, this one is false, so it skips that one and continues running afterwards. So the code is still executing from top to bottom as usual, but by using ifs we can control what code actually runs when. Here is a visual demo in the interactive exercises. We've got a simple if condition, testing if a distance is under a certain amount. If so, then we're going to set this target color to green, and if not, we're going to set it to white. So I can click to move the player, and as the distance goes under that amount, yep, that one turns green, and if it goes above, then that one turns white. So depending on whether this condition is true or not, it is running either this line or this line of code. Here in the code, let's see our syntax. And the syntax for an if is really simple. We just write if. And again, remember how code is case sensitive. So it is not if all uppercase. It is not uppercase and lowercase. It is neither of these. Instead, it is if all lowercase. Again, very important. If you write it properly, it should change color. Then we write the condition inside parentheses. Remember to have a matching closing parentheses for every opening. The condition can be all kinds of things. They will eventually be evaluated into a Boolean, so either true or false. So over here, we can just write true for testing. So you have if, then the condition, and then we just do a code block. And this is the code that will be executed if the condition is true. So for example, over here, just a console.write line, let's say inside if. And if we run this, and if there it is, we are inside the if, so we did run that code. Whereas now if instead of true, if we change this into false and run it, and if now that one does not run because that one is false. So the code goes to execute this line, then it says this condition is false, so it is going to skip this one and continue afterwards. Now it obviously doesn't make much sense to manually write either true or false over here on the condition. Usually we want to test some kind of thing, some kind of proper condition, and the most basic thing is simply mathematical operations. So if we test one equals one, if we test this, if that is inside, goes inside the if. Alternatively, instead of just equality, we can simply do some mathematical operations. Like for example, let's see if we are testing if two is bigger than one. So pretty simple, and the result of this test is true since two is indeed bigger than one. So if we run this, if there's a message, it works. Basically what the code is doing is that when it gets over here to the if, it gets to this condition, then it evaluates this condition. And again, it is going to evaluate into either true or false. And then if it is true, goes inside it. If it is false, skips it. There's a bunch of mathematical operations you can do. You can do bigger than, you can do less Less than, you can do bigger or equal, less than or equal. So you have all these standard mathematical operations. And of course, over here, I'm using values directly, but you could replace this with a variable. So like an int for the age, 35, then let's say if age is under or equal to 40. And yep, obviously this works. So you have all kinds of operations, and then you also have the equals. Now here's another extremely, extremely important thing. When you want to test for equality, you do a double equals. Not just one, it's a double equal sign. The single equals, this one is meant for assignment. Like for example, we define a variable, then we do a single equals, and we are assigning the value 35 onto our variable. But when we want to test for equality, we do a double equals. Again, this is very important. This is a mistake that a lot of beginners do. They do something like a single equals and they have no idea why there's an error. Over here, the error isn't very helpful. It says the left-hand side of the assignment must be a variable. So if you're a beginner, this makes no sense. But that's because the single equals, this one stands for assignment and double equals, this one is for equality. And if you try putting that inside the right line, so let's do console.write line. If we do age double equals 35, if we do this, if there I go, that does return true. However, if now we put just a single equals, and if now instead of either true or false, it just says 35. That is because the single equals, this one is assigning the value over there and 
and it's not actually doing any comparison. So again, don't make this mistake. Single equals is for assignment and double equals is for equality. So related to equals is the not equal sign. And for this one, we do an exclamation point and then equals. So the exclamation point means not, so not equals. So in this case, this one will not run because one is equal to one. So one not equals one is false. Whereas if we put a two, one does not equal two. Yep, that's true. So yep, it does run. And of course, over here, we can simply use Boolean variables. So bool is player. Let's define this as true. And then over here, just if is player. If so, then yep, this works. So over here, we have the code block that is going to execute if the if condition is true. And then we have another keyword that we can add after the if. We can add the keyword else and then another code block. And now this code block will execute if the first if is not true. So let's do another right line inside else. And over here, we define players true. Then we test if is player. So it is going to be inside this one. So it is not going to run this one. If we test, if there you go, it just says inside the if. But then if I swap player to false, so now it is not going to run the if, and instead it's going to run the else, if that it is just like that. So for example, instead of having two ifs, like if is player and if not is player, which by the way, the not equals that one can also be applied like this. If you put the exclamation point, then it's basically going to negate whatever comes afterwards. So over here we have not is player. So we are testing if it is player or not is player, which is really the same thing. So if you want to test this kind of thing, then using an else makes it much simpler. That's exactly what the code over here in the demo is doing. It is testing if distance is under four, and if so, then it's going to set the target it call it to green. If not, it is going to set it to white. If I had not written this else statement, then as soon as it became green, even if we stood outside of it, it would not change it back. Whereas like this, if it's inside, it turns green. If not, else, it turns white. And now here we are testing a single condition, but we can also combine multiple conditions. Let's say, for example, we want to test if two is bigger than one and if three is bigger than one. The way we write a logical land is just like this with two ampersands. Again, it's very, very important. Just like the double equals, this is a double ampersands. If you put just one, this is a completely different operation. This is a bitwise AND, which is something that I covered in the advanced portion of this course. But over here for a logical AND, we do not want just one. So we want two of them. Again, don't make this mistake. So let's see what this outputs. And if there it is, it runs the code inside the if. So basically here we have two conditions. And when the code gets to this point, it is basically going to evaluate each condition from left to right. So first evaluates this one. Is two bigger than one? The answer is yes. So this one evaluates the true. And is three bigger than one? The answer is also yes. So this one also evaluates the true. And then we've got an AND operation between a true and a true. And this AND operation, the output of this one will only be true if both conditions are true, which is the case over here. So that's why this one runs inside the if. If we change one of these, so let's say true and false, if so, then the output for this one will be false, so it is not going to run this one, instead it's going to run the else. In order to know what combinations make true or false, you can look at what is called a truth table. So over here we've got the values A and B, and then we've got the result of doing an AND operation or an OR operation between both those. A and B can be either true or false, which by the way, sometimes true or false is represented as simply ones and zeros. So zero equals false and one equals true, really just different representations of the same thing. So over here we have the end operator. And like I said, the end, this one is only true if both conditions are true. So if A is false and B is false, both are false. So the end output is going to be false. If A is false, but B is true. Again, we still don't have the condition that both of them are true. So the output is still false. Same thing over here. If A is true, B is false. The output is still false. It is only if we have both A and B, both of them are true. If so, then the output of the end is also true. So the result of an AND is only true if both components are true. Then the other operation that we can see here is the OR operator. This one is going to be true if either A or B is true. So if both of them are false, if so, then the OR is going to be false. But if just one of them is true, then the output of the OR is going to be true. Or if both of them are true, if so, then the output is also going to be true. Over here in the code, the way we write an OR operator is denoted by two pipes. Again, pay close attention to the fact that it is two. If you write just one, this is a completely different operation. This is another bitwise operation, which again, I cover in detail in the advanced section. So also pay close attention here. It is two pipes. So this makes an OR operation. And like I said, this one is going to run our code block if either of these are true. So if this one is true, then yep, this one is going to run. And yep, it does run. The OR only returns false if both of them are false. And if we set this, yep, we run the code inside the else. There is an interactive truth table in the exercises. Here up top, we have the inputs and down here we have the outputs. So for the end, the end is only true if both are true. So if that one is true and false, the output is false, false, true, that one. And if both are true, that one is true. The or is only true if either of them are true. So if either of these are true, the output is going to be true. And the not simply inverts it. So if it's false, becomes true. And if it's true, it becomes false. Now these conditions, doing an or or an and, doing this always works just between two elements. 
but you can also have multiple conditions, not just two. You can have as many conditions as you want. So here in true or false, you can have as many as you want. However, it's also important to know they are evaluated from left to right, meaning that whenever doing some kind of or or and operation, it is always done just between two conditions. So when the code gets here, first it evaluates this one and gets a result from this evaluation. Then after having that result, then it does the result of this one alongside the result of that one. And finally, from this one along with the result of all these. So it does all those evaluations and importantly, always from left to right. So for example, let's write if one equals two or one equals one and five is bigger than one. So if we have these conditions, if you want, pause the video and try to figure out if the code is going to run or not. Like I said, left to right. So first it evaluates this one. Does one equal two? The answer is no. So this one evaluates into false. Then it is going to evaluate this one. Does one equal one? The answer is true, yep. Then it's going to do an or operation between false or true. And again, the or is true if just either of them is true. So in this case, this one outputs the true. Then it evaluates this one, is five bigger than one? That is true. And then we have a true and true. This one returns true. And yep, we do run this code. Then if you want, you can also have more control over the order of testing, simply by using parentheses, just like you do in normal math. So for example, let's write some code like this. So for example, we have false or true. This one is going to evaluate into true. Then it's going to do true and false, that is going to evaluate to false. And then false or true, that is going to evaluate in true, so it is going to run this one. So over here we can add some parentheses, so we want to do this condition first, and then this condition first. And this way first it is going to evaluate these two, then evaluate these two, and only then evaluate the whole thing. Another important thing is also how conditions can short circuit, meaning let's say we have an or, and with an or it is going to return true if either of them is true. So if we have true or false, or actually in this case, let's put some proper conditions. So one bigger than two, that is going to be false, and two bigger than one. So if we have this, basically over here, two bigger than one, this is going to evaluate to true, one bigger than two, this is going to evaluate to false. Now, like I said, the or, this one is going to be true when either of them is true. So when the compiler starts to evaluate these conditions, it starts to evaluate the first one, again, left to right, and it evaluates this one into true, and since that is the case, the compiler is smart enough to know not to waste any power on evaluating this second condition, because the first one is true, then it's already going to run inside EF. So after here, we can have a bunch more ORs, and it does not matter. The compiler would only test this one, since this one is true, it just ignores everything after this. However, on the other hand, if we have an AND, if so, then it is going to evaluate this one, this one is true, but then the AND is only true if both of them are true, so it cannot stop executing here. It needs to execute this one in order to see if it's true or false in order to know does it run inside the if or not. So in this case, the short circuit for the end would be if this one is false. If this one is false right here, then it doesn't even bother evaluating this condition because if the first one is false, then the end is always going to return false. This is the kind of thing that becomes really important in some performance intensive applications, especially when you're running some expensive function to test something. For example, if you have true or and then over here, you've got some kind of function that costs quite a lot in terms of performance. If so, then the compiler is going to be smart enough and it's not even going to waste any time running this condition because the first one is already true. Now over here, let me also make one quick note. Ifs technically do not require a code block. So if you just have an if without an else. If so, technically you can just do this. So you can raise the code block and just write the condition afterwards. If you have just a single instruction inside the if, then this is perfectly valid code. So let's put this one true so it goes inside. And if there you go, it does run the code inside the if. However, I highly, highly advise you to always write a code block. The reason is simply because it is very easy to write an if like this, and then later on you want to write another instruction, so let's say inside if2. So you add this, but you forget to write the code block, and you assume this one is still going to run inside the if, and in this case if we try running this, we do see if and then the if2, but if we change this into false, ideally we would not want either of these to run, but yep, the second one does run. That is because if you don't include a code block, then the only thing that is considered to be inside the if is just the next line immediately afterwards. Remember that in C-sharp, indentation does not matter. So the fact that this one has as many spaces that does not matter at all. The only thing that matters are code blocks and semicolons. If you don't include a code block, then basically just executes the code inside the if, which is going to be until the first semicolon, until the first instruction. So in order to avoid this mistake, my advice is to always write code blocks in all your ifs. So always put it like this, even if you have just one instruction inside it. And speaking of indentation, like I said, it does not matter. So you can indent the code like this or do anything crazy, anything you want. As far as the compiler is concerned, all of this is valid code inside this if. But for your own personal sanity, definitely make sure to take some time to indent things properly. Now here we have our ifs and we saw the else as well. 
Something we can do is simply chain ifs. So let's do an if true and then else. And after the else, we can write if immediately afterwards. So for example, here's some code. We define some kind of age. Then we do the first if, testing if age is under 20. In this case, it is not. So it is going to run the else related to this if. And then inside that else, we've got another if. So if under 30, meaning the code inside here is going to run if the age is not inside this if. So if it's above or equal to 20 and under 30. And if not, then it's going to go into the else connected to this if and finally run this line of code. And if we test, you yep, correct, H35 is indeed above 30. So you can chain a bunch of elf ifs together, or you can simply just do a bunch of ifs, or if we want, we can also chain a bunch of them just like this. So basically just having some ifs one after the other. Yep, this is also perfectly valid code. All right, so here we learned about ifs. And the last thing that we did was chain a bunch of ifs together. This code works correctly. We have all of our ifs one after the other. But with this many ifs, it becomes really hard to understand what the code is doing. So to solve this particular problem, we have another way to run conditional logic, which is by using a switch. So that's what we're going to cover in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. In this lecture, we're going to learn about the switch. This lets us very easily test comparisons against multiple possible cases. Okay, so here we have the code that we wrote in the previous lecture. We have a bunch of ifs chained together. Technically, this works, but it becomes a bit hard to read. To do this kind of logic, there is a much better way when we want to test multiple different cases. And for that, we want a switch. To do that, first we write switch, and then we write the value or variable that we want to use in our comparison. So in this case, let's use the same name variable. Then we open and close our code block, and our inside here we write case and then afterwards what we want to compare against so in this case let's compare against the name code monkey then we do a colon and down here we write whatever code we want to execute if the switch variable matches this value so let's do the exact same thing and finally we end the case by using a break yep just like this this is a valid switch case let's just add the other two yep just like this so basically what we have down here is exactly the same thing as we have up here except instead of having a ton of separate ifs, we just have a switch. We just write our name variable once and then individually each value we want to compare against. And if the value in here, it exactly matches the one here, then it's going to run this code. If it perfectly matches this one, it's going to run this one and so on. Basically when the code gets to this line, it is going to grab whatever value is stored inside of name. Then it's going to compare against each one of those cases. And when it finds a match like this one, then the code goes inside and runs this line of code. Then when it reaches the break, this one tells it to break out of the switch. So it skips all of these and jumps and continues executing down here. Basically, the switch is really great when you want to compare one value against many different values. It is much simpler to use a switch as opposed to a ton of if elses. Then the switch also has a special case called default. And basically, the code here is going to run if the value that we choose up here does not match any of the values inside any of the cases. If it does not match any of them, it is going to run the default. So here is the interactive demo. I've got a bunch of buttons up here that I can use to modify the string name. And if we can see which switch is going to run. So if the name is code monkey, then it's going to run this case and it's going to change the outline color into white. If I click on Iron Man, then the name is now Iron Man. So it is going to run this one and put the outline in white and put the outline in yellow. If I choose Black Widow, then it's going to run this one. And if I choose Spider-Man, which does not match any of these three, if so, then it's going to run default and run like this. Now, if you forget to write a break, so if I remove this, technically this is still valid code as long as there's it. This one causes an error. It tells you that control cannot fall through from one case label onto another one. However, if we raise this line of code, yep, now this one is perfectly valid. So if up here I change the name into Iron Man, let's see what this code runs. And if it says, hello, Black Widow. Basically what this is doing is if the value up here matches either this case or this case, if it matches either of those, then it's going to run this line of code. So you can have multiple cases run the same line of code. Although normally you usually want the code to execute only the code inside that case. You want each value to execute a different thing. So in most cases, you want to use a break at the end of each one. That way it is very clear what code runs on what case. Also, if you don't assign default, so if I raise this and I put, let's say, Spider-Man, if I put it, which does not match any of these cases, then yeah, it simply does nothing. So if it does not match any of the cases, then nothing inside the switch runs and just continues running afterwards. And over here, I'm using a string, but you can use literally almost anything else, like an int or a char. So we can do int age and then do a switch, do a switch on the age and inside do the same thing. So case 10 and over here we've got h10. We can do a default. We can do all kinds of things. And yep, all of this works. Okay, so here we learned about the switch, which is extremely useful. Next, let's finally learn one extremely powerful feature in any programming functions. So let's learn about those in the next lecture. Hello and welcome. I'm your code monkey. In this lecture, we're going to learn all about functions. This is an extremely crucial thing, so make sure you fully understand everything in this lecture. So functions are another core concept in programming. A function is basically putting some code inside a box. So let's say over here we've got a bunch of code. This is all in just one main function. This is our entire program. But instead we can build like this. We basically put some code in a separate box, so this is going to be our function. 
And then we can easily call that function, meaning run the code inside that box by just calling one line of code. One big benefit of this assembly organization, our code becomes much easier to understand if we have some clear functions with some clear names that do one very specific thing. That is much better for organization as opposed to having a giant wall of text for an entire program. Another big benefit is how it cuts down on copy-pasted code. Without functions, we would need to write the function code every time we wanted that behavior. So for example, let's say here we got some code that we are copy-pasting and repeating three times. Right away, it's bad that we are copy-pasting the same code multiple times. But even worse than that is imagine if we wanted to modify some behavior on, on this code that we are repeating multiple times. In order to modify it, we need to apply those modifications to every single version, every single place where we are calling essentially the same code. Whereas if we're using a function, it doesn't matter how many times we call it. If we need to modify anything in this logic, we just modify it in one place and automatically updates in every other place. Also, just one quick note, like I've said several times, code runs from top to bottom, and that is still true when it comes to functions, except the code jumps around a little bit. So it starts executing up here, executes all these, and gets to the function, and then it jumps inside the function, then it runs the code top to bottom from that function, and when it reaches the end, basically goes back and continues executing from there. So the execution jumps around a bit, but it's still pretty much the same in terms of working from top to bottom. And now before we see the syntax for functions, we should look into the other more advanced templates. So far, we've been using this really basic template where we just write our code here. This is really great for the basics, but by now we already have enough knowledge to be able to use the more thorough template. So go ahead and open up Visual Studio. Then let's go to create a brand new project. Once again, let's pick a console app. You should be able to see it on the recent project templates or again, search for it. And again, remember it's this one with the C sharp icon. It is not the one with Visual Basic or F Sharp, and it is not the one with .NET Framework. It is the one that just says console app in C Sharp. So let's pick this one. Then let's give it some name. I'm going to go with CodeMonkey C Sharp Course. Place it anywhere and leave it the same solution name. Let's go next. Then over here, yep, let's use .NET 8. And importantly, it's over here, and let's make sure to tick this box. We do not want to use the top level statements, which is the simplified template. We don't want to use that. We want to use the standard code. So that's it, just like this. Let's hit on create. And yep, here is the brand new template. For now, you really don't need to worry about the specifics of this. So don't worry about what is a namespace, what is a class, what is static, and so on. For now, you can ignore all of that. Just know that the only difference in this template is all the code that we've been writing. Right now, we would simply write it directly in here inside the main function. If we run this, we should see the exact same hello world. If there it is, hello world exactly the same as previously. The one very important thing is here being very careful over where you write your code, meaning it needs to be over here inside the main function, inside this code block. It cannot be, for example, over here, just inside the class code block. This does not work. This causes an error. And it also cannot be outside here, inside namespace or completely outside of anything. So all the syntax is all still exactly the same as we've been seeing so far. Just make sure to write it over here directly inside the main function. And now before we see the syntax instead of function, those are usually referring to the exact same thing. Technically in C-sharp, the correct term is method, but both terms are really used interchangeably. Sometimes I call them functions, sometimes I call them methods. Just know that in most cases, when someone says either a term, they're really referring to the same thing. Now, in order to define a function, we begin writing, let's say, outside the main function. Again, it's very important that you write the code in the correct place. We want to start writing over here, which is after closing the main code block, but still inside the class code block. So inside this one, but outside the main. So right here, we begin by defining the data type that we're going to return from that function. If we don't want to return any data, we can use a special type called void. Void means nothing. So pretty much exactly the same thing as our main function here, which also does not return anything. So we have the return type, and then we give the function some kind of name. I'm actually going to talk about the importance of good names later on in the course in a dedicated lecture. It is an extremely important thing. You should always, always give it a proper name and not something that has no meaning like for example just the letter x if you do that then you have no idea what that is actually doing so over here let's give it a proper name let's say we want to make a function that just prints hello to the console so let's give it a proper name and just call it say hello so that's the name of our function and then we open our parentheses and inside we add any parameters that we want our function to have although optionally we can also have it with no parameters so let's just close the parentheses Again, always keep in mind matching opening and closing. So we define this and then we just write our code block. So just currently braces, open and close. And yep, over here we have the function code. Now here we can write whatever code we want our function to do. So for example, let's just do a simple console.write line and let's just print out hello. All right, yep, that's it, pretty simple. Here we have defined a function. Also, just one more thing, in order for our demo to work, we actually need to mark this function as static. So over here, we need to write static, just like we have on the main. Now, like I said a while ago, for now, don't worry about understanding static. I will cover it in detail later on in the course. For now, just know that in order for our code to work, we need both the main function and the say hello function. We need both of these to be marked as static. 
Ok, so our function is ready, however if we try running this, and if we still just see hello world, we do not see our second function hello, that's because over here we are defining the function, but we didn't actually run it. Remember how code executes, it executes from top to bottom and the entry point is over here inside the main function. So right now all our program is doing is it starts executing over here, then runs this one, prints hello world onto the console, and it reaches the end of the main function and it closes our program. So just defining a function doesn't actually do anything, we need to actually call it or run that function. And in order to do that, we just need to write our function name, so let's say say hello, and then the parentheses for any parameters, which in this one doesn't have any, so let's just open and close, and again terminate our instruction with a semicolon. Also again, very important, remember how code is case sensitive, so you have to write the name of the function exactly. If I replace this age with a lowercase age, nope, does not work, at a red squiggly line, needs to be perfect. If I replace the s with s, nope, does not work, so always remember code is case sensitive. So just with this if we test, and yep we do see hello world and then hello. So basically like I showed in the diagram, the code is running from top to bottom, so starts executing here, then goes to execute this one, which in turn causes the execution to jump onto this one, and when this function terminates then it goes back into the original execution, which in turn simply finishes the program. Another extremely useful thing about functions is simply how you can call them as many times as you want. So for example let's make a bunch more instructions over here, let's print out hello vertically, Ok, just like this, now let's say we wanted to print this out three times, so we could either copy paste the code literally three times, but obviously this looks quite messy, or using functions we can simply call the function three times. And if we test, and if there it is, it did run our function, did run our print three times. And also like I mentioned in the diagram, if we wanted to modify any behavior in the side of this function, we just need to modify it over here just once in the function, and basically automatically updates whatever that function is called, as opposed to if we were copy pasting, we would need to make that modification multiple times. So just with this simple example, we can already see a ton of benefits from functions. They help us organize our code by splitting our code into functions that each do a specific thing, and also helps us avoid tons of copy pasted code by putting any code we want inside a function and simply calling it. Now that we've seen the super basic function, the next thing are parameters, and the way you add parameters is inside the parentheses. Parameters are essentially just variables, so we start by writing the data type for the parameter. Let's say we want one of type string, so we just write string. Then we give it some kind of name, so let's say player name. Again, make sure you choose good names that clearly represent what this parameter should be, what it should represent. And now basically inside this function we can use our player name in any way you want. So for example, let's say hello and then print out the player name. Alright, yep, just like this. And now up here we can already see a bunch of errors. And the error is saying there is no argument given. Which also, by the way, you might hear the name argument instead of parameter. These are, again, these are again sort of interchangeable names, just like method and function. Now technically the definition is that over here when defining the function, this one is technically called a parameter. Whereas when you use it to call something, that one is technically called an argument. So that's what's technically correct, but in reality most people use both terms interchangeably, so parameter or argument really refers to the same thing. And now here we can see the error, and the error says that there is no argument given that requires that corresponds to the required parameter for our player name. So inside the parameters we need to pass in a string for our player name. We can either pass in a variable, so define a string variable and pass it in, or just write over here a string directly. So let's say code monkey, and if just like this, and if we test, and if it does say hello code monkey, which of course means that you can call the function multiple times with multiple different parameters, and if it runs the logic with multiple parameters. And speaking of multiple, we can also have more than one over here. We've already seen zero parameters and one parameter, but we can have as many as we want. You really just add a comma and then again any type of name, well, let's say int age, like hello player name, you are age years old. Then over here on say hello, just pass in another parameter, just like this. And if there it is, hello code monkey, you are 35 years old. The next very important thing about functions are return types. Right now we define this function as returning void, and void means nothing, so it means that this function doesn't return anything. But now let's make a function that does return something. Let's make a function to simply add two numbers together. To get the result, let's play just around with simple whole numbers, so let's put int. We're going to return an int. Let's call it add numbers, then inside parentheses let's add two numbers, so let's define int x, int y, ok like this, and right away Visual Studio is showing us an error and it says not all code paths return a value, meaning if we define some kind of return type other than void we have to return something, and the way we do that is simply with the keyword return, and then whatever value we want to return. So in this case adding two numbers let's just do x plus y. And if there it is, super simple, again in order to call this we need to add in static, just make sure that it works, and now up here now we can call add numbers, let's add the number 1 and 2, and let's see, let's actually put this inside a console.write line just to see the result. Ok, let's test, and if there it is, the result is indeed 3, so 1 plus 2 equals 3. Another thing you can do is define multiple functions with the exact same name, 
they just need to have different parameters, either a different number of parameters or different types. So here we cannot define another function named exactly add numbers with also two int parameters. We cannot do this, but if we swap one of these into bool, then all of a sudden this function definition is indeed valid. Or alternatively, if we have int, but then we have a final one. If we do, then yep, this one is also valid. And then up here when calling add numbers, as soon as you open the parentheses, you see this one and you see one of two. So this is basically showing all the various versions of this function. So the first version takes an X and a Y, both ints. And the second version takes X, Y, and Z. And for the types, we can just look inside the console.write line, so add the parentheses. And over here, we see this one has 18 versions. So this one takes no parameters. This one takes a Boolean, a character, a character array, decimal, double, float, and so on. And then, of course, you can also chain functions together. So basically, the return value, this means that whenever this function runs, it is going to run this logic and return some kind of thing. So just like we saw on the ifs and the conditions, basically the code gets to here, evaluates this function, gets some kind of return value. So for example, up here, instead of passing in number 35, we can call add numbers and pass in something. As long as the return type on this function matches the parameter type, as long as it's like that, then yep, this works. If there it is, that's correct. And of course, we can simply put the result of a function inside some kind of variable. So in number, we can just add numbers. And now if we do a console.write line on our number, if we do this, if there it is, it does print the same thing. Now, one very useful type to return from a function is boolean. So for example, let's make another function. Let's make it return bool. And let's say for example, just is positive. We want to return if a certain number is positive. Let's receive an int x. And we can do if and compare x to two. So if x is bigger than or equal to zero, I think zero equals as a positive number. I'm not sure, but I think so. So if so, then this return true. And if not, then return false. And yep, there it is. And again, just in here, we need to make sure to add static in order to make this work. So now up here, let's do a console.write line and let's pass in is positive. Let's say the number five, then let's add a semicolon, just separate it. And let's say is positive and let's say minus two. Okay, let's see what this does. And yep, it says true and false. So yep, that is correct. Five is indeed positive. Minus two is indeed not positive. Also, by the way, here, instead of doing these returns, instead of doing these ifs, instead, we can really just return the condition itself. So we can just do return and just return the condition. So just like this. And yep, everything still works exactly the same. When the code gets to here, it is going to evaluate this condition, which is going to return true or false, and then returns the whole thing and then prints it out. Now, back over here on the void return type, on this one, you don't have to call return. Over here, we have no errors. However, if you want, you can also call return. And for this one, since this returns nothing, it returns no type. Instead of calling return, then passing in some value, we just call return, then semicolon. That's it. Basically, what this will do is it will stop the execution of the function directly at this point. So Visual Studio actually helps us. As you can see, this line is in a dark gray. And that is because like it says here, unreachable code detected. Since we are always calling return over here, then this line of code will never ever run. Speaking of functions and parameters, it's also a great time to see how things work with regards to value types versus reference types. This is something that I cover in detail later on in the intermediate section, but I want to make a quick mention up here. For example, let's keep just the say hello. So let's actually get rid of all these. Okay. So let's say I define an int for the age and let's say I put it at something and then I call say hello and then let's put the exact same thing. So that and pass in the age. And now over here inside the say hello, let's do age plus plus. So basically we are incrementing the value of age. So when this line of code runs, instead of printing 35, it should print 36. But now the important thing is now out here, let's say we print out the age again. So right line on the age. So let's print this one out and now let's see what this one says. And if there it is, so inside the function, it says you are 36 years old, but outside the function, it says 35. Basically what is happening is when we call a function over here, when we pass in a parameter, when we do that, we're actually passing in a copy of the value stored inside this variable. So when we increment the variable in here, we are really just incrementing the copy and we are not actually modifying the original value. That is why when we run here, we see 36 because we are working with this copy that we did modify. But when we exit the function and we run this line of code, when we do that, we are using the original piece of data, which has not been modified. Again, this has to do with the fact that some types like int, those are passed in as copies, meaning that the function receives a copy of the original value. And if you modify that inside the function, you are modifying the copy and not the original value. And then there are other types, which are reference types, which is going to have some different behavior. Those are passed in as a reference instead of a copy. So for those, if you modify them inside the function, then you will also modify them outside the function. Now, if you're a bit confused, don't worry. Like I said, I talk about in detail about value types versus reference types. I talk about what they are and what that actually means later on in the intermediate section. Right now, I really just want you to be aware of that difference. When working, for example, with primitive types, like over here, the int, when you pass it in, always remember you are working with a copy. So just be aware that if you modify something inside a function, it will not necessarily modify it outside the function.
All right, so here we'll learn another really crucial thing about programming, functions. They are extremely powerful and you will be writing tons of functions with all sorts of return types and all sorts of number of parameters. So definitely do make sure you fully understand functions before going any further. Watch this lecture a second time if you need to, they are really that crucial. And now that we have introduced functions, which allows us to have multiple separated code blocks, because of that you should really learn the basics of variable scope, so let's learn that in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. In this lecture we're going to learn about scope, which covers the lifetime of variables and from where they are accessible. Okay, so scope is very important, it's another one of those things that trips up beginners. It comes back again to how code is organized in different code blocks, and variables defined within a code block can only be accessed by that code block and any child code blocks. So for example, if I define a variable up here, I can indeed access it in here, in here, in here, and here. Yep, it is accessible everywhere. However, if I define a variable in here, it is accessible from within these child code blocks, but it is not accessible from a completely separate code block, and it is not acceptable from a code block that is above it. In the previous lecture, we covered functions. So here there is a function, and now up here in the main, let's define some kind of variable. Let's say bool is player. Let's define this variable over here. And now if down here on the function, if I try accessing this and modifying it, nope, this does not work, we have an error. The name is player does not exist in the current context. Context is really just another word for scope. Basically, when we define a variable up here inside the main function code block, inside of here we are defining a local variable. Meaning this variable is player, this variable only exists inside this function within this code block. As soon as we exit this code block for something else, like for example this other function, down here that variable literally does not exist. This local variable only exists inside this code block. And it only also exists after it is defined. Again, code runs from top to bottom. So afterwards we can set is player into true, but before we define it, we cannot do this. Nope, this one does not work. We cannot use the local variable before it is declared. So this is yet another mistake that I see a lot of beginners having trouble with. They define some kind of variable and they have no idea why they cannot use it in a completely separate code block. So always remember where you are writing code, in which code block, and remember that local variables defined within a code block, they are not accessible from a completely separate code block. Also, if you define a parameter variable, like these two that we have here, parameters are also local variables, and they also only exist inside this code block. So for example, if out here after calling say hello, if I try to access the player name, nope, that does not exist. Because again, player name is essentially a local variable which only exists within this code block. Now these questions of scope apply to commonly separate code blocks like these, but it also applies to code blocks within code blocks. Like for example, over here, if I define an if, if something, and then I make a code block, within this code block, which is essentially a nested code block inside the main, within this one, I can indeed access player and do something to it. So again, back to the diagram, if we define something over here, we can access it from any nested code block. However, if we do the opposite, so if instead of defining it in there, let's say we define inside that code block, and then over here trying to modify it, and nope, is player does not exist over here. It does not exist because the code block where we are writing player, the code block inside main, that one is a parent code block of the if code block, which is where the variable is actually defined. So as you go deeper inside code blocks, you can access variables that were defined outside of it, above it, but when outside, you cannot access things that were defined inside. Now, if you have a variable that you'd like to access and modify between multiple functions, like something that I want to access both inside the main and inside the say hello function, for that, you can simply make it a class variable. I'm going to cover classes and also the static keyword in detail in future lectures, so don't worry too much about what they are for now. Just again, remember it's all about code blocks. So here we've got the program class, Class, and it exists inside this code block and inside this class we have our two functions so just down here we can define some kind of variable so let's say bool is player and again to make this work we need to mark it as static so with this one defined we can then access it over here inside the main and also over here inside the hello because again these two code blocks are basically nested code blocks of the class code block but on the other hand if we define a completely separate class then over here on this class which is again another completely separate code block from the one up here if over here we make some kind of function and then inside this function code if we try accessing is player nope does not exist because is player does not exist inside this class we define it up here so it only exists inside this program class and any nested functions so in general if you ever find some kind of issues if you ever see this error message saying that some kind of variable does not exist in the current context if so then always double check your code to make sure that the variable that you are trying to access you can actually access it from wherever you are trying to access if you do want to pass in some data some kind of local variable to within a function if you want to do that, then you can literally do exactly what we've been doing. So you define a function with some kind of parameter, you define the local variable over here, and then simply put it in there. And then again, remember the thing that I mentioned in the previous lecture about how parameters, these are really copies. So if we do H++ in here, it is actually not going to modify this one. So if you did want to modify that one, you would simply return 
some kind of thing. So return the age. And up here, simply put age equals that. And now if we do a console.write line on our age, and if this one does print 36. So we pass in the local variable to inside the function, then the function we do something, we return it, and with that return value, we put it back on the local variable. All right, so that's scope. This is another crucial thing that I see a lot of beginners struggle with. So definitely make sure you fully understand this. Anytime you see that error again, make sure to come back to this lecture in order to fully understand why it's happening. Next, we're going to learn about something very simple, but also very important, comments. So let's learn about those in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. In this lecture, we're going to learn all about comments. These are basically just some text annotation that you can add to your code to provide some extra clarification on anything you need. Okay, so comments are really super simple. This is how you can pretty much write any text you want directly inside your code. However, that text is not interpreted as text, meaning comments are just for you, the programmer. The compiler completely ignores them. So as the code is executing line by line, it is executing, it gets to the comment and skips it and continues executing. So as far as the compiler is concerned, the comment literally does not exist. In terms of syntax, they are really simple. You just write two forward slashes and then write whatever code you want. Like I said, this is not interpreted as any instruction or any code or anything. The compiler completely ignores all of this. So I could write some kind of valid code, but nope, this is not registered as code. As far as the compiler is concerned, this line over here does not exist. So you can make single line comments with two forward slashes, or you can make multi-line comments with a forward slash and any star. And then you end it with another star, another forward slash. So with this, anything you put anywhere inside of this, all of this is considered a comment. All of this is ignored by the compiler. Also, comments do not have to be just in their own line. You can write some regular code and then afterwards write some kind of comment. So yep, this is valid code. And alternatively, for this multi-line comment, you don't technically need to do it in multi-line. So you can just do open up that one and close it and write anything right inside there. Then also this comment, right after the forward slashes, anything afterwards is considered a comment, meaning that you can't actually make a comment before. So this does not work. The compiler is going to ignore all of this. It is not going to execute this instruction. So technically, if you absolutely need to do this, you would simply do the forward slash star, then close it. And yep, now this would indeed work. This is a comment ignored by the compiler. This is a normal instruction which would run another comment. Although you probably really don't want to do this, comments right before any kind of instruction, that just makes the code really hard to read. So whilst technically you can do this, you probably really shouldn't. With this, we can see how in technical terms, comments are really super simple to understand. There's a super simple syntax and then you can write whatever text you want. Now, the more important thing when it comes to comments is knowing what to comment. Something that beginners tend to do is pretty much just explain what the code is doing. So here's an example of some really bad comments. These are bad because they are completely useless. They are really just repeating what the code is doing. So by looking at the code, we can see we've got a variable with the name a being defined with type int. So this comment is completely useless. All of this just adds just some needless noise. And comments like this also have the problem that you might simply forget to update them. For example, if I update the codes over here, instead of incrementing by two, increment by one, and all of a sudden now this comment is completely wrong. So in general, the general rule is your comments should focus on the why and not the how. Meaning instead of saying what the code is doing line by line, Instead of that, you should write why you wrote that code, what problem it's trying to solve. Although at the same time, comments are actually something you should aim to avoid. What I mean by that is your code should have good names for your variables. Your functions and classes, all of that should have great names. So that just by reading their name, you should be able to understand what it's actually doing. That means that your code should ideally be self-documented. In many cases, if you find that your code has a whole bunch of comments, chances are that's a sign that you should refactor your code. For example, over here, if we were to rename this to use some terrible names, so I renamed the function just to say, let's rename this parameter to just p and this parameter to just h. Beginners might do this because for some reason, beginners like to make their parameters as small as possible. And then they might say, prints out a hello to a player, and then you need to clarify p, this one means the player name, and how A, this one means the age. So this is an example of comments that are technically not as useless as the ones up here, but at the same time, these are very clearly telling you that instead of having these comments, you should refactor this code in order to make the function, in order to make what this is doing much, much more understandable. You can just do a direct comparison between this and what we had previously. And obviously this version with no comments, this one is much easier to read, much easier to understand. That is why being able to come up with good names when writing good clean code, that is why that is so important. That's a very important topic and something that I'm going to cover in detail in a future lecture. So for now, when it comes to comments, I just want you to learn what comments are, how you can write them, and also to encourage you to avoid writing any useless comments. All right, so those are comments. And with that, by now we have already learned quite a lot about the absolute basis of programming. We are now ready to take it one step further and learn about some more complex types. 
We're going to learn about arrays and lists, so let's do that in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. In this lecture, we're going to learn about arrays and lists. This is how you can store multiple pieces of data together. Okay, so previously we covered the basic data types. For example, you've got int, bool, string, and so on. The variables are essentially just containers for data. And for example, if you make an int variable, then you can store some kind of int or whole number value. Like for example, the number 56, I can take it and I can indeed put it inside an int variable. However, when I want to store more than one number, so now let's say I want to store this one. Nope, that does not work. I can only store one value inside a single int variable. So so when you want to store multiple values, that is where arrays come in. You define an array of a certain type, like for example an int array. You give it some sort of size, which is going to be fixed. You define that size when you create the array. And that basically creates multiple boxes, multiple containers on which you can put any kind of data you want of that type. So for example, now on index 0, I can place this value. And on the next one, I can place this one. Then I can place this one and so on. So even like this, I can place multiple pieces of data on a single variable. One important thing about arrays are the indexes. Note how the array has a length of five, meaning it has five elements. But for these five elements, the first one is over here on index zero, then the second one is on index one and so on. So the positions in the array are always index based and they always start at zero. Using the index, we can individually either set or read values directly from the array. Okay, that's the theory. Now let's see the syntax. The way that we define an array is actually really simple. We define the data type as usual. So for example, let's say an int array where we want to store ints. So we define the data type and then open and close the square of braces. Important, it is this one. It is not parentheses is not curling braces. Nope, it is the square ones. So you do this and yep, that's it. This variable is now defined as an int array. Let's give it some kind of name like numbers array. So yep, this is our int array. And afterwards we can initialize the array. And for this, there are actually several ways to do it. If we want to initialize it with some elements, the simplest way we can do it is just open curly braces and inside put any kind of elements, like let's say a whole bunch of numbers. So if there you go, like this, we are initializing the array. Alternatively, you can be a little bit more explicit with the type creation. You can do new int array and then pass in all of the elements. Personally, for me, this is my preferred method. Like I said, I like my code to be as explicit as possible. So personally, I do like to be very explicit explicit with how I define the array, the exact type that I'm using. Or alternatively, you can simply create an array without any elements and just give it a certain size. Like this, there's an error, you have to give it a size. So for example, let's say with five, and there you go, this creates an array, the numbers array. This is an array with five elements. And like this, if you don't initialize to anything, then pretty much all of the elements will be initialized to zero. So speaking of the size, this actually brings up a very important topic about arrays. Their size is fixed, and after being created, the size cannot be changed. Over here, we are creating an array with size of 5, and that's it. That cannot change. If you want to check the size of the array, we can see that through the linked property. And the way we do that is first we access our variable, so that's the numbers array. And then we write a dot, and this dot basically means that we want to access something inside this variable, inside this variable type. And in this case, this variable is an array, so by typing dot, we are accessing all of the functions and properties that exist in the array type. So it's kind of similar to how previously we saw console.writeLine. Basically, writeLine, this is a function that exists inside the console class. That's what the dot means. It means we are accessing something on the symbol previously defined. Okay, so like this, we are accessing something on the array. And if we want to get the size of the array, for that, we can access the property for the link. So if we just do a console.writeLine on this one, just to see what this says, let's see. And if there it is, it says 5, which is exactly the size that we defined for our array. If we modify this to 3 and run, and yep, now it says 3. So the length, this is going to return the size of the array. Then another thing you are going to do quite a lot with arrays is simply accessing them to read an element on a certain index. And the way we do that is we simply write the array, so numbers array, and then we write the square brackets. And inside it, we put some index, like for example, let's say index zero. Again, remember how in C-sharp indexes start with zero. So the one on index zero is going to be the first element. The one on index one is the second element and so on. So you first let's initialize the array. So let's initialize it with something. Let's put a whole bunch of numbers. Okay, so we initialize with a bunch of numbers and now let's print out the one on index zero. So let's do a console.writeLine on that. And let's just get rid of this previous log. Okay, let's see. And if there you go, it does print out the number 56, which is indeed the very first element on this array. However, also something very important is that we actually initialize the array first. And like I said, we can initialize like this with some values, or we can simply omit this and simply initialize with a certain size. If we run this code, yep, we return zero. Basically, the array initialized everything to zero. However, if we don't do this, if we just find the array, then nope, here we have a compiler error. So we need to actually initialize the array before we can use it. And like I said, the arrays have a fixed size. So when accessing an index, that also becomes important. For example, if we try to access after the size, so for example, over here, we have three elements. If we try to access the one on index five, which does not exist, if we do this, 
Then here we get an index out of range exception. That is because the index, index five, that does not exist, that is outside the bound zero range. Same thing if we try to go the other way. So if we try to go minus three, if we do this, then yep, same thing, same error. Now, if we do want to change the size of the array, like for example, if we want to add another element to the array, like I said, that literally cannot be done. The size cannot change. So the only thing we can do is simply make yet another array, add it with one more element of space, and then copy all these elements on the new array and then add the new element. So you'd have to make all that logic manually if you wanted to add an element to this array. Or alternatively, for removing an element, once again, same thing, you cannot change the size, so you'd create a new array with one less length, and then copy the remaining elements onto that array. You can manually write that logic with the help of loops, which we're going to learn about in the next lecture. Or in order to add or remove elements to an array, you can simply use a different collection type, namely the list. The list is actually built on top of the arrays and basically has a bunch of helper functions to make it super easy to add or remove elements or do a bunch more things. And to use a list, first we write list and then we write the angle brackets so this is a less than sign then we write the data type that we want to store in the list like for example an int and then the closed angle brackets so the greater than sign again don't confuse the symbols make sure you are using these symbols like for example there is a double character it is not this one it is a single one the same one you use for mathematical comparisons now the technical term for what we have written here inside the angle brackets the technical term for this is a generic which we're going to cover later on in detail in the intermediate section for now just make sure you write this syntax exactly so with this we have defined the list of ints, so let's call it int list. Or actually, to keep it the same name, let's call it numbers list. Okay. And then to create our list, we have pretty much the same options we have for the array. We can do the font type declaration. So over here, put any kind of values. Yep, this is our list. However, on this one, we cannot initialize it just like this. This specific initializer only works for arrays. So for a list, we cannot use this one. But we also have the third option of simply initializing a list just like this. And here, note how I did not put any number inside the parentheses. Whereas over here, when defining a new int array, we have have to give it a size but for a list like i said lists don't have a fixed size they can grow and shrink so when creating a brand new one you don't have to give it a size although technically if we actually inspect this constructor we can see there is a version that does take a capacity now this is a more performance optimization thing if you know you're going to need a certain number of elements you can preset that capacity but in most cases and especially right now on this beginner section you can just ignore it just do it like this and don't create a brand new empty list so we have created our list and now we can do let's say the same thing that we did on the numbers array let's first print out how many elements are on this list it's pretty much the same thing we just access the same number of lists except right now on a list this one is actually not called length if we find length we can't find anything so it doesn't have that name in length it is instead called count for counting the number of elements in the list but in terms of logic it's really the same thing so it returns the amount of elements within that list so let's see we write line on this one and since we just created this one should return zero and if there it is this one does have zero okay great then like i said one of the big benefits of lists as opposed to arrays is we can very easily add or remove elements the way we do that is we just access the list and then use the add function and this one takes an item that we want to add so let's add the number 12 and if we do this and afterwards let's print out the right line on the numbers list dot count let's see this and if that one does indeed have one element and if we access the list on the zero index in order to see our first element and if we do see our list contains the number 12 okay great so just like this we can already see just how much better it is to work with lists as opposed to arrays with this there's no need to manually create a new array with the size plus one. We don't need to do that and copy all the data. Basically, all of that is handled automatically by the list. We just call add, or alternatively, we go inside the numbers list and we call remove. Either one of these and we'll either add or remove an element. Over here on the remove, the way this one works is you give it some kind of item. So in this case, the only element inside is the number 12. So if we call 12, this is going to remove the number 12. Or alternatively, there's another one. There's the remove at, which then takes an index. So if we do this and pass in the index zero, it is going to remove the element on index zero. And related to the add, there's also another one which is the insert basically the add that one is always going to add the new element to the end of that list Whereas with insert, over here, you can pass in an index where you want to insert that new element. Another super useful function in our list is for finding elements. Let's add some more elements just to test. So let's add 12, 0, and let's say 89. So we do this, and now let's say we want to find if the number 89 exists inside this list. If so, we can go through the list, and we can call the contains function. And like name implies, this one tests if it contains a certain element. So if we test for 89 and C, and it returns true because it does have that element. Whereas if we put some different number, and nope does not have that element. Another similar way to find elements within a list is to use the index of. This is basically going to return the index of an item if it finds it. So for example, the index of 89, this one is the third element on the list, so it should return two. And if there it is, it does have a two. 
or if we include something that is not found, so if we include something that does not exist. If so, then yep, when it doesn't find anything, it returns the index minus one. Since minus one is not a valid index, minus one usually means not found. And by the way, actually over here on the array, you can also do something similar to this. You can do an index of. However, it's a bit different, so it is not like this dot index of. This does not exist. There's no function called index of within the array. However, it actually exists as a static method. Again, don't worry what static means right now. I'll explain it in detail in a later lecture. But basically, we just need to access through the system.array. We access through that and we can do index of, and this one takes our array, so the numbers array, and then whatever we're trying to find, let's say we want to find the element one, two, three. And if we do a console.log on this, do a right line, let's see. And if that one does find it on index one, and if number one, two, three is over here indeed on index one. So as you can see, arrays and lists are really excellent, really very useful tools for handling multiple pieces of data. The technical term for these are collections. An array is a collection and a list is also a collection. There's a bunch more collection types for more advanced use cases. You have stacks, dictionaries, hash sets, and a bunch more. I cover all those in detail in the lecture in the intermediate section. For now, just knowing about arrays and lists, it is going to be more than enough. Whenever you need to store multiple pieces of data, you can use either one of these. In most cases, you probably want to use a list just because they are so easy to use. And when you need absolute maximum performance, for that, arrays can be quite useful. All right, so here we learned about something very useful, arrays and lists. You won't be using these a lot in your programming career. And now in the next lecture, we're going to learn about one of the core tools of just about any programming, which are loops. So let's learn that in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. In this lecture, we're going to learn one of the more fascinating and powerful features of any programming, loops. This is how we can run certain logic multiple times. Okay, so let's learn everything about loops. This is another really crucial core part of pretty much any programming. There are so many scenarios where loops are used. It can be a little bit tricky at first for beginners, especially since the code jumps a little bit, so do pay close attention. Normally the code runs from top to bottom, and when it comes to loops that is still true, although it also jumps and runs the same instructions multiple times. For example, if this loop over here was defined to run three times, if so, then it would run this line, then this line, then this line, and then instead of exiting and continuing down, it would jump back to the beginning and run this line again, this one again, jump back, run this one, this one, and then finally exit the loop. We're going to see how this is very useful, especially when combined with the arrays that we learned in the previous lecture. It's how you don't even have to know the size of the array in advance. You don't need to copy paste a whole bunch of code to iterate through each element. You can just write a loop that will jump through all the elements of the array, and then you can do whatever logic you want on each element. We're going to learn about these four loop types. So we've got while, do while, for, and a for each. Let's begin by learning the most basic loop possible, which is a simple while loop. This one simply has a condition, and it will basically execute the code inside the kernel braces while that condition is true. As soon as the condition becomes false, the code stops executing and jumps after. To write a while loop, it's really simple. We just write the keyword while, then we put some kind of condition inside parentheses, like for example, let's just put true, and then we put a code block with curly braces. All right, so that's it. Basically now with this, we are going to run the code inside this code block for as long as this condition is true. Now, what I've written here is actually something that usually you want to avoid. For the condition I just wrote true, and like I said, this code block will run for as long as the condition is true, which right now is forever, since true, this will never change by itself. So what we have here is an endless loop. If we try putting in a log here, console.write line, and we try to see what this does. And if there it is, the log is simply printing towards infinity, forever and ever until the end of time. So usually this is something you don't want to do. And by the way, quick tip over here, if you want to cancel this, you can either click on the X button over there or you can press Control C and that will automatically stop the code from executing. Okay, so here we made our while with an infinite loop. Now, sometimes this is actually desirable. Like for example, in a game engine, you do want your update code to run every single frame until the player quits the game. But right now we want a loop that actually ends. So for that, we just need some kind of condition that eventually becomes false. And the most basic one is just having some kind of counter. So before, let's just define a simple simple int i. By the way, usually when working with loops, the variable i is commonly used. It stands for the iterator variable. And usually we want to initialize this one at zero and not at one. Technically you don't have to, but usually you want to start things with zero. That comes back to what we covered with arrays on the previous lecture, how array indexes always start at zero. So for iterator variables, usually you do the same thing. Now over here, one very important thing is make sure you are defining the variable before the loop, meaning don't place this code inside of here. If you do, then you are basically always defining the variable with the same value. So every time the loop runs it is always going to have the same value it would never increment and the loop would never end so make sure you define this one outside of the loop so right before and over here instead of true let's cycle while i is under three and in order to make sure that this condition actually ends that it eventually becomes false because right now it is still infinite in order to do that at the end of our one loop let's simply increase our iterator by one so just i plus plus okay so that's it pretty simple let's see what this is doing over here let's just print out 
loop and then let's print out the i okay so let's see and if there it is loop 0 1 and 2 so yeah that is correct the code inside this code block is running while this condition is true and when we first run the iterate is going to be 0 so is 0 and 3 the answer is true so the first time it is going to execute this one and then this one which is going to increment the i into 1 then it goes back loops and tests the condition once again so now is 1 under 3 it's still yes so once again runs increases it Next loop is 2 under 3, still yes, so it still prints for the third time, but now it increases this one, increase the i to 3, so the next time goes is 3 lower than 3, the answer is no, 3 equals 3, so at that point it drops out of the loop and continues executing down here. Also by the way, what we just did here is actually a great tip for when you're confused about loops, just go through them in your head line by line to see exactly what things are doing, and of course always write some logs in order to remember what you're doing with your iterator variable. Like for example here, if you made the simple mistake of doing i minus minus instead of i plus plus, if you did that, yep there you go, the loop never ends, it's an endless loop again, or alternatively if you did increase but for some reason you forgot and you increased it just after the loop and yep once again still an endless loop it's constantly at zero so always pay very close to your conditions and how exactly you are eventually exiting that loop also let me mention another common mistake that beginners or really every programmer makes which is off by one errors meaning they think they're running a certain amount of times but it's actually running that many times plus one so usually the mistake is instead of doing for example lower than lower than or equal so let's say you wanted to run this three times but if you put less than equals if so, then yep, the loop actually runs four times. So always double check that your condition is correct exactly as you intended, so that the loop runs as many times as you actually think it does. Now, one really important thing about the one loop is how it tests the condition before going inside the loop. So for example, for the iterator variable, if instead of initializing on zero, let's initialize it on five, which is immediately going to have false on this one. So let's see if our code prints anything to the console. And nope, the answer is it does not. If this condition is false right away, then the code inside the loop never runs, not even once. So related to that, let's see the other similar loop, the do while. This one is very similar to the while loop. The only difference is really when the condition is tested. So for this one, first we write the keyword do, and then we open and close our curly braces. So we have our code block, and then we have the while, and then in parentheses, our condition. So let's put the same condition, i under three. So yep, just like this, and let's do a console.write line, do while loop. And let's print out the iterator variable and inside the loop again, always remember to increase your iterator variable. Okay, so here we can directly compare, is this one going to run, the one inside the while, which we already saw is not going to run. And then let's see if this one does run, let's test. And yep, there's the result. So the regular while loop, this one did not run, not even once. But the do while, even though this condition is always false, even on the first iteration it is already going to be false, despite that it is still going to run the code block inside the loop at least once. So that's the difference between these two loop types. This one tests in the very beginning, so it might not even run once. Whereas this one tests the condition at the end, so it is guaranteed that the code inside of here is always going to run at least once. And if we put the i back into zero, and then remember to reset it on this one. And if there it is, both of them behave similarly. Both them run three times. Okay, so while and do while, these are the most basic loops. You just have a condition and then you do something while that condition is true. But another one that you're probably going to use most of the time is the for loop. This one can sometimes look complex for beginners, so definitely pay close attention. This one is split into three parts. The first part is the initializer. So here, usually we initialize some kind of iterator variable. Then we have the condition, so same thing. It is going to continue running while this one is true. And finally, we have the incrementer. So usually over here, you increase the iterator variable by one. So let's see the syntax. Let's just comment this out and let's go up here and write our four. So first we begin by writing the keyword four and then let's open and close the parentheses. And now in here the for loop has three components and they are split by a semicolon. So the first component is going to be where we're going to initialize our iterator variable. Like I said the very common thing is usually just define an int, name it i, and initialize it on zero. Okay. So then we do a semicolon and then we can write the second component. The second one is going to be the condition. So let's put the same thing we had in our OI. So I under three and yet again, another semicolon. And now we have the third component. This is going to be the incrementer. So here, usually you want to increase the iterator variable by one. So I plus plus. Yep, so just like this, we have our three components. Then we just have our regular code block. And now over here, we can do whatever we want, like the right line for the for loop and print out the iterator variable. All right, so let's test. And yep, once again, the same result. It runs the code inside the loop three times. Now let's go through this piece by piece to see exactly how the code is executing. So basically, when the code gets to this line over here, when it does, the first thing it's going to run is this part over here, which is going to initialize the iterator variable. Right after that, it is going to test for the condition. So very much like the one loop, meaning if it is false, it is going to skip it entirely. But if it is true, then the next thing it goes is it 
goes inside the for loop and runs all of the code inside the code block. And then after running the entire code block, after that, it runs the third component, which is going to increment the iterator variable. And after doing that, then it jumps back and tests for the condition once again. Then again, keeps doing the same thing. If it's true, continue running this one and then jump back to the iterator, test again and so on until finally it becomes false and then it jumps outside. Basically the one great benefit for the for loop as opposed to something like a while or a do while. The one big benefit is how it makes it much easier to handle the iterator variable. Although I should also note that while this does help handle the iterator variable a bit more easily, the same issues that we had with infinite loops, those can also occur here. So for example, if for the iterator instead of doing i++, plus plus, you do i minus minus, then yep, this one now becomes an infinite loop. Or if you put i++, plus plus, but then over here for some reason you put some condition that is always true, then once again this is also going to be an infinite loop. So really the potential for an infinite loop that is always there regardless of what loop type you're using. But generally since the for loop, since that one at least forces you to use an iterator variable and increment it, for that it should help avoid those unwanted infinite loops. And also remember what we covered on the lecture on scope, the iterator variable over here, the int i, this one is being defined in this special place inside the for loop, and doing it like that makes it a local variable, specifically local to this for loop. So we can access it in here, so here we are printing it. But if we try accessing out here, then nope, this does not happen. This variable only exists inside the code block inside the for loop. So after ending the loop, this variable no longer exists. Whereas, for example, over here on the while, on this one, we define the int iterator outside of the while. So after the while, we can still do anything we want with that variable. This is actually usually something you don't want to do, so that's another reason why the for loop is one of the most useful ones. Now, the for loop can be used for running some code a certain number of times, or something very useful is when used with what we covered in the last lecture, arrays or lists. So here let's define a string array for the name array and let's just create a new string array. All right, so here we have a nice array of various strings. And now if we want to cycle through this array, then a for loop is one of the great ways to do it. We use the usual iterator variable, we increment by one, and then over here for the condition, we want to iterate through the array for as long as we have elements. So for that, we can check if i is under and then go inside the name array and access the array's length. This property is going to contain the number of elements inside the array. And once again, don't make the mistake of the one off by one errors. So over here, make sure it's always less than the length and not less than equals because this length for example this one is going to return four we have four elements but again remember how the indexes start at zero so this is index zero one two and three so there is nothing on index four and if you put it less than an equals then the final one is going to be on i of four and on i of four would give an array because nothing exists on index of four so always pay attention to that very common error and now with this we can just print out just this name so let's just go inside the name array and access on the i index yep like this let's test and if there it is, we are printing all the elements in our array. All right, awesome. Also, one quick note, to cycle through a list is pretty much the same thing. So here, if we make this a list of string instead of an array, so a list of string, let's do it like this and initialize our list. And the only difference is like we saw in the previous one, instead of the list calling length, it is called count. So yep, just like this, and yep, the code is running the same way. Okay, so this is great. This is how you can cycle through all the elements in an array or a list. However, there's actually an even simpler method specifically designed for lists and arrays. Instead of a for in handling the iterator variable ourselves, instead of that, we have the for each. And for this one, we define an iterator, which in this one, instead of being an index, it is actually going to be an iterator of the type that contains our collection elements. We have an iterator in some kind of collection. So basically this one helps us automatically handle all that cycling logic without is keeping need of some kind of index. Doing it for each is really simple. We just write for each and then over here we write the name for our iterator variable. However, this time again it is not an index so we're not going to use an int. We're going to use whatever type we're cycling. So in this case we're cycling through an array of strings. So for each string then give it some kind of name. So in this case let's call it name then the keyword in and then the name array. And yep now here we can just do console.write line and just print out this name variable. Let's see what it does. And yep basically the same thing. So the for and the for range work the same way. Basically over here this is going to loop as many times as we have elements in our array and every time it loops the for each itself is going to handle updating this name variable over here. So when this runs the very first time it is going to assign code monkey to that name then the second time it runs it assigns Iron Man and so on. So it basically handles updating everything updating the iterator variable without you needing to keep track of indexes or anything like that. Now technically I should also say that the for each this one works with anything that is enumerable like any collection. It works with arrays it works with 
with Melissa and a bunch more. I cover more collection types and how to make your own custom types innumerable in a lecture in the intermediate section. Here is the demo for this lecture. This is kind of like a mini RTS game. So I've got a list of all my units and over here are the various units in the world. Here in the code, the units are simply a list of units. And then I have the simple code that just has when the player presses the left mouse button. When it does, then does a for each through the entire unit list and tells each unit to go to that target position. So with all the units inside the list, if I click, if there you go, they all move straight towards the target. And now by using the exact same code, if I modify the list and remove all kinds of units, so let's remove a bunch of them and leave just one unit. If I do that and now I click, and if there you go, the same logic is now moving just one unit. So this is a great practical example of how useful loops are, and specifically the for each loop. You can write some kind of logic that applies to some kind of list, and that logic will work regardless of how many elements are on that list. Also a note, it is perfectly fine to do a for each or even a for on a list or array with no elements. So if we erase this so that it's pretty much just an empty array, and if there you go, everything still runs, there's no errors. Basically over here, if the length is zero, then zero under zero, that is already false, so it's going to skip it. And over here on the for each, if the array is empty, then it's also going to skip it. So these are the main four loops. While is the simplest one, but personally, I never really use it, and same thing for the do while. I very, very rarely use these two. Then down here, the for, this one is extremely useful in tons of scenarios. And the for each, this one is perfect for doing any kind of logic on lists or array. All right. Alright, so that's loops. It's another really important core component of programming, so definitely make sure you fully understood everything in this lecture before moving on. Next, we're going to learn one of the core pillars of object-oriented programming, which are classes, so let's learn that in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. In this lecture, we're going to learn about classes, what they are, how we define them, how we create objects of a type of class, and what we can do with them. All right, so let's learn about classes. This is one of the core concepts about C Sharp and other object-oriented languages. A class is really just a type. For example, the list that we saw a while ago, the list type is a class, and an object is simply an instance of that type. So in any of those object-oriented languages, you define an object type, meaning some kind of class, and then create individual instances or objects of that type. For example, we can define a class named player and inside of it we can define a field for a string name and an int health and then we can create two instances of that class and on this one let's say we set the name equals code monkey on this one name equals iron man so importantly note how each instance of this type each instance is completely separate the class defines the structure of the type but then the instances that are created from that type each of those has their own memory with whatever that is inside those fields so the class definition is kind of like a blueprint and using that blueprint to then create different objects so here here we are in our code, let's begin by defining our class. And again, it's very important where you write the code. For example, you cannot start writing a class directly here inside a function. This throws an error because we cannot define a class directly inside a function. So make sure you are writing outside the function. And now we can either write inside the program class or we can make it separately. Either one works. In this case, let's make it inside the program code block. So right in here, if you write inside the program class code block, if so, then we're basically making a nested class, which in this case is perfectly fine. So let's do this. We start writing the keyword class and then the name of our class let's say we're defining a player and then open and close our curly braces all right so this is it just with this we have already defined our class which like i said a class is really just a type so it's similar to like an int or something so up here usually we've seen define for example an int for the age and over here we can define our custom player type player and if there it is just like this this works perfectly note how the color over here is different that is because this one is correctly identifying the player type and again if you're seeing compiler errors once again the likely culprit is due to being case sensitive so here, if instead of player, I just write player, this is an error. There is nothing named player with P on lowercase. So always remember that code is case sensitive. And of course, just to clarify, the name over here can be whatever you want. It doesn't have to be named player. The name of the class can be whatever you want. And the name of the variable that you create from that class, that can also be whatever you want. So with this, we have defined a variable of our custom type. However, we just defined it. We didn't actually initialize it just yet. If we try doing a console.write line, then here, nope, we have an error. We cannot do this. So it's the same thing as if we try printing the age we also cannot do it we need to first initialize it now in order to initialize it usually for something like an int for this you can usually just assign a value and yep this works but our custom type isn't a number like i said it's some kind of object so to initialize we need to create our object and the way we do that is with a new keyword so pretty much exactly like we saw with the list so we just do new and then our type so in this case it's called player and then just add the parentheses so open and close and yep, just like this. And if we do a log on our player variable, let's see. And yep, it does say it does print log and it pretty much prints the type. And the type is inside CodeMonkey C Sharp course dot program inside the program class. And then it's finally called player. So yep, we have indeed created a new player object and we assigned it to this player field. 
So here we have created an instance of our type. And now you might be hearing me say that word, instance, without fully understanding what I mean by that. So what I mean goes back to the idea of the class definition being some kind of blueprint. And then when we do new player, we are essentially creating a new object of our type. So we're using that blueprint to create an instance of that type, meaning that we can create as many instances as we want. Like for example, let's rename this one to the code monkey player. And then let's make another one, another one of type player. Let's call it Iron Man player. And let's also do new player. And yep, just like this, we have two completely separate objects that both share the same class. So both both were made from the same blueprint, but each of these two objects is our completely separate object. If you want to, you can actually verify this. So let's print out the code monkey player and then let's print out the get hash code. This is a default built in C sharp function that every object has by default. It basically returns a hash code for that object. So we can print this one out and then print out the one for the Iron Man player. So Iron Man player dot get hash code. We can print this. And yep, we can see our two objects are indeed two different objects since they have different hashes. So this part is really important for you to understand. The type definition itself is kind of like a blueprint and then we use that blueprint to create instances of that type each instance is different and each instance has their own memory and their own fields their own values and so on okay so now that we've seen the absolute basics defining a class and creating an instance of it let's see what else we can do one of the main things is actually what we're already doing over here when creating a brand new player this kind of looks like we're calling a function and it kind of is now technically this isn't a function this is what is called a constructor which is basically what constructs an object of our type by default any class that you define it will automatically have a constructor just like this so one with zero parameters but if you want you can also explicitly define it you just write the exact same name as the class so in this case player and then open the parentheses and then we can add whatever parameters we want or none so let's just close the parentheses and then just write a code block all right so yep this is a constructor and over here you can write whatever logic you want now again it's very very important that the name perfectly matches the class name if it does not match there won't be an error if it does not match and this assumes we're just defining a regular function and requires a return type in order to define a constructor which again is a kind of like a special function for that one it has to be named exactly the same name as the class okay so here we have our constructor and here we can pretty much build whatever logic we want that is going to be run whenever the player is created up here for example we can add a console dot right line and over here let's just say creating player okay great like this except we are actually seeing some errors over here it says that player is inaccessible due to its protection level now this has to do with access modifiers which is a topic that i'm going to cover in a few lectures for now let's not worry too much about it just know that over here on the player constructor over here before it, we need to add the keyword public so it has to be like this public player and then the parentheses so make sure you write that and there are no errors now and if we test and if there it is we can see we are indeed creating two players all right awesome now another thing we can do is define functions inside of our class and we define them just like we already saw the only difference is right now we actually don't need to mark it as static i won't cover what static means in detail in the next lecture but for now just know that if you're writing a function directly inside the program that you call it from main for that you need to mark it as static because main itself is marked as static but down here when working with our class over here we don't need to mark it as static so for example let's define some kind of function let's return nothing so void and let's call it say hello and over here pretty simple we just do a console.write line and just print out hello okay great so with this our custom type now has a function as to how we're going to call this well up here we have an instance of our player class so we created our object we can simply access that object and then press on dot which again the dot means that we are accessing something inside the previous symbol so we're accessing something inside the code monkey player which is of the player type and now we can call our function except actually right now we can't again it's the same thing that I mentioned a while ago it has to do with the access modifiers that I'm going to cover in detail in a few lectures so again for now in order to make this testing work let's just make sure to mark this one as public so public void say hello and now if we go up here and press on dot yep we do see our say hello function and now we can call it just like we call any other function yep just like this now, importantly, is we are going through an instance of our object, so we're not going through the object class itself, but rather an instance of it. If instead you do write the class name, so you do player dot say hello, then oh, this is an error, this does not work. To call this function, we want to call it through the actual object that is created of the player type. And now at this point, perhaps you might be noticing that, for example, over here, the console now right line, this one is different. For this one, we are not actually creating a console object. We simply access the function, the right line function, directly through the console class. And again, that has to do with 
that egg, which I'm going to cover in detail later on. So for now, just make sure that the say hello function, this one is not marked as static. And up here, make sure we are calling say hello on the created code monkey player. Okay, so with this, if we test, and if there it is, creating the player and then calls hello. Okay, great. Here we can see we are running a custom function inside of our custom type. So since we can define functions, another thing we can do is also define some class variables. And for that, we write them inside the class block. So not inside a function, we don't want to create a local variable. We want to define a class variable. So let's go up here just before the constructor. Let's define a variable like, for example, string name. And if we want, we can even give it a default value. So let's say code monkey. Okay, great. So here we have defined a name variable. And now if you remember from the scope lecture, from that one, basically anything that we define in a code block, like a variable over here defined inside the class code block, that means we can access this variable inside any of these nested code blocks. So for example, over here inside the hello function, over here, let's print out, so let's use the string interpolation method and let's print out the player name. Okay, so like this, let's see. And yep, it does say hello code monkey. Okay, great, so far so good. Now, by the way, I'm calling this a class variable or member variables, but sometimes I use the term field. Again, it's another example of interchangeable names. Technically, the more correct name for this is actually a field. The word variable is more used for when it's a local variable defined inside a function, but those terms are pretty interchangeable. So if you show someone this code and you call this a variable, they will understand what you mean. Okay, so here we have defined a class variable or a field. And now like we saw up here, we can access our object and call this function, and we can access this field in the same way. However, again, the same thing in order for that to work, we need to mark this field also has public, so we can access it from up here. So over here, we can go through the code monkey player and access the name and I can set it to something I can read it or modify it so for example for this one let's set it to code monkey and then for this other player down here for the Iron Man player let's set it to Iron Man and then let's call the say hello function on this one okay so let's test and see what this does and if there it is, creating player, then says hello code monkey, creating the second player, and says hello Iron Man. So here we are creating objects, modifying values inside of it, and also calling some functions. With this, we can also go back and see exactly what I covered in the diagram in the beginning on how the objects that we create, these are essentially objects that are separate from one another. They are created from the same blueprint class, but each of them are different. Each of them can have different values. That is why over here we are creating two instances of our player type, and then on one of them we are setting the name to code monkey, the other one to Iron Man, and that works because they are completely separate objects, each with their own data. So when over here we are modifying the name inside the Ironman player, we are only modifying the name inside this specific object, meaning it does not modify the name on the code monkey and does not modify the name on any other player object we have. When we modify this, we are only modifying this data on this object. This is another really crucial thing to understand how each object, each instance of a class, each of those has its own data stored in memory. Okay, so we've already learned quite a lot about functions, fields, and constructors. Another thing we can do over here on the constructor is we can define some parameters. So pretty much like we would for a function. For example, let's say we receive a parameter for the string name. Then over here, let's print out the name. So creating player and then pass in that name. Okay, like this. And now up here when constructing our players. For this one, let's pass in code monkey. And for this other one, let's pass in Iron Man. And for now, let's just get rid of this other code. So let's just leave those two. So just doing this, just constructing a code monkey player and an Iron Man player. And yeah, it works creating each of them. Okay, good. So now here's an interesting scenario. Let's say we want to define the name over here on the constructor and then we want to update this field and then we want to use that field down here right now that is actually not going to work so let's put the default name to something else let's put it just a dash just to make sure that it isn't updating on the first one let's test let's just go here code monkey player and let's call say hello and same thing on the ironman.say hello. And yep, look at that. So it does create the player and does receive the code monkey string, but then when saying hello, it just has the default dash. That is because even though we called all of these, we call them all name, even though these are actually two separate symbols, when we receive the name over here as a parameter in the constructor, this parameter over here is just a local variable. By itself, this parameter has no connection to this variable. Even though the name is exactly the same, that still does not mean that they have any connection. We need to explicitly define that connection. Also, by the way, here's a quick tip on Visual Studio, if you just place the cursor on top of a symbol, it automatically highlights all instances of that symbol. So note, however, here it is highlighting this one and this one and does not highlight this one and this one. That is a clue that these are two completely separate symbols, even though they do have the same name. If we click on this one, yep, it does highlight this one and this one, but not these two. So these are completely disconnected pieces of data. In order to connect them, basically, we just need to assign this variable to the one that we receive here. So over here, you might think to write name equals name with the assumption that the first name is going to refer to this one and the second one is going to return this one. But nope, this doesn't really work. We have a green squiggle line if, and if we put it inside, assignment made to the same variable. So here, once again, we can use the cursor trick in order to see, yep, here we are referencing the same symbol. We have no reference to this one itself. So one option that we 
we have here is choose a different name. Sometimes people like to solve this problem by adding an underscore on all their parameters. So you could add an underscore here, then one here, and one here. And doing so, yep, now this works. So now these three instances are instances of this symbol. But if we select that one, yep, now that one is that one. And if we run this code, and yep, now it does work, creates a player and says hello with the correct name. So this works, this is one option. You can simply define your parameter names to have different names from your class variables. Or another alternative method, the one that I actually prefer, is to write the exact same name. So over here, let's name this one exactly the same, name, name, and also this one, also name. But here we have the problem, we're always accessing the same thing. So the way we change that, the way we access this field specifically, the way we do that is with the keyword this. This is a special keyword that, like name implies, refers to this object. It refers to the object itself where the code is running on. So by using this, we can essentially reference this object, and doing that, we can reference this class variable. Again, we can put the cursor over in order to highlight, and even now we do see these three are referencing this symbol, and these three are referencing this symbol. And if we run this, and if now this work creates both players and correctly assigns their name. So once again, we have two separate instances of our player class, each with their own data and each with their own name. We are setting that data through the constructor itself, and then we are using that data in some kind of function. Okay, great. So here we learned about classes. This is one of the core building blocks of any object-oriented language like C-sharp. This is yet another topic that you must make sure you fully understand. Rewatch this lecture if you need to. Classes are one of those things you are going to use a ton through your programming career, so definitely make sure you fully understand it. Now, in this lecture, I briefly mentioned two things, access modifiers and static. So let's finally learn about those, beginning with static in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. In this lecture, we're finally going to learn what is the static keyword and what does it do. Okay, so since the very beginning, we've been working with this default code. In the beginning, I told him to just ignore the static over here. But now, since we have already learned what are classes, now we can finally start to learn what is static. In the previous video, we wrote this code, and I told you to make sure not to write static inside any of this, either the field or the function. What it means is when you define something as static, when you do that, you are making that belong to the class itself as opposed to any instance of that class. So if you make something static, like a static score field, if you do that, then now that symbol, that score, that only exists on the class itself and does not exist as a separate copy for each individual object you create of that type. So here, when we made our custom class, we wanted this function and this field, we wanted that to belong to each instance of that class. We wanted that as opposed to belonging to the class itself. So that is why we made these intentionally non-static. And by doing that, we made it so that up here, in order to call this function, we need to call the function on some kind of instance of our type. So that is why we need to create a code monkey player in order to call the say hello. And if we try doing player dot say hello, Nope, this does not work. This is an error. Because we marked this as non-static means that we need an instance of our type in order to call this function. And it's the same thing for the console.write line that we've been using. For this one, we can inspect this function. So we can right click in here and then let's go into this one, go to definition. And if you do that, yep, it opens up this window, which basically shows the code inside the write line function. And over here, we can see this function is indeed marked as static. That is why when we use it, we use it through the console class itself, meaning we never do a new console. And then using that console, we call write line. We don't do that. That. Since that one is marked as static, we access the console class itself and then call the function directly on the class itself. So static means this belongs to the class itself and not any instance of that class. As to when would you use this, one example is over here on the console. It's super easy to just write console.write line and write something to the console. It is much easier as opposed to having to create a new console object, having to keep track of that object in order to call the function. We just access the function directly and makes it super easy to use. And then it can make sense if you have some kind of behavior or some kind of data that you want to belong to the class itself and not all the instances of that class. Like for example, if you have some kind of score that is meant to be shared between all the other other objects. If so, then it might make sense to define that in class. That way we have just one score field that is shared between all the various players. In order to make something static, it's really simple. We just have the static keyword. Like for example, over here on the say hello function, let's mark this as static. However, in doing so, we can already see two errors. There's one over here on the name and one up here on our players. So let's actually for now just comment out this code and let's just do player dot say hello. Yep, now this one does work because that function is now marked as static. But now the error down here on the name, like it says here, an object's reference is required for a non-static field. Object reference is really just another word for object instance. This basically means that we cannot access non-static fields whilst inside a static function. That is because again, static means that it belongs to the class itself and not any instance. So since this function does not belong to any instance, naturally we cannot access any instance variables. That is also why quite a while ago on the variables lecture, when we were creating some class variables up here, I said that if 
you want to query the variable that you want to access inside main, you need to mark it as static. If we just make an int age over here and over here try to access age equals something and over here try to access age equals something. Nope, this does not work. We cannot access it. In order to make it work, this needs to be static because main is static. So once inside a static function, we can only access static fields. In order to make our code work here, we can really just mark this one as static with the obvious side effect, which is like I said, this field now belongs to the class itself. So with this, we could not have multiple players, each with different names. By doing this, there's pretty much just one name field, regardless of how many player instances we have. And by adding static over here, we created yet another error right here. And once again, it has to do with this keyword, which like I said, this one refers to the object that this code is running on. But once again, this one is a static field, meaning it does not belong to any instance. So we cannot access it through a this, which refers to a specific instance. And if we remove this, then we have the exact same problem we had, which is all of these are referring to the same symbol. So we want to access this one. And as to how we access a static field, if we can't do it through this, the answer is we access it through the class name. So we're here player.name. And once again, put the cursor over in order to highlight. And yep, now it is correctly referencing these two. Okay, so we have no more errors. Now let's see what this is doing. So first let's call player.hello. And then let's create the new code monkey player. And let's print player.say hello again. And then let's create an Iron Man player. And now let's print say hello again. Now, if you want a quick challenge, try to pause the video right now and try to guess what all of this is going to print on the console. So which name is going to be printed over here on this function call, which one on this one and which one on this one. So if you want, pause the video right now and try to give that a go, try to get a guess. Over here, let's run the code and see what this says. And yep, it says hello nothing, then hello code monkey, and finally hello Iron Man. Here we can clearly see how static data belongs to the class itself and not any instance of that class. Basically, the first time we say hello, the name is going to default to a dash, so that is why it prints dash. Then we create code monkey. And when creating that object, that individual instance of that object is going to access the global name field that is inside the player class. So the static field. So we're going to update that one from dash into code monkey. That is why it prints that. And finally create an Iron Man. And again, same thing that is going to modify and update and override the name. So the name no longer says code monkey by the end. It only says Iron Man. The important takeaway here is that even though we are creating two instances of that object, since over here we are accessing a static field, remember the static field belongs to the class itself so we have just one of these even though we have two instances of our player. Now it might seem like I'm repeating myself a little bit too much in this lecture but this really is a crucial thing to understand. The difference between making a field static or non-static, the difference between how many instances of a field you have, this is really crucial to fully understand so you don't get confused. If it's static you have just one field that is shared between all the classes and if it's non-static then each instance of that type will have its own field. Like back here in the diagram we define a static in score and this one is basically shared between all the other objects. But then we have a non-static string name and int health, and each object has their own copy, has their own data within that field. Now, we already saw how we cannot access a non-static field from a static function, but the opposite is valid. So here on say hello, if I remove the static to make this a non-static function, and if there is no error down here, whilst on a non-static function, we can indeed access static fields. Although again, remember how a static field, this one belongs to the class itself, and there's really only one field that is shared between all instances of that class. So for example, up here, let's create a new Iron Man code monkey. So let's actually uncomment this code up here. For example, let's create the new code monkey player. Then let's create an Iron Man player. And then let's print hello on the code monkey player itself. So once again, if you want a mini challenge, try pausing the video right now and try to guess what this one will say. And if we test, and yep, look at that. It says hello Iron Man, even though we are calling the say hello on the code monkey player object. And the reason is once again, because this field is static. So when we create the new Iron Man, that one is updating that static field to just say Iron Man. So down here, when we access static field, we are accessing the only field that exists with Within the entire class. Now let's just learn one more tiny thing about static, which is how you can mark the class itself as static. So here you can write static class. And basically by doing this, the compiler forces you to make everything inside that class as static. So we cannot have a regular instance of our player constructor. We cannot have this and we cannot have a non-static function. It needs to be marked as static. So just like this. So this can be helpful. For example, when you want to make sure that everything is static, if there's some kind of class, like for example, the console here, if we once again, right click and go to the definition, we can see, yep, the console is marked as static. You are never ever intend to create a new object of type console that is never supposed to happen. Everything inside this console class, all of this should be static. All the functions, all the fields, all of this should be static and used as static. So in order to enforce that, you can just add the static keyword and basically the compiler will force you to make everything within that class marked as static. So when you want that, add static. 
But when you want to mix between static and non-static, then just don't add it and simply add static to the things that you do want to make static. All right, so that's static. Now, if you're a beginner and you're slightly confused, go ahead and watch this lecture again. Learning the difference between static and non-static is really important. You need to fully understand the difference between what belongs to an object and what belongs to a class itself. Next, let's learn about access modifiers. This is something that is extremely important in order to write good clean code. So let's learn that in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. In this lecture, we're going to learn all about access modifiers, specifically private and public, learn what they do and just how important they are. Okay, so access modifiers. Like the name implies, it controls what kind of access we have with something. We've already seen them a little bit. A while ago, when we defined these functions inside our class, I told you that you need to make this public. This is the access modifier. In general, you have two access modifiers. You have public and private. Now, technically there are more. There's also protected and there's also internal and a bunch more. So technically there are more, but most cases, you will only be using either private or public. Now here, I told you to make this public because if we don't define the access modifier, if we just do this, just like this, then up here we can see our function has an error. It is saying the say hello function is inaccessible due to its protection level. That is because if we don't specifically say public, if we omit the access modifier, then this one basically defaults to private. So if we write nothing, it's the same thing as if we explicitly write private. And like the error says, we cannot call the function because we have no access, it is private. When we make something private, it is only accessible to that class and nothing else. So up here, we cannot call the say hello function, but for example, over here inside any code inside of the player class, over here, we can call say hello and yep, this one works perfectly. So by making something private, it means it can only be accessed by that class where it's been defined. And what I'm saying here applies to functions, but also to fields. For example, if this one is public, then up here on the main, we can access ironmanplayer.name and we can set it to something. So this works, this is valid code. However, again, if we omit this, which again is going to default into private. If so, then yep, now this one is inaccessible. If we do want this field or this function to be accessible from outside, then we do need to mark them as public. So public string and over here, public void. Now, if you're a beginner, you might be thinking this is just adding needless confusion to the code. You might be thinking, why wouldn't you just make everything public so you can access everything from everywhere? And that is one of those questions that is perfectly reasonable for a beginner to ask. And as you grow your skills, you will actually see just how valuable this is. The next two lectures are going to be on the theory behind how and why to write good clean code. And one of the main clean code principles is simply to limit access. The reason why public and private exists, the reason for this is all about helping you manage complexity. And the best way to manage complexity is to limit accessibility. So access modifiers are really extremely important. Like I said, I'm going to cover this topic in much more detail in the next few lectures. For now, just know these are extremely important. And as a general rule, you should always default to making everything private and only make it public when you have a very good reason to do it. So by default, we should define all of these as private. So this one is private, this one make it private, and the public string make it private. Yep, so by default, we should start writing our code like this. And then for each piece of code we write, we should be able to ask ourselves, okay, does this need to be public? And if so, like for example, over here, we do intentionally want to create some player objects. So we do want this one to be public. Then for the function, we also want this code up here to be able to call the function. So this one should be public. However, for the name field, this one is meant to be an internal piece of data that is only used by this class. So this one should be marked as private. And out here, we should not have access to that field. So as general rule, just follow that basic guideline, default to making everything private and only make it public if you absolutely need to. If you just follow that one very simple rule, you will write much better, much more high quality code. And like we saw, technically we don't need to write the access modifier. If you want it private, you can just omit it. And this is going to default to private. However, personally, I like being as explicit as possible. So even though technically you don't have to write it, personally, I always write it every time. I want to be very, very clear that I want this to be private. I don't want to have to remember what are the defaults because actually defaults default to different things depending on what code you're working on. There is a great guide on the C Sharp docs that goes into this topic in a lot more detail. So you can see all of the various access modifiers and from where you can call some kind of thing or access some kind of variable. And then down here, if we scroll down, we can see, yep, the default access summary table. And you can see how for some things, if we omit it, it defaults to private, but for other things, it defaults to public and for others, defaults to internal. I'm going to cover all of this in detail in future lectures, interface, structs, enums, and so on. Since the default actually defaults to various different things, depending on what type we're working with, that is yet another reason why I really believe you should be as extremely explicit as possible. So over here, do not just omit this. Let's write it properly private. And now that I've taught you what are access modifiers, I can finally explicitly define them over here on this code. Honestly, this is something that has been driving me crazy throughout this whole course. I didn't want to use them until I explained them. I really don't like how this default code is set up, but now that you know what they are, now I can finally refactor this code. Over here for the player class, this one is only going to be used inside the program class. So let's make it as private. Again, by defining this one as private means that we can use it inside of anything within this program class code block. Then for main, 
main. Let's also default this to private. This is our main entry point for our code. So we don't want any other code calling this function. And then for our program class, instead of making it internal, let's make it public. Public because in this case, this one is a global class inside this namespace. And if we try making this as private, then nope, this actually throws an error. Basically elements defined in a namespace itself. These need to be either internal or public. So let's put it as public. Okay, so now the code is much more explicit. Everything is much more clear. We can know for certain that the main is only going to be the entry point and is never going to be called from anywhere else. We can see that this player class is only going to be used inside the program class. And within the player class, we can see that the constructor is meant to be accessible from outside. This function also accessible outside, but this name field, this one is meant to be only used by this class. Okay, so with that, we have learned about the basic access modifiers. And this pretty much concludes the absolute basics. So now, like I said, in the next few lectures, let's learn a little bit more on the theory behind how to write good clean code starting with one of the most important guidelines for that, which is naming rules. So let's learn that in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. In this lecture, we're going to learn something extremely important. Let's learn about naming rules. This is a very, very important lecture that you should definitely refer back to whenever you have any questions. Following good naming rules is something that will make you a 10 times better programmer. So first, what exactly are naming rules? These are really just the rules you define and then follow while writing your code. It is extremely, extremely important that you are consistent in applying your rules. You don't want one class in your projects to be written a certain way and a different class using a completely different naming scheme. That would create a ton of confusion, make it really hard to read the code. So naming rules and writing code correctly is very, very important. One mistake that I see a lot of beginners do is they send me some code and ask why it's not working. Then I take a quick look and see all the code written in a very messy way. Some functions are in lowercase, others using snake case. Some fields are in Pascal case, some in camel case. Always remember, code is case sensitive. So it is really extremely important that you write the code correctly. If you change a character from lowercase to uppercase, then you are suddenly referring to something completely different. If you are a beginner, always keep that in mind. Code is case sensitive, so don't just write code semi-randomly, write it properly as if you were doing some kind of English test. Now with that said, when it comes to naming rules, you can use whatever rules you want. Different people like different rules. For example, some people like to use a prefix in variables. They like to add an underscore or m underscore. Or other people like to use a postfix. Some people like capitals for constants, camel case for properties, thin case for fields. Which by the way, here are the definitions for those terms. Pascal case, this one starts with a capital letter and then it is lowercase and then a capital for every word afterwards. Then camel case, this one also has a capital for every second word, but the first one is lowercase. And finally, snake case. For this one, you just use an underscore to separate the various words. These are usually the various ways you have of naming some kind of symbol. And like I said, the specific rules you follow don't necessarily matter. Every rule can be valid. The most important thing is just that you are consistent in always following through your rules. So define some kind of code style and always stick with it. For me, here are the rules that I follow and the code style that I use. For function names, I like to use Pascal case. This is also the C-sharp standard. So always capitalize the first letter of every word. Then for the function parameters, for that I use camel case. So it starts lowercase and then uppercase after every word. Then for properties, this is something that I'm coming to cover in detail in the intermediate section. For these, I use Pascal case. For constants, again, not a thing I cover in the intermediate. For this one, normally use uppercase snake case. So everything is uppercase and use a little underscore to separate the words. Events are in Pascal case. And then fields, these are in camel case. Then another one of my personal rules is something that I mentioned in the beginning lectures, which is the position for the opening of the curly braces. Now, personally, I do like opening it on the same line, but some people prefer to place the opening on new line. I know some people have some really strong opinions about this, but really this is just the visual style that I personally prefer. It's probably due to the fact that when I started learning programming when I was 10 years old, I was writing some mirror scripts which usually use this style, so I'm very used to it and I like it but it's really just a visual thing. If you like the kernel brace on new line, then by all means, go ahead and use it. And for some more very useful general rules, first is spend time deciding on a proper name. Don't just use the first name that comes to your head. Actually think what would be the proper name for this symbol. Also do not use single letter names. A lot of beginners like to use this just because for some reason they want to be as compact as possible. But remember the goal with code is not really to be compact, it's to be understandable. And single letter names usually are terrible. The only exception for that would be iterators on a for loop. For those, it's perfectly fine to use just an I or a J, but for pretty much any anything else, use a proper name and not a single letter. Related to that, also don't use acronyms or abbreviations. Those might seem really clear to you right now when you're writing the code, but in a few weeks when you yourself get back to the code, you might not remember what those mean. Again, don't be afraid of being verbose. If the most accurate name you can come up with is somehow 20 characters long, then really that's a name. Remember, you don't get bonus points for writing extremely compact code. So always, always value making your code readable and understandable, even if it requires functions and variables with very long names. And the final extremely, extremely important rule is simply don't be afraid to rename things. If you come up with a name and later on you come up with a much better name, then just take a second to rename it. With Visual Studio Shortcut, it's insanely easy. You just place the cursor over something like for example the player class. Let's say instead of this being used just for players,
layers, let's say it was also used for enemies. So I wanted to really name this unit. The shortcut is control plus RR and it shows up this window and now we can easily rename it. And yep, look at that, it renames every instance of this type. So renaming things is really super easy, so definitely make sure to do it. If you come up with a better name, come back and rename that symbol. Always remember, code is not fixed. It is meant to adapt and grow as you work on it. And part of working on it is refactoring and renaming things, so don't be afraid to do that. Okay, so these are my general rules and the code style that I personally follow. Like I said, you don't have to follow my rules. Figure out what works for you and follow your own rules. But naturally, here in this course, I won't be using my code style. So if when following this course, you're not sure how to write some type of code, come back to this lecture and watch it again. Like I've mentioned many times, the code that I teach you how to write in my courses, that is on the same level of quality as my professional Steam games. So as such, this lecture this topic on main rules this is extremely important if you just follow these rules or whatever rules you can come up with if you just do that you will save yourself a ton of headaches hello and welcome i'm your code monkey in this lecture we're going to learn more on the theory on how to write good clean code so first of all what exactly is clean code now there are many definitions for this for me it simply means writing code that is easy to understand and easy to modify with bad code, you need to look at it for a real long time to try and work out what on earth that code is doing. Whereas with clean code, the intent of the code should be immediately obvious. Everything is very clear and straightforward and requires no effort to understand what exactly it's doing. That's the goal. The most important thing is simply following a good set of naming rules like I covered in the previous lecture. Always, always choose good descriptive names for all your variables, all your functions, classes, and really anything. If you just do that, then your code will be infinitely higher quality than someone who does not follow any naming rules. Beyond that, here's some more general guidelines. Starting off with a simple one, try to avoid magic numbers. These are numbers that are used directly in the code with no context for what exactly they mean. Like for example, in this code, this one has a bunch of numbers and just by looking at it, you can't really tell what those numbers are supposed to mean. After studying the code for a little bit, you might be able to tell that for example, over here, this is supposed to be the super bonus damage amount. And for example, over here, if you see an if testing if the distance is under 5, and if so, call the attack, then probably this means this is the attack distance. And over here, testing if the distance is above 10, then go to jump, so this should be some kind of jump distance. So it requires spending some time in order to understand what the code is doing. So by using magic numbers, it obfuscates what the code is actually doing. So instead of this, we can improve this code by quite a bit by simply defining proper named local variables. So over here, just to find int, for the super damage amount multiplier, just set it to two. And over here, instead of that, just use this one. And now it is very clear what exactly this line of code is doing. Same thing over here. Let's define an int for the attack distance. And over here, an int for, let's say, the jump distance. And yep, so now the code is much more clear, much more understandable. You can literally just read this and it makes perfect sense as if it's in proper English. So if the distance is under the attack distance, you attack. If the distance is above the jump distance, you jump. Super simple. So with this, there's no need to waste any brain power trying to understand the code. All of it is immediately understandable. Another simple one is how you should never ever use strings as identifiers. Strings are terrible as identifiers because they make it extremely easy to make all kinds of mistakes. For example, look at this code. Over here, I'm using a string identifier in order to find the name of a child object. And here in Unity, you can see that this code actually throws an error. It throws a null reference exception. Here the code is doing a transform.find to get the child sprite, then goes, gets the sprite written, and changes the color. So quick question, can you spot the error instantly? And I'll give you a hint, the error is actually not in here. The error is actually over here in the editor. So again, can you spot it? And the answer is no, I know for certain that you cannot spot it because the error is literally invisible. Here in the code, I'm looking for a child that is named exactly sprite. And here in the editor, it doesn't look correct. Over here, I'm looking in the hierarchy, it does look like it has a child named sprite. However, if I go on the inspector and I click over here on the name, you have a look at that, that's the issue. It turns out that this child name, this one has an invisible space at the end. So the code is indeed perfectly correct. There are no compiler errors here because everything is correct, but it is looking for a child with this exact same name, just sprite. And since the actual object has an invisible space at the end, it does not 100% match the sprite name identifier. This exact mistake is something that has happened to me several times and drove me insane every time it happened. Or here is another example, look at all of these strings. So can you quickly at a glance tell the difference between all of these? It probably takes you a little bit because visually they all look quite similar, but identifiers are case sensitive. So looking quite similar does not matter. If it is now 100% exact, it will not work. So if you had an object with any of these names and you accidentally mistyped or wrote any of these other names, if you did that, you would get an error and you would not know what exactly is going wrong. Whereas if you don't use strings, 
Like for example, I'm over here, I've got a variable named player10. I construct a brand new player and I call some kind of function on the player. If I use this instead of using a string, if so, if over here I mistype, like for example, I change this one into a lowercase l, which looks quite similar, but right away the compiler tells me there's an error. So with this, I can fix the error without ever needing to run the code. Strings should pretty much only ever be used for text. So you use them to store the player name or the name of some kind of object, but never ever use a string to identify an object. If you need to identify an object, use a direct reference or some kind of scriptable object or an enum or a tag component, literally anything except a string name. Now, as always with every rule, there are exceptions. Sometimes, especially when working with things like web development, that usually involves a lot of JSON and some simple HTTP text requests. Sometimes you really have no choice and have to use some kind of string identifier. In those cases, you should still avoid strings whenever possible. If you need a string to define some type of data, consider defining a constant and never use the string itself, only use the constant. If you do that and you mistype the constant name, the compiler will tell you. But basically, try to avoid using strings as identifiers at all costs. Then, one extremely important principle in writing good, clean code is the concept of managing complexity. That's really the main difficulty as you write bigger and more complex projects. The difficulty is in successfully avoiding becoming overwhelmed by managing that complexity as the project grows. And for that, your best tool is called information hiding, meaning for any code that you write, like a class, you should only expose as little as possible in order for the class to be usable. For example, specifically in Unity, a lot of Unity tutorials target that beginners teach you to make every single field public, but this is absolutely a terrible code practice. I made an entire video on this subject. By making it public, it makes this field easily accessible in the Unity editor, which is usually the goal. However, it has a side effect because it makes it also accessible from any other script. Now, for a beginner, this might sound like a good thing. You can easily access anything from anywhere. But that means that every single class in your entire code base, which could be a thousand classes long, every single one of those could potentially access and modify that field. So as you write your code, you have to constantly keep in mind that scenario. So that's a lot of wasted brain power. So like I said, the simple but extremely important guideline to follow is simply only expose as much as you need to and no more. So do not default to making everything public all the time. Instead, default everything to private and only use public when absolutely necessary. If a field is only ever used in that class, then there's no reason to make it public. It should always be private. That way, when working inside of this class, you don't have to keep in mind the entire code base. You can just focus on this one single class since you know for certain no other class can ever touch any of these fields. You could have a project with a million classes, but if this field is marked as private, then it does not matter. Nothing else can touch this field other than this class. Same thing for functions. If you have a function that is only ever used by a single class, then keep that function private. Do not make it public. If you do, then some other class in your thousands of classes, some other one could call that function, which could cause some unintended results. And if there is some kind of field that you need to access, instead of making it public, consider instead keeping it private and simply exposing some functions to get it and set it. That way you have a lot more control over how the underlying field is modified, and you can even add some logs over here if you need to. Alternatively, properties work as well. You can make it a property and add some code in the getter or setter. I cover properties in the lecture in the intermediate section. So in general, whenever you write a field or function or anything, always default to making it private. Always switch to public if you absolutely need to. Just following this one simple guideline will help you limit how much access different pieces of your code base have towards other parts of your code base, which in turn helps you minimize the total number of connections, which in turn helps you manage complexity even as the project grows. One great principle is the single responsibility principle. This means that each class or function should do one thing and one thing only. So if you have a game and you have some kind of player class, you probably should not keep any kind of enemy logic directly inside that class. That should probably exist in a separate enemy class. Same thing for functions. Each function should do one thing and one thing only. Don't write a thousand line functions that do 10 different things at once. One good heuristic for seeing if a function is too big is simply if the best name that you can come up with contains the word and. If so, that probably means that function is doing more than one thing and would probably be best split into separate functions. Another related one is to keep your functions short. So this kind of follows the same as the previous principle. If your functions only do one thing, they will probably be quite short. If they are big, then chances are they are doing more than one thing. But this is also a very adaptable guideline that you should adapt to the situation. For example, in my game, Dinky Gardens, I have quite a few relatively large functions. Breaking those apart into smaller functions would actually make the code hard to understand instead of easier. So all of these guidelines do depend on the specific use cases. 
but on average, your function should be relatively short. If your program is mainly composed of 500 line functions, chances are there's some room for improvement. Remember that refactoring is your friend and a perfectly natural part of the process. Another good one is group logic together. Meaning, for example, let's say I have some stats in my player class. I've got these in my player class and let's say I've got some sort of UI class that I want to display these. Since these three separate fields, these are all really part of the same thing. These are all player stats. Instead of working with three separate fields, instead of having to, for example, call some function on the UI that takes in three separate parameters, instead of that, consider making a custom type just to hold these stats. So something like player stats, then inside contains all those, and then you would simply have a field, just one field of type player stats that contains all of the player stats. That way, data that belongs together is actually together. This simplifies things and makes it quite easier to understand. In terms of comments, the guidelines are the ones that are already mentioned in the comments lecture. In general, you should avoid using comments. If you need a comment, before you actually write that comment, see if you couldn't just rename some variables to make the code intent a bit more clear. In most cases, well-written code is going to be self-documenting, but at the same time, comments can be useful if your code is already extremely clear, but you'd still like to provide some extra information on something, like for example, why you're doing that code or how that function should be used. Another good one is simply called dry or don't repeat yourself. Basically, if there's some code that you need to run three times, you probably should have a dedicated function instead of copy pasting that code three times. All that remember, these are just guidelines meant to help you, so don't look at these as some unbreakable laws. In general, code should be unique, although sometimes you might need to copy paste twice in some scenarios, that's fine. But if you find that you need the exact same code copy pasted three or four times, chances are that's a signal for some refactoring. And speaking of refactoring, this is an extremely important process that you should be doing at all times. Refactoring is the act of rewriting or reorganizing code to keep the code quality as high as possible. This is a very, very important topic, and there is a dedicated lecture on refactoring in the beginning of the intermediate section. So these are just a handful of nice guidelines to keep in mind to help you write good, clean code that will help you a lot as your projects grow in scale and complexity. Although also, do keep in mind these are just guidelines. They are not holy rules that must never be broken. The ultimate goal of all of these guidelines is to help you achieve your goals. Always remember that. It is always up to you as a programmer to figure out when to follow the guidelines and when it's okay to break them. There are some people that follow some specific code rules so rigidly that it actually makes the code worse, so don't be like that. Follow these guidelines which will help you in most scenarios, but also always be willing to adapt to the specific code you're writing. Now on this topic, personally I'm a huge believer in writing good clean code. If you're a regular on my YouTube channel, certainly you've heard me talk quite a lot about it. The reason why I love it so much is because I spent a lot of time writing a ton of code where I did not care about code quality. I've been writing code since I was 10 years old, and I really only started being very careful with the code that I write since I was something like 25, so I've already suffered quite a lot because of code that I would write with some nonsense variable names or some obscure acronyms, and then later on when getting back to that code, I would have no idea what I wrote or how I could expand upon it. Because of that, I really hope to help you avoid the suffering that I went through. If you are a beginner, I hope you can start off on the right foot by focusing on writing good clean code right from the start. If you do that, it will help you learn faster and grow your skills by a massive amount. Now, if you're looking for some more info on this topic, there are tons of sources to learn from. The one that I highly, highly recommend is the book Code Complete. Reading this book alone massively improved my code skills by a hundredfold. It really is that good. It's a pretty massive book. It's over 800 pages long and it's all really technical. So it takes quite a while to get through it. But if you do read through it and you fully understand everything, if so, you will come out the other side an excellent programmer capable of building any program or any game you can think of. Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. In this lecture, we're going to see a nice beginner project that incorporates everything we've learned so far. Okay, so let's inspect this project to see how everything we've learned so far is being used. It's in the Unity project, so just go inside lectures, then inside the beginner project and load up this scene. Then let's go ahead, head on play. And yep, so here is the minigame running. There is a player and I can move it by pressing either the arrow keys or WASD. Every time I press, I move a certain amount. We can see the player is currently holding zero coins. So I can move around and as I approach and touch one of these coins, yep, it picks it up. So I can pick up a whole bunch of them. Yep, that works. Then there are two buildings. I can approach to interact with them. And when I'm close enough, I can press space. And this building, this gives me one coin. And if I go onto the other building, so I go straight to the right, and once again, I interact, and yep, now this one gives me three coins. All right, awesome. So this is a super simple demo, and importantly, it's using everything that we've learned so far. So let's inspect how all this is working. Here in the project files, we can see how this demo is really pretty simple. We just have two files for our two classes, 
And the coin file, this one is super small. Let's go ahead and open it. This one is mostly meant to just tag an object as a being of the coin type. By the way, right now you can ignore this syntax where it has a colon then says mono behavior. This is a Unity specific thing. And this colon here has to do with class inheritance. I'm going to cover that in detail in a lecture in the intermediate section, but for now, don't worry about this. Here, coin, this one is really just a symbol class, so just like we covered. And inside we can see the use of a nice function. It is called destroy self, returns nothing and has no parameters. And in turn, really this one just destroys this game object. If we look in the editor over here in the hierarchy, we can see a whole bunch of coins. So all the coins spread out throughout the world. Each coin is really just a game object and in turn it has a sprite render in order to show the coin visual. And then just has the coin script that we attached. So on this function, all we're doing is just destroying that game object. And also note how the function is marked as public. This is important because we're not going to call this function from inside the coin class, but rather from the player class. So let's look at that one. Here is the player class. So most of the logic for this little mini game is over here inside this class. So first of all, the player itself is yet another class. Then we can see up top, we have some nice class fields. We have a field for a text mesh pro object. Looking in the inspector, we can select the player and we can look in the inspector. Looking in the editor, we can select the player game object and look in the inspector. And again, this one also has a sprite render for the visual. And then we have our player script. Here we have the reference to the coin text mesh object. And that's really just a child object of the player. This is really just what shows the text. Then we can also see that we have a float for the move speed. And the movement logic, that one is handled over here inside the update function. Now this update, this is a special Unity thing that runs automatically on every single frame. So don't worry about the fact that technically we're not calling this function from anywhere, as you can see. This is actually called automatically by Unity on their backend. So we have the update function. And then over here, we have some examples of some simple ifs. So we're doing an if, and then for the condition, here we have two conditions. And first we are testing for the input get key down for the double key. This is a function from Unity that checks if the player is pressing some key. So in this case, pressing the double key. And this function, we can expect and see this one is going to return a Boolean. So when the player presses the double key, this is going to return true. And then here we also see an example of a logical or. So we are testing if the player is pressing the double key or if they are pressing the up arrow. This way the game is playable with either WASD or with the arrow keys. So it evaluates these two conditions. And when the player presses either W or the up arrow, when so, this is going to return true. So we're going to run the code inside the if. And over here, this logic simply takes the transform. This refers to the transform that this script is attached to. So in this case, it's the player transform. The transform field itself, this is another Unity specific thing. So don't worry about the fact that there's no reference of it up here. That is actually inside the mono behavior base class, which again, I'm going to cover inheritance in detail in a future lecture. So here we access the transform and we're going to modify the position. We do plus equals, meaning we're going to add onto that position. And then we are creating a vector three, which is a type inside the position. So this is really just a struct that contains an X, Y, and Z. Again, it's another Unity type. So we take that and we're going to increase it by zero on the X, zero on the Z, but plus one on the Y, meaning we're going to move our player upwards. And for the movement amount, we're going to multiply it by move speed, which is our variable that we have exposed in the editor. That way we can easily modify how fast we move. So that's the logic, just a basic if, some conditions and doing some basic movement, applying that to all of the keys, W, S, A, and D. So moving up, down, left, and right. And here in the game, we can test it. So like this, if I move, I am moving by this amount. And if over there on the move speed, I modify this, let's say put it on five. And if now it moves quite a lot more. Okay, so we've already seen classes, functions, variables, and if statements in action. Now up here, we can also see two lists. There is a list of type coin for our coin list and a list of type transform for the building transform list. Here in the editor, again, selecting the player and we can see both of our lists. And these are referencing the objects that are assigned in the hierarchy. So basically what I did is this list started off as empty and I just and I just dragged and dropped each element individually. So I dragged all the references to all the coins as well as all these buildings. So back in the code here, we have our lists. And then over here on the update, we are calling this function handle coins. And the function does exactly what it says. It handles all the coin logic. It is being called up here on update, meaning that this function is going to run on every single frame. And inside here, we have an example of loops. We are cycling through all the coins in the coin list using a for each. And then first we do a test to check if the coin is not null. And then first we do a test to check if the coin is not null, meaning that the coin has not been destroyed just yet. So here we see an example of a useful comment. It is easier to understand this code by reading the comment rather than the code. The comment provides some extra clarification on what exactly this code is doing. Since checking for null, that could technically mean a bunch of things. So in this case, we are checking if it hasn't been destroyed. We do that and then we're going to test the distance. So we're going to use this static function inside the vector three. This tests the distance between two points. So we're testing distance between transform.position, meaning the position of the actual player 
and then the coin dot transform dot position, meaning the position of the coin, if that is under a certain amount. So again, over here, we're keeping our code clean and using a proper local variable in order to make this much easier to understand. So we test it, and if it is under this amount, if so, then we're going to pick up the coin. So here we add a coin to the player and then we tell the coin to destroy itself. So again, this is why it's important that the destroy itself is marked as public. It's so that the player class can call it. If this function was marked as private, then the player would not be able to call it. So we have this and on the add coin function, it's all super simple. It just increments a coin amount. So this is just a simple in field that we have up here. So just a coin amount. We have that and then we assign the coin amount to the text object in order to update the text. However, also note how coin amount is an int, whereas the text field, this one expects a string. So that is why we need to convert our int into a string, which we can do by calling to string. So here in the game, I can move around and as I approach a coin, yep, I can pick it up and yep, it works. It increments the text and everything works. Okay, great. Then here on the update, another function we have is over here, the interact action. For this, we're doing the same thing that we were doing up here. So we're testing if the player is pressing down the spacebar. And if so, we're going to run this code. So we're going to run our handle building interaction function. And this function, like it says, is going to handle the building interaction. Over here, we're cycling through all the buildings. Now here, I went with a for loop instead of a for each. Normally, I would also use a for each over here, but I just wanted to use different loops in this demo. So just do a simple for cycling through the entire list. So we cycle through it and we access the list on that index in order to get the current building transform. Then does pretty much the same distance logic that we saw. So we test the current player position against the building position. If it's under a certain interact distance and the player is close enough to interact with this building, and then over here, we have an example of a switch. So this one does a switch on the building transform.name. Here in the editor, in the hierarchy, we can see our two buildings and we can see they have different names directly on the game object. So we're doing a switch on that. And if it is named this building coin one, if so, then we're going to add just one coin. Case it is named building coin three. If so, then we're going to add three coins. And then on default, if it does not match any of these two names, if so, that shouldn't happen. So over here, I just fired the analog error. So over here, if I move towards this building, and I'm close enough and I press on space. And if there you go, it does add one coin. And if I go here and I press on space, and if this one adds three coins. Okay, so that's really it for this simple demo. Here we can see examples of variables being used. We can see how we're using various data types. We have both simple types like ints and floats, as well as more complex types like lists. Then we see some simple if statements. These are going to make sure that we only run the move logic if the player is actually pressing a button. Then on the buildings, we can see a switch in action doing different types of logic depending on the name of the building. We can also see how we define various functions. We can see how those functions have different access modifiers. So all of these that are only used by the player class, these are all marked as private. Whereas this one on the coin, this one is marked as public so the player can call it. Then we also see how we're using multiple different classes. And then we also see how we're using different types of loops, a for each and a for. And very important, note how throughout this whole script, there are only a handful of comments, very few. There are really no useless comments. Instead, all of the code was written carefully with good names. Every function variable has a proper name that makes it very clear what exactly it represents. So this way, all the code is self-documenting. There's no need for comments. You can just read the code directly itself and easily understand what exactly it's doing. So here in this nice, simple project, we have indeed incorporated everything we have learned so far. Now here, let me also make a quick note, just in case you're a more experienced user and not a beginner. I made this demo intentionally as simple as possible. Normally for building a demo like this properly, I would use multiple classes to separate all kinds of logic instead of putting it pretty much all in just one player class. I would use events and various other things to massively increase the code quality and readability. I would make these fields serialized private. I would make these serialized private fields instead of making them public. I would remove coins from the list when they were destroyed or I would simply use continue to skip them. I would perhaps use collisions instead of distance checks. So there are plenty of ways to improve upon this code. But on this demo, I wanted to only use as much as was taught by this point. So that is why I simplified it so much. If you are an intermediate user and you want a simple challenge, then perhaps try refactoring this demo to make it work with some good clean code. And if you are a complete beginner and you have no idea what I'm talking about, then don't worry about it. Just keep watching the course. And after you get to the end of the intermediate section, maybe come back here and do that mini challenge. All right, so that's our beginner project. Hopefully you fully understood everything in this beginner section and had no problem understanding everything in how this project works. If there is something you found confusing, maybe go back and rewatch that lecture or just post a question in the comments. I highly encourage you to make sure you fully understand absolutely everything in this beginner section before continuing on to the intermediate section. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey and congrats on completing the beginner section. In this section, we'll learn a lot of stuff, starting with installing and setting up Visual Studio and Unity. We also learned the absolute basis of Unity, which isn't necessarily needed if all you want is just to learn C Sharp. 
But I really hope you've been following the course using the companion project. I really hope you've been doing all the interactive exercises, answering all the quiz, and reading all the frequently asked questions. You really learn so much more by doing rather than just watching. Then we learned about various common errors, what they mean and how to solve them. Like I said, this one is a great lecture that works as a general reference. So even in the intermediate and advanced section, still come back to this one if you get stuck on some kind of error. Then we start learning from the absolute basis of programming, learning how code executes line by line, what is a code block, and just how important it is that code is case sensitive. Then we start writing some code and learn about variables, how they store some data, and what are those data types. Then it was about if statements, which help us do some conditional logic. Related to that, we learned about the switch statement, very useful to have tons of conditions. After that, we learned about functions, one of the crucial components of any kind of programming. Then we learned about scope. This is one of those things that's a little bit tricky for beginners, so I truly hope you understood this one. After that was a lecture on comments, what they do, and importantly, whether you should and should not use them. Next was a lecture on arrays and lists. This is a really important data type for storing multiple pieces of data. Then was another crucial thing in all of programming. We learned about loops. This is how we can execute logic multiple times. And then since c -sharp is an object-oriented language, we finally learned about objects, which we build using classes. Then we learned about the static keyword and what it means. Also, what are the access modifiers, public and private? After that, we had one of the most important lectures of all. It's all about what makes a good name and how to define some good naming rules. And then yet another really important one about how to write good clean code by following some simple guidelines. And finally, in the end, we put it all together in a nice beginner project involving every single element that we learned about. So congrats again on completing the beginner section. I really hope you did all of the exercise and all of the questions. I hope you learned a ton and I'll see you on the intermediate section. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. Alright, so congrats on watching this whole video. I hope you really took your time and focused on learning all the contents over here for this beginner section. If so, then hopefully you are much more skilled now than when you started. If you're watching this in the future, then check the pinned comment down below to see whether the intermediate section video is already available. Like I said, my goal is to make that video section free over here on YouTube if the premium course sells over 100 copies. And I'm happy to report that thankfully there's already been over 100 people picking it up, so one month after the launch of this video, that video should be out. Or if you want, you can just go ahead and pick up the premium version right now and continue on to the intermediate section right away, along with all of the awesome bonuses that the premium version also has. If you haven't been forcing yourself in order to put what you learned into practice throughout the video, then now would be a great time to pick up the premium version and go through all the content in the companion project, especially doing all the interactive exercises. You only truly learn by doing, so that is why I designed those exercises to put your skills into practice in order for you to truly learn. In the first session of the weekly live study group, that one is happening this Saturday, March 9th. So if you can't afford it, then check out the premium version with a link in the description. If not, then stay tuned for the free video covering the intermediate section one month from now. Also, if you haven't already, go ahead and like this video and hit the subscribe button. It's a tiny thing, but it really does help. Alright, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.